Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jeff Dean, the head
Good morning. Welcome. I'm uh, Frank Van Diggelen. And I'm Roy Want. And I'm Wei Wang. We are all engineers from Android Location Team. We're going to. Sh <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to show you how recent changes in hardware and standards make one meter location accuracy possible. In some cases, as soon as this year. I'll give you a short overview now. Then Roy will introduce Wi-Fi round-trip time technology and standards and show you a live demo. Then Wei will explain the Wi-Fi APIs. Then I'll return and talk about new GPS technology and APIs. Uh, at the end, they'll be loading up for the next session. So we'll take questions right outside that door. And we'll be available at office hours at 1.30 PM today. So it's a great time for location applications, because technology hardware, standards, and Android APIs are all evolving simultaneously to enable accuracy that has not been possible previously in phones. So eventually, this means high accuracy for everyone. But today, we want to take you under the hood of location, because we want to give you the opportunity to get a head start on the future. We also want to highlight the need to protect and respect the user. The more people who use location, the more, the more careful we and you have to be. We'll highlight where you must get user permissions, and we'll close with some guidelines for making great location apps. So where are we today with indoor location accuracy? If you think you've noticed that your phone seems to be more accurate when you're inside shopping malls and office blocks than it was a few years ago, you're not imagining it. With each release of the Fuse location provider, we have had steady improvement of the Android algorithms and machine learning for Wi-Fi locations. There continues to be improvement, and you'll see indoor accuracy of better than 10 meters. But round trip time is the technology that will take us to the one meter level. Meanwhile, what about GPS? Well, in terms of GPS accuracy in the open sky, there has been not much change in the last few years. If you're out in the open sky, your GPS accuracy from your phone is five meters, and that's been constant. But raw measurements, raw GNSS measurements from the phones, you can now improve on this. And with changes in satellite and receiver hardware, the improvements can become dramatic. Now, everyone's familiar with the blue dot, but to get the blue dot, you need the location provider, of course. And to get location, you need measurements, specifically range measurements from Wi-Fi access points or from GPS satellites. Today, we'll show you how one meter measurement accuracy is available in phones, the key technology. And we'll show you how to use accurate measurements to create accurate location. Now, if you just want to wait a year or two, this will all find its way into the worldwide ecosystem and the Fuse location provider. but we want to give you a chance for a one to two year lead by taking accurate measurements and turning them into accurate location. We want to work with you to accelerate the future, to take it and bring it closer to the present. So you might wonder, well, why do I need better location accuracy anyway? Well, let's just look at two instances where existing apps could use much better location accuracy. So for indoor routing or navigation of the kind that you're used to in your cars, you need much better accuracy than you have outdoors. You need one meter accuracy because indoor features, like the distance between cubes or aisles, are only a few meters. And even for the most loved outdoor applications, such as uh, directions and especially directions in traffic, we could use higher accuracy than we have now. For example, when you came here this morning in a car, you probably had the time estimated by the average traffic speed what you really want is the traffic speed in the lane that you're in, so that you could ask, how fast would it be if I could take the carpool lane? There are, of course, many other use cases, and I'll mention a few before we finish. But the important thing is that we are sure that you will have many more ideas than we have. And that's the beauty of the open Android ecosystem. So now here's Roy to tell you about Wi-Fi round trip time. Thanks, Frank. And I'm very excited to be here today to tell you about a new positioning technology in Android P we call Wi-Fi Round Trip Time, or RTT. You'll hear me say that acronym a lot, which is based on measuring the time of flight of RF signals. 
It has the potential to estimate your indoor position to an accuracy of one to two meters. Now, we're going to hit the ground running today before I tell you about the details of RTT. And we're going to show you a video of uh, indoor navigation powered by RTT. And I want to emphasize, first of all, that this is not a product, but an internal prototype to explore the power of the technology and how it can also be used to support other context-aware applications. This prototype also showcases some of the magic that Google can offer to its employees today. So we're going to roll the video. And what you should keep in mind is this is a bit like car GPS, except we're working indoors. So in a moment, you'll see there's an application. It's a mapping application. And we're searching for a conference room. We found that conference room. It's plotted the route. That's the shortest route. And now we're off. We're following the route. And as I make progress, you can see the route is turning gray. My position from RTT is the big gray dot. And I'm deliberately making an error here. So the system is rerouting. And it's rerouting again. If I get about 20 feet away, it starts the rerouting process. And I'm following the route. And you can see the corridor flying by. And there I'm coming in. And I've arrived at my destination, conference room Tapu. So that is the power of RTT. And to, the thing to think about, thank you. The thing to think about here is that if you didn't have one to two meter accuracy, then when that system rerouted, it would jump potentially between aisles that were surrounding me, and it would be a terrible user experience. So that's why it's so important to have this kind of accuracy. So before I get into the details of a Wi-Fi RTT, I want to tell you about how we calculate location indoors now. We use Wi-Fi RSSI, which stands for Receive Str Signal Strength Indication. And basically, we can calculate distance as a function of signal strength. Now, the figure that you see on the left-hand side here, uh, the axis point, which is in the center, uh, has a heat map of signal strength. The green is the strongest, and the red is the weakest at the edges. And I've placed two phones on this diagram at the transition between the weak and the strong. Notice that the phone on the right is further away from the axis point than the phone on the left. So same signal strength, different distance. And it's this variability in distance for signal strength that unfortunately makes it very hard to get uh, uh, accurate our readings from RSSI on a regular basis. But there are lots of algorithms and tricks that we can pull to improve this, um, but it can be improved further. And that's where Wi-Fi RTT comes into place. So uh, Wi-Fi RTT, round trip time, it uses time of flight instead of signal strength. It measures the time it takes to send a packet, a Wi-Fi uh, RF packet, from an access point to a phone and back again. And because radio signals travel at the same speed as visible light, if we multiply the total time by the speed of light, and we divide by two, we get distance, round trip time divided by two, and we get the range from the phone to the access point. So that's the basic principle. Now, if you want to calculate position, we have to use a process called multilateration, and more on that in a minute. But the key thing to think about here is the more ranges you have, the more constraints you get, and the more accurate position you can achieve. And if you can use at least four ranges, then we think you can get typically an accuracy of one to two meters in most buildings. So why am I telling you about Wi-Fi RTT today? Why not last year or before? Well, uh, what I want you to take away is that 2018 is the year of Wi-Fi RTT in Android. Your takeaways are that we are releasing a public API uh, in Android P based on the IEEE 8211MC protocol. And furthermore, we're also integrating aspects of this protocol into the Fuse location provider, which is the main location API that people use to put location on a map. And any time there are RTT access points in the vicinity, the accuracy of that position will be greater. A little bit of history. The 8211 standard was ratified in 2016, um, the end of it. And in early 2017, uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance started doing interop between silicon vendors to make sure the chips followed the protocol. And that's when we started doing a lot of work uh, to validate how it could be integrated into Android. And by uh, 
the fall of this year, of course, we will release the API so that all of you can uh, have access and build your own applications around that technology. <coughs> so now diving into the principles of how Wi-Fi RTT works. So the ranging process starts with a standard Wi-Fi scan. The phone discovers the access points which are around, and based on certain bits which are set inside the beacons and the probe responses, we can figure out which of those access points uh, are RTT capable. And then the phone chooses one of those to range to, and it starts by making a request to the access point. And as a result, the access point will start a ping pong protocol back. The ping is sent to the phone is called an FTM, or fine timing measurement packet. And the pong, which is sent back to the access point, is an acknowledgment of that packet. The timestamps are recorded at each end. Each device records them. But for the phone to calculate the total round trip time, it needs to have all of those timestamps. So the access point sends one more packet, a third message, which contains the missing two. The phone then simply calculates the round trip time by subtracting the timestamps from the AP and uh, its own turnaround time, uh, which uh, are the timestamps that it recorded. So that leaves the time of flight. We multiply by the speed of light to get distance. We divide by two, and we get the range that we care about. Now, it turns out, if you do this pro process multiple times, you will, in fact, get more accuracy. And so that's what the protocol allows for. It allows for a burst. In Android, we're typically doing a burst of about eight of these, uh, of these events. And as a consequence, the system can calculate statistics, so the mean and the variance, which allows us to more accurately plot a position on a map. And knowing the accuracy also allows us to calculate a path more accurately as well. So now you have ranges. How do you get a position? So I just want to give you a feel for how you go about doing this. Now, there's lots of different mathematical approaches. Um, and I'm just picking one because it's relatively easy to explain. But this is where the power of developers uh, comes in for you to figure out your own, own way to do it. So if you know a phone is at a certain range from an access point, that tells you that it can be anywhere on, a, on the circumference of a circle of that radius, that radius r. And I've written the uh, circle equation for that circumference on the right-hand side at center x1, y1. Now, if you want to find a position, you've got to constrain it. So if you take four ranges to four separate axis points, as I've shown on the diagram on the right-hand side, you then can see that if those ranges were accurate, those circles would intersect at the single point. How do you find that point programmatically? Well, if you write those four equations out on the left-hand side, you see the nasty circle equations, um, which may be difficult, but in fact, it's actually very straightforward. You, take, you pick one of them, you subtract it from all the others, and you end up with a set of line equations. The, the square terms disappear, and those lines are, in fact, drawn on this diagram as well. And then it's very easy to find out where two lines intersect. Now, there's one problem with what I've just told you, and the problem is that we are assuming the measurements are perfect. In reality, no measurements are perfect. Everything has error, and there will be no exact solution to that equation. So let me give you a more realistic example. So here we have several access points, uh, which we've ranged to. And I've exaggerated the problem here. And you can see some of those circles don't I intersect. How do you solve that? Well, in fact, you do the same thing as you did before. You subtract the circles, you get the lines. But this time, they don't intersect in a point. They intersect in a polygon. In this case, it's a, it's a triangle. And your phone lies probably somewhere, maximum likelihood, in the center of that triangle. And then we can apply some college math, least square solution, and get a maximum likelihood. You can find standard packages which do this uh, on the net. You can then also refine this position further by repeating this process, particularly as the phone moves. And then you can calculate trajectory and use filtering techniques like common filters and other things. So that's the basic principles. OK, now, like any new technology, there are challenges. And so we've experienced some of these early on. The little robot, which you can see on the right-hand side, is used by us to measure the range from the phone which it's carrying to an access point. And it validates that range against the marks which are on the floor, which, are, which provide us with ground truth. What we find is that sometimes there is a constant range calibration offset, maybe as much as half a meter. And sometimes also you see multipath effects, where the non-line of sight path from the access point to the phone um, is actually received rather than the line of sight path. That one can be solved by the vendor using something called antenna diversity. 
But all of these things are algorithms which the vendors are improving. And, and basically, we need to go through a sort of teething process of getting rid of these bugs. And Google can help in this process by providing reference uh, platforms and uh, reference applications so that vendors can calibrate their own platforms before you guys even get to, to use them, which would be the ideal situation. Now, I've assumed that you want to start as an early adopter and uh, start using this API. But as we move into the relatively near future, uh, we expect you to just use the Fuse Location Provider, because we're going to be putting the RTT capability into it. So at the moment, Fuse Location Provider uses GPS when it's available, cell, signal strength, Wi-Fi RSSI, and also fuses with the onboard sensors, uh, no inertial navigation from accelerometer and gyro. Now we're adding Wi-Fi RTT into that mix, and it will increase the accuracy whenever RTT capable access points are available. OK, so the one other thing to remember is that when you were doing it yourself, you had to know the position of the access points. In the, with a fuse location provider, we will know those positions automatically for you. We'll crowdsource those positions, and so you won't have to worry about that. And that will make life a lot more, uh, a lot easier for you to write applications. OK, so now we're going to take it up a notch, and we're going to give you a live RTT demo in collaboration with some of our colleagues in GEO. So uh, what I have over here on the podium is, is a phone. Let's bring it back. OK, there we go. Which is uh, running an RTT system in combination with Google Mobile Maps. and. Uh, what we're, we're doing is we're using a number of access points which are around the room. So you, a moment ago, you saw the blue boxes which were on the slide. Uh, so these were provided by one of our partners. And you can see them around the room, towards the back, on the side, and also a couple in the center over here. Now, um, the thing to bear in mind is that you would, this phone, because we're just in a tent, would normally receive GPS signals. So we've disabled GPS. You're only using RTT uh, with this phone. And, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around the aisles. And you can see on this cast that I've already got a plot of uh, where I'm going to go. So I'm going to start moving now. And I start going towards the corner of the stage. And you should see the, the blue dot with my little man inside following me. And we, of course, we expect an accuracy of one to two meters. And so I'm walking on the aisle. The aisle here is about, it's about two meters across thereabouts. And you can see it's very nicely following within that accuracy. I think the, the demo environment has been very good to us so far. So we're going along, and there's a little bit of lag. It's going around the back here. And we're approaching a turnaround point where I'm going to walk up the aisle. And we're rerouting as I come back to make my path a little bit shorter. And you can see we're going very nicely. It's still well within the one to two meters. And if you had uh, GPS shown here as well, I mean, typically you would be expecting to see five meters, but that's of course outdoors and indoors in a typical building. Uh, you've only gonna, you're only going to have uh, indoor location technology such as this. And now I'm approaching the corner of the stage. And at this point, I'll hand back over to Wei. Thank you very much. Thank you. To Wei, he's going to tell you about the details of the API. Hey, thanks a lot, Roy. What a great demo. So now you must be very eager to try round trip time ranging yourself. Let me walk you through the RTT API in P to think how you can add RTT in your own application. So as Roy mentioned, RTT measures the round trip time between two Wi-Fi devices. So both your mobile phone and your access points need to support 802.11mc protocol. And as you saw, RTT can give you very fine location down to one meter accuracy. So your application need to declare access fine location permission. And of course, both location and Wi-Fi scan need to be enabled on the mobile device. Okay. So how do you know whether your mobile phone supports RTT? In P, we added a new system feature called 
feature Wi-Fi RTT. So you can simply check whether this is returned true on your mobile device. All Pixel phones running PDP2 and above will support RTT. So how do you know whether your access points support RTT? As normal, you will need to do a Wi-Fi scan and get a list of Wi-Fi scan results. Iterate through this list of Wi-Fi scan results and check whether this method is at 0211MC responder return true. This will tell you whether the access points support RTT. So after you get a list of RTT-enabled APs, simply add them to a scan re request builder to build a scan request. RTT is done by Wi-Fi RTT manager, which you can simply get by getting the system service Wi-Fi RTT ranging service. OK. Now we're ready to start RTT ranging. By sending the RTT request to the RTT manager with the ranging result callback, RTT will start. Usually, RTT takes no more than hundreds of milliseconds. And when it finishes, you will get a list of information, uh, including the status, RTT might fail, the MAC address, which IP you have just ranged, and also, the most importantly, the distance between the mobile phone and the access point. So here is the list of information you can get from RTT ranging results. You can get the distance. You can also get the distance and deviation, which is the standard deviation from multiple ranges in multiple FTMs. Uh, and you can also get number of attempted FTM measurements and number of successful measurements. So the ratio of successful measurements over attempted measurements will give you an idea of how good the Wi-Fi environment is for RTT ranging. Okay, so I mentioned all Pixel devices will support RTT. How about access points? We're beginning to see access points supporting 11MC protocol in production. And we are very excited to let you know Google Wi-Fi will soon support 11MC protocol. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. By the end of this year, off-the-shelf Google Wi-Fi will have RTT enabled by default. And in worldwide, we're also beginning to send the deployment of RTT IPs. South Korea is actually leading the deployment of, our, uh, of RTT IPs. Uh, and of course, this is just the beginning of the long journey. We are very eager to send a larger penetration rate of RTT IPs in the upcoming years. With that, I'm going to hand over to Frank to talk about one meter GPS. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so let's move to the great outdoors and speak about GPS. I'm going to show you some basics of GPS, just enough to explain what's new to the satellites and what's new in the phones and how you can exploit these changes to get better location accuracy from GPS when you're outdoors under open sky. So GPS works like this. It sends a code from the satellite, and the code encodes the time at the satellite. Then that travels to you through space and arrives at you, and your GPS receiver will compare that time with the time in its clock. The difference between those two tells you how far you are away. It's kind of like. You have a tape measure where one ends at the satellite, <laughs> and you're holding the spool. At any moment, you can look down and read a number, which is the difference in these two times. If you move further away, you read a bigger number. If you move a little bit closer, you read a smaller number. OK. But now the actual GPS tape measure is kind of special. First of all, it's really long. Secondly, the tick marks occur only every 300 meters because these bits of the code occur at a rate of one microsecond. So one microsecond times the speed of light is about 300 meters. So this is like a tape measure where instead of having all these inches on here, you only have a mark every 300 meters. And your GPS receiver essentially interpolates between those marks. And there's your five meter accuracy. OK. But there's more to it than that because how does that code get through space in the first place? Well, it's carried on a carrier wave, a radio wave, which for GPS has a wavelength that is less than 20 centimeters. 
and your GPS receiver can measure where you are on this wave, and as long as it keeps tracking it, can measure relative motion with great precision. And this is because it, the receiver will measure the phase, and then as you move, that phase will change. But now what about getting your absolute location? The trouble with the carrier phase ruler, if you like, is that it's, it's kind of like a ruler with very precise markings on it, but no numbers at all. Because one wavelength looks just like the next. So your, your receiver can tell you the phase of the wave you're on, but it doesn't know are you the green dot or the red dot. So how do you solve that problem? Well, for that, you need to introduce a new concept, which is GPS reference stations. So these are GPS receivers at fixed sites measuring the same thing at the same time. They communicate that data to you. With well-known algorithms, you can combine this data, and over some period of time, you can work out where you are relative to the reference station with great precision, with this carrier phase precision. Now you know where the reference station is, so now you know where you are with great precision. OK, so this concept is not new. This has been in commercial GPS receivers since the 1980s for surveying, hence our uh, little surveyor there holding the GPS antenna on the stick. What is new is the availability of these carrier phase measurements from phones and dual frequency measurements in phones. Right now, all of your smartphones, all smartphones everywhere, have GPS or GNSS on one frequency band only. It's known as L1. But there's a new frequency in town. It's called L5, and it's supported by all these GNSS systems, GPS, Galileo, Beidou, QZSS, and IRNSS. And the availability of a second frequency means that you get much faster convergence to carrier phase accuracy if you're doing this kind of procedure. And why? Well, we just went through the ambiguity that you have on a single wave. Well, now look what happens if you introduce a second wave at a different frequency. Immediately, you can disambiguate because you w could not have the same phase on that second wave as uh, on both of those wavelengths. So you could not be on the red dot if you were at the peak of the of the red wave. And so you can disambiguate and get much faster convergence to the very high accuracy that you want. All right, so what about hardware? Well, in the last few months, several companies that produ produce consumer GPS chips have announced the availability of dual frequency L1, L5 GPS chips, both for the automobile market and for the phone market. And these chips are now being designed into cars and phones. Now let's talk about the measurements themselves and the APIs. The, the phone must support the GNSS measurements API. And your app is going to need access find location permission. And location needs to be on. So these are the basic requirements. So how do you know if a particular phone supports these measurements? Well, at a high level, you can just go to a website that we maintain, g.co slash GNSS tools. It's part of the Android developer site. And there's just a, a table there uh, that lists phones that support the GNSS measurements and also which characteristics they support. So it'll tell you which phones support the measurements and which of those support the carrier phase measurements. Programmatically, you do this as follows. You need a method on status changed, and it will return an integer, integer that tells you the capability of the phone, either if the phone just does not support the measurements at all or if they support it but location is off or if they support it and location is on. In that last case, you're good to go. So, so now let's get into some details of the APIs. The most relevant methods for what we're talking about here are the following three. There's get constellation type, which tells you which of the different GNSS constellations a particular satellite belongs to. There's get carrier frequency hertz, which tells you whether you're on the L1 or the L5 band for a particular signal. And then most importantly, there's get accumulated delta range meters, which is how far along that wave the receiver ha has tracked you since it began tracking the signal. And then there's something else that I need to explain, which is duty cycling. So right now, when you're navigating with your phone and you see the blue dot moving along, for example, when maybe when you navigated here this morning, you might think that the GPS is on continuously. And it's actually not. Uh, what's happening in the phone is that GPS will 
by default be on for a fraction of a second and then off for the remaining fraction of a second and then repeat. And this is to save battery. So you perceive that the GPS is on all the time because the blue dot will move along continually, but actually it's duty cycling internally. Now for this carrier phase processing, you have to continually track the carrier wave because remember, the carrier wave is the ruler with no numbers on it. So if the GPS was on and your receiver measured your phase and you get the data from the reference station, you'd start processing. If the GPS then goes off for a fraction of a second, well, now you've, you've lost where you were. It'll start again. You'll reacquire. You'll be a different phase on, on the reacquisition. You'll start again. Well, you'll never solve the problem, back, right? You need the tape measure to stay out, and you need to process. And to do that, you need to disable duty cycling. And you can do that in Android P with a developer option, which I'll talk about some more in a minute. OK, so now. Uh, some details of the API. What I've shown here on the right is a screenshot of an application that we've put out. It's called GNSS Logger. And this is, enables you to log the raw measurements in the phone. Uh, now, the nice thing about this app, it's, it's a reference app. The, the code is open source and available to you on GitHub. So when you build your app, please you can, uh, make use of our code. And when you do build an app that needs raw measurement, you will need the Android Location Manager API with the method register GNSS measurements callback. And this method requires you to pass it a GNSS measurements event callback, shown here. You construct this callback and then override the method on status changed. And that will give you the integer status that we discussed to tell you if measurements are supported. If they are, you then override the method on, GS, on GNSS measurements received, and this allows you to receive a GNSS measurement event every epoch, for example, every second. And this event gives you the values we've been talking about, constellation type, carrier frequency, and accumulated delta range. Now, for duty cycling, that's a developer option, so you access that through the developer page on your phone, as you see there, on P. And this allows you to disable the duty cycling. Now, keep in mind, we, this introduces a trade-off between getting the continuous measurements and battery life. There will be an impact on battery life. How much? Well, even when GPS is on continually, it'll use less than 20% of the power that screen on uses. So that gives you a feel for the magnitude. Now, this is a developer option precisely because it's uh, a trade-off in, in battery life, and we're very concerned about maximizing battery life. But if you and we together can prove that there's value in this option and people want it, then it will be upgraded to a fully supported API in the future. So here's a block diagram that shows the uh, basic architecture that we expect if you implement an app for high accuracy. Down the, uh, the bottom of the block diagram on the left, you've got the GPS, GNSS chip. The GNSS measurements come up through the APIs we've just described, and then your app lives at the top uh, in the application layer. You're going to need access to a reference network to get the data uh, that the reference stations are tracking. There are publicly available uh, reference networks. I've listed one down the bottom, uh, the International GNSS Service, IGS.org, and you can get data from them free. Then you need to process that data in some kind of position library and uh, that does all this carrier phase processing. And that, too, is available as open source code. There's another example down there, rtklib.org, has an open source package for precise positioning. And then you're good to go. Now, I mentioned that dual frequency gives you much faster convergence to the high accuracy. But you don't have to wait until the dual frequency phones come out. You can start doing this with single frequency phones. And here's an example of someone who's already done that. This is an app. Uh, created by the French Space Agency. And they, they're doing exactly what we show uh, on the block diagram on the left. And they're achieving submeter accuracy after a few minutes of convergence. Uh, here's some more uh, external analysis that's been done in a similar way. This is from a paper called Positioning with Android GNSS. This is using one of those chips that I showed you, the chip uh, that goes in cell phones that does dual frequency. And what's been shown here is the cumulative results over many different starts of the GPS. And what you see is that most of the time, the accuracy is 
better than a meter, you see that on the vertical axis, which is zero to one meters, the accuracy gets to better than a meter in less than one minute, and then continues to converge as long as the phone continues to track that carrier phase continuously. Uh, here's a, another similar but different paper. Uh, this is using one of the chips that's meant for cars. And so this was tested in a car, driving around that track there. And what the plot here is showing is the accuracy after the initial convergence while the car was driving. So you see with GNSS alone, the accuracy is one to two meters. Uh, and with this carrier phase processing, it's at a couple of decimeters. So for you to build this, what are you going to need? Well, of course, you need the device location to be enabled, and your app has to have location permission. So that's going to come from the user. You need the basic GNSS measurements. That's been available since Android N. You also need this continuous carrier phase I've been talking about, and that's available in P with the developer option. It would be nice to have dual frequency for fast convergence, and that's coming soon. You need a reference network, such as the one I already mentioned. There are also commercial reference networks out there and commercially available software to do the same thing. But I recommend you start with the free stuff and go from there. And then finally, there's the app from you. So in summary, everything we've been showing you here, we have indoor and outdoor te technology that's been evolving kind of in parallel. In each case, we have a new technology, and Android P gives you something to access it. Let's talk about indoors again. The new technology is Wi-Fi wi round-trip time and round-trip time enabled access point. We give you public API to access these measurements, but you need access point infrastructure. So this is where some of you can do this this year, because if you have a customer who owns or controls a venue, they can upgrade their access point, sometimes just a firmware upgrade, and then you have the infrastructure. Android P comes out later this year, and you can implement something like what Roy just demoed, and have indoor navigation or many other apps. For example, someone goes in a store, where's the milk? You can make the world a better place for all of us by saving us from the tyranny of having to ask directions from strangers. OK. And if, you, if you're not one of those people who has access to this now, in a few years, the infrastructure will naturally evolve as access points upgrade to round trip time, and this will be available from Fuse Location Provider, as Roy said. Now, outdoors, OK, for this carrier phase process, it's not just outdoors, but outdoors with open sky. And what do you need? Dual frequency and continuous carrier phase. And we give you the API and the developer option to make use of that. You will need reference station access, as I mentioned. And then, Applicate, well, what can you do outdoors with open sky? Well, we already mentioned the traffic example, and there's many other examples that readily come to mind where existing GPS accuracy doesn't cut it. For example, geocaching, where people go look for treasures, would be nice to have one meter accuracy. Precision sports monitoring. Imagine a snowboarder who wants to measure her tracks very precisely after the fact. Five meters is not good enough. One meter would be great. Speaking of sports, the more and more drone apps where you kind of follow me and the drone will fly along and video you. Well, it'd be nice if the video is you and not the person next door to you. And so on. I'm sure there are hundreds of apps, and you're probably thinking of some right now, and that's the whole point. We want you to do that, and you and us together bend the arc of technology history closer to the present. And I'm really looking forward to next year to see some of you back here and see what you've created. And so finally, I want to leave you with a couple of pointers. When you build location apps, please build great location apps. You must have user trust. Please provide the user with transparency and control. You're going to have to ask for location permissions for this. Explain to them what you're doing, how it benefits them. When things go wrong, make your app recover gracefully. If these measurements are unavailable for some moment or, or something goes wrong, you can fall back to fused location provider location. So think about that. And finally, respect the battery life trade-offs that we've discussed. So I must remind you to uh, fill out your surveys, please, uh, at that site. And as I mentioned, we'll be available outside the door here uh, for any questions. And so from all three of us, thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits.
Good morning and welcome back to IO Live. It's our third and final day of our developer festival. Now there are still so many great sessions and sandbox demos ahead, so let's get to it. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to talk more about new capabilities we're releasing, as well as the improvements we're making to the platforms and tools you use every day. Today, we are excited to announce the new app model for Android. Using the Android App Bundle, a new publishing format, you can dramatically reduce app size. We're announcing Android Jetpack, the next generation of Android APIs to accelerate Android development. Jetpack is a set of libraries and tools. Jetpack's APIs are integrated with the IDE, too. For instance, Android Studio now includes a navigation editor, which works with the library. You told us, work on emulator boot time. Ready, set, go. I was not cheating. It was not running in the background. Slices are a cool new way to drive re-engagement. We wanted these to be easy to build. So you'll find templates that are rich and flexible. And because it's Jetpack, slices work on 95% of devices. And starting today, you can deeply customize the appearance of your action. First, we're making it even easier for you to promote your action with something new we call action links. Right there at the bottom, these are hyperlinks that you can use from anywhere that point directly into your action. Once users opt in, action notifications gives you a way to connect with them about new features and content. These notifications work on the phone even if users don't have your Android app installed, and you'll be able to re-engage with your users on speakers, smart displays, and other assistant-enabled devices. After somebody engages with your action, you can prompt them to add your action to their routine with just a couple of taps. And we're incredibly excited that Service Worker, the underlying new API that makes PWAs possible, is now supported on all major browsers, including recently Edge on Windows and Safari on both desktop and mobile. This is probably the most important leap forward for the web in the last decade. Today, we're launching Lighthouse 3.0, which makes Lighthouse's performance metrics even more precise and its guidance even more actionable. I'm happy to share that AMP is evolving in some big ways. Now, all AMP content benefits from a fast, free, privacy-preserving cache that optimizes page loads. But they've had these Google.com URLs. So we're fixing that with a new standard called Web Packaging. We're expanding Chrome OS to support developers with the ability to securely run Linux apps on Chrome OS. So this means that many of your favorite tools, editors, and IDEs now work on Chromebooks. We're proud to announce Material Theming, a major update to the Material Design system. Today, we're also releasing two new tools to make it faster to go from design to implementation. Material Theme Editor. This plugin for the popular application Sketch helps designers create and customize a unique material theme. This is the tool used by product teams at Google to review and comment on design iterations to make material yours. Get started at material.io. Cloud TPUs are now available to everyone, and getting started is as simple as following this link. We've released the MO Kit in beta, an SDK that brings Google's machine learning capabilities to mobile developers through Firebase. We believe success in AI should be determined by your imagination, not your infrastructure. Predictions applies ML to your analytics data and predicts the future behavior of your users so you can take proactive actions to optimize your app. For example, you can lower the difficulty of your game for users who are likely to abandon it or send special offers to users who are likely to spend. We're bringing together Google's machine learning technologies from across Google and making that available to every mobile developer working on Android and iOS. And since MLKit is available through Firebase, 
it's easy for you to take advantage of the broader Firebase platform. We're rolling out a major update to AR Core to help you create even richer, more immersive and interactive experiences. That's why we've created SceneForm, a brand new 3D framework that makes it easy for Java developers to create AR Core applications. Today, we're introducing Augmented Images, a new capability in AR Core that makes it possible to attach AR content and experiences to the physical images in the real world. With Cloud Anchors, we actually allow multiple devices to generate a shared, synchronized understanding of the world so that multiple phones can see and interact with the exact same digital content in the same place at the same time.
Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out today early this morning. My name is John Shriver Blake, and I'm a product manager on Firebase. I'm going to be joined on stage later today by Mike McDonald, also a Firebase PM. And we are here to talk about using Firebase at work. You see, lots of people know that Firebase is a great way to build great apps. You can use products like Cloud Firestore and Cloud Functions to build scalable apps quickly without running your own backend servers. You can use products like Crashlytics and performance monitoring to understand and improve your app's quality. And you can use products like Google Analytics for Firebase and Firebase Predictions to understand and grow your user base. There's really a lot that Firebase has to offer. Unfortunately, too many people think that Firebase isn't ready for work, particularly at large organizations. I get questions all the time about security, compliance, and production readiness. And so today, we're going to answer some of those questions and arm you with the information that you need to use Firebase at work. We're going to specifically cover these three areas. Is Firebase ready for my organization? Can I manage and secure my resources in the way that I want to? Is Firebase ready for my lawyers? Can it meet my compliance and regulatory requirements? Is Firebase ready for production? Can I achieve production scale and monitoring with Firebase? We're going to answer these questions today. So let's dig into the first question. Is Firebase ready for my organization? Specifically, can you control access to Firebase resources and enforce organizational policies? The answer is yes. Firebase developers have access to the same powerful Google Cloud Platform tools to secure and access their resources in Firebase, which is great, right? And this works because when it comes right down to it, Firebase projects are cloud projects. And while we provide a simple and intuitive UI to help people onboard with the platform, it's all built on top of Google Cloud infrastructure. So those who need the power can use the Google Cloud Platform tools to manage their Firebase projects. Now, when it comes to managing and securing access to your projects, there are a, are a few core cloud tools that you need to be aware of. First is Cloud Resource Manager, which allows you to centrally manage all of the projects in your organization. It allows an administrator to get visibility into every project they have, organize those projects into a hierarchy with folders, and then sign permissions and access at the folder, project, and resource level. Second is Cloud Identity which provides centralized identity administration for orgs. It includes the ability to support single sign-on and enforce two-factor authentication. Now, many of you are probably using G Suite, which offers many of the same features and also works with Google Cloud and Firebase. Finally, there's Cloud IAM. Cloud IAM gives you fine-grained control of access to your Cloud and Firebase projects. It allows you to do this by assigning roles to users and groups that give them specific and limited access. For instance, there's a role called App Engine Viewer that you might assign to a group and give pretty broadly within your organization. On the other hand, you might save an edit role for a smaller set of people who really need it. Now, if the predefined roles aren't quite for you, you can also define custom roles that have exactly the permissions that make the most sense for your organization. Finally, I'll mention that all permissions are logged and we give you a full audit log of what was changed, when, and by who. Now, those of you who are familiar with Firebase probably know that today, Firebase does not support fine-grained roles or permissions, which really limits your options for controlling access. Well, today, we begin the rollout of fine-grained permissions for Firebase. We've defined a set of permissions, like Stability Admin and Developer Viewer, that allow you to grant access to a limited subset of Firebase. In addition, we're going to give you access to fine-grained permissions, so you can define exactly the roles that make the most sense for you. Now, we just started rolling this out today, and it may take a few weeks before you see it in your project, but I'm going to give you a demo so you know what to expect. Switch over to the screen, please. OK. So here I am, logged into the Firebase console as myself, and I want to give Mike access to this project. So I'm going to go to Project Settings, users, and permissions. And this loads up a custom Firebase UI that makes it really easy for most Firebase users to add users to their Firebase projects. Let me go ahead and add a member. 
I'll include Mike. Okay, and now I need to pick a role for Mike. And you'll see when I click on the role dropdown, we support the same project level roles that Firebase has always supported, but we now can assign custom access to Firebase. Now, I only really need Mike to send notifications, and he wore a t-shirt and a hoodie for today's talk, so I'm kind of doubting his professionalism. So I'm just going to give him access to Grow and not give him access to our developer stability products. So let me go ahead and save that and switch over to Mike. So you can see in this window, I'm logged in as Mike. I'm in the same project. And because Mike has access to Grow Admin, if I go to mm -hmm. OK, let's do this. Uh, if I go to Cloud Messaging with Mike's account, he has full read-write access to view and send notifications. However, if I go to the Develop section and I try and get in the database, I get access denied. So I can know that Mike's not mucking around in my data. Now, some of you are probably thinking that you need more fine-grained permissions for your organization. And we've got that covered, too, with fine-grained permissions and custom roles. Going back to my UI, I'm back in the Firebase UI for IAM. And roles are not in this UI. They're considered an advanced scenario. So I'm going to go over to Advanced Permission Settings. And what this is going to do is open up the Cloud IAM console. So these systems are working on the same backends, same users, same permissions. But the Cloud console has a much broader array of features to help you control and manage access to your project. One of those features are roles. So I'm going to go ahead and click into roles. And you can see here the full list of roles that are predefined for my project, and also a role I created up here called Mike's Special Role that has specific permissions just for Mike. Now, you probably wouldn't make a specific role for one person, but you get the gist. You get the choice to define the roles the way you want with the permissions that you want. Finally, I mentioned audit logging. And we do offer quite a bit of audit logging for these scenarios. I'll go back to the Cloud Platform console, the dashboard, and there's another tab called Activity that I just clicked on. And this Activity feed gives you a detailed rundown of administrative actions in your organization, including IAM changes. There we go. And so you can see there's a record for that last change that I made. Firebase John at Gmail removed Firebase Grow Admin from Firebase Mike. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's why it didn't work. Um, Anyway, you get the full view of everything that's happened in your organization so that your administrators can really keep an eye on what's happening. So uh, can we go back to the slides, please? So a takeaway for you is that Firebase is ready for your organization because you can now use cloud powerful, powerful management tools to manage your Firebase projects and restrict access. OK, let's talk about the lawyers. If you've ever tried to deploy a new service in a large organization, you know that it can be a real challenge. If that service doesn't meet your compliance and regulatory requirements, it can be a complete non-starter. Add to that the complexity of GDPR, and the whole thing is really daunting. We want to make this as easy as possible for you. And to this end, the Firebase team has been investing a lot in compliance. And today, we're ready to meet many organizations' compliance needs. In addition, we've been particularly focused on how we can help you implement privacy best practices and be compliant with GDPR. Now, before I go much further, I want to make this really clear. I am not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice. And we're going to talk about general best practices, but really every case is different. So if you haven't had a conversation about these topics with a lawyer, I strongly suggest that you do. OK, so I had a funny experience this winter. I was at an indoor water park with my son, and we were waiting to get in line. And a couple behind me, who also must have worked together, started talking about GDPR in line at a water park. And they were really stressed out. They were t talking about how much work they had to do, how many open questions they had, and how hard it was get to get a clear answer to those questions. And I really could not figure out why they were talking about GDPR at a water park. And it was only later that I realized that I was wearing this GDPR t-shirt. So it was really my fault, my choice of t-shirt that day ruin that couple's vacation. I worked on GDPR for Firebase, and so I could relate. It's been a lot of work and a fair amount of stress. But with the benefit of the hindsight, I've come to view it as an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to ensure that you're doing the right things for your users and their privacy. So what we're going dis to discuss today are privacy best practices and how Firebase can help you achieve them. Now, there's really a lot to consider with privacy, but I want to call your attention to these three areas that I think require specific focus. So one, how can you ensure that the third parties that you rely on are doing the right thing with your user's data? Two, are you properly handling notice and consent from your users? Three, are you following best practices around transparency and control of user data? Let's dig into number one. Today, it's almost impossible to build an app without relying on a third-party service. Many of you are probably using Firebase, Google Cloud Platform, and multiple other services in your app. Now, if those services have access to your user data, it's really important that you have a clear understanding of how that data is used and protected by those services. You also need to ensure that that use is consistent with your own terms of service, privacy policy, and consent experiences. So you really need to understand this well. So how can Firebase help? First, in order for, to help you be confident in our security and privacy practices, we've really made a lot of progress on getting certifications for Firebase. You can see we have a bevy of ISO and SOC certifications, and we've been steadily adding certifications over the past several months. In fact, just a few days ago, we added ISO 2717 and ISO 2718 to Firestore. And we're going to continue to make progress on those specific certifications over the next couple months. OK. One other thing I want to highlight in this area are DPSTs. DPSTs are legal agreements between you and your third-party service provider that govern how your data is protected and used by those services. If you're subject to GDPR, you need to have these types of agreements in place with your service providers. The good news is that Firebase makes this really easy. All of Firebase services are covered under a DPST, and they're included by default in our terms of service. So if you're using Firebase and you've accepted our most recent terms, you're covered under our DPSTs. OK, let's talk about notice and consent. I brought this up because notice and consent standards are really changing. And so if you haven't reviewed your notice and consent flows recently, I strongly suggest that you do that. The high-level goal here is to make it really clear to your users what data you're collecting and how that data is used. If you do need to get consent, you need to really focus in on that scenario and make sure that you're getting consent in an explicit and clear way from the users. Also, and this is something that people often miss, if you need consent, you need to make sure you're not gathering data before you get that consent. This one trips a lot of people up. Finally, you need to make sure that consent is recorded properly and that you can prove that you have it if you need to. We've been working hard to help our users and our developers with notice and consent. First, we have a number of products today that auto-initialize on launch and therefore may start collecting data immediately from your users. You may decide that you need consent for that data. And so to give you the flexibility that you need, we've updated all of these APIs so that they can be configured to not auto-initialize. So you can get the user consent that you need and then go ahead and initialize those SDKs. In addition, we've launched an update to Friendly Picks that demonstrates how to track user consent using Firebase. For those of you who aren't familiar with Friendly Picks, it's an open source demo application built on the Firebase platform. It includes iOS, Android, and web clients, and it's available on GitHub at the URL on this slide. We hope that you'll take a look at it and that it makes it easier for you to implement this critical user experience. OK, finally, let's talk about transparency and control. The basic principle in this area is that it should be easy for your users to understand what data you have about them, and they should be in control of that data. So a great example of this is Google's My Activity site. It shows users a detailed view of all of their data on Chrome, Android, and Google Search, as well as other Google products. It's really quite an exhaustive set of data and provides a lot of transparency for our users. It also puts users in control. They can delete individual pieces of data or delete data in bulk. I think it's a really great example of how to implement transparency and control for your products. We want to help Firebase developers implement best practices in this area. And an update that we made recently 
was improving our support for deletion in a number of our services, particularly services like Crashlytics and Analytics. It's now possible in all of these services to delete data for a single user. So if you get a request to delete data, you're now empowered to do that. We've also launched a deletion and export guide. This guide walks a Firebase developer through the process of implementing user deletion and user export flows if they're using Firebase. You'll find it's actually quite simple to do using the power of cloud functions. And I'm going to give you a quick view of how it works. Now, before we jump into the code, I want to mention that this code is publicly available on GitHub and open source. So you can grab it today and start using it on your projects. I should mention that it also covers user-initiated export, which is another key user scenario for data control. The code itself starts out with this function that's responsible for initiating the delete. The really great thing about Cloud Functions is the amount of flexibility it gives you in how you trigger that function. In this case, we're taking advantage of the fact that Firebase Auth is an event emitter. So specifically, this function will trigger when auth.userOnDelete gets called, or when that event gets emitted. And so the basic model here is you delete the Firebase Auth user. This function kicks off and deletes the rest of their data. Functions does give you a lot of flexibility in this area. So you could also trigger this off of an HTTP request or using the client-side SDK. Once triggered, the code goes through and initiates wipeout calls for each one of the services that might be storing user data. Skipping down a bit, this is the database wipeout function. You'll see in the top bit, we're reading in a list of paths, and then we're iterating through each one of those paths and removing them from the database. But where do the paths come from? Well, they're here in userprivacy.json. You can see it defines the actual paths to delete. In this case, it's a path called users and another called admins. And in both cases, it's keyed off of the UID variable, so we're only deleting data for this specific user. Other products work in a similar way. So there's an example for storage here below, for instance, that will delete storage data for that particular user. So that's it. In a few lines of code, we're properly cleaning up our data when a Firebase user gets deleted. So the key takeaway for you is that Firebase is ready to meet most organizations' compliance needs. And we've provided a number of tools to help you implement privacy best practices and be compliant with GDPR. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk about taking your Firebase project to production. Thanks, John. So John convinced your manager, their manager, their manager's manager, all of those pesky compliance officers in your org and your legal team. But now, you have to come back to your team and convince your operations and DevOps folks that Firebase is ready to scale. Luckily, Firebase is built on top of Google Cloud, as John said, and it can scale to meet the needs of the largest customers, all without breaking the bank. Those finance folks are important, too. Firebase is built on top of Google Cloud Platform, specifically actually on top of a couple Google Cloud products. So Cloud Firestore is exposed both through Firebase and through Google Cloud. It's the same underlying database. And that provides the scalability that you need to start building on Firebase and scale into Google Cloud. But scalability is nothing without reliability. Firebase offers 99.9 .9 and 99.95 SLAs on many of our paid products. And that's in line with Google Cloud and other cloud industry providers. While that's what we promise, people actually often see a lot better. So we're looking at a chart right now uh, provided by Gartner. So Gartner is an industry analyst um, that's measuring uptime on various public cloud providers. So specifically, this is uh, storage buckets. So uh, you know, for instance, Google Cloud Storage on GCP. Uh, for context, a 99.9% SLA is nine hours of downtime. So that's 540 minutes. Um, over there in blue, so that's Google Cloud. That's 22 minutes of downtime, which is 99.995. So that's four and a half nines of uptime observed over the year. Um, and this is just an industry analyst literally querying a bucket you know, a couple times a second or a couple times a minute for a year. Um, so this isn't Google measuring this. This is a third-party industry analyst. We also understand that sometimes you need to create resources in particular locations. Um, either you want to serve content directly from where your customers are, or you need to comply with legal regulations for various countries. 
Google Cloud Platform offers 15 different regions around the world, so all of those blue dots that you can see. And we've announced four additional regions, which are those white dots that are coming online in the near future. This GIF shows an example of creating a new storage bucket in the Firebase console. So you can say, hey, I want to create this new bucket. You can select the region, and you can see a, very, a number of multi-regional and regional deployments. You can select uh, what type of bucket you want, and then create it in Firebase. In the near future, we expect that Cloud Functions and Cloud Firestore will also offer this capability. So now that we're comfortable creating resources and that we know, since they're backed by Google Cloud Platform, that they'll scale, we need to verify that the code that John wrote actually does what he says it does, right? You can't trust anyone who writes code while wearing a sport, ja a sport jacket. To do this, we'll use Stackdriver. So Stackdriver provides visibility into your production resources for the entirety of Google Cloud Platform and parts of Firebase. It does logging, monitoring, alerting, and also things like tracing, debugging, and performance profiling. Here's a quick reference of what Firebase services support which of those various Stackdriver integrations. We'll then dive into how each of them work. So earlier, John showed code that was deployed onto Cloud Functions, it handled wipeout. But we need to ensure that those wipeout functions are running and that they're not erroring out. Cloud Functions integrates really nicely with Stackdriver logging to give you real-time logs about everything that happens on every single function execution. As you can see, this is actually the friendly picks production backend logs. So we can see clean up account, moderate posts, send follower notifications, and we can see every time a function execution started, as well as all of the logs from both standard error and standard log. We automatically suck those up so you don't have to write anything special in your code. You can just say standard, you know, console.log in JavaScript and it'll log it. Or if something errors, we'll automatically pull that out and display it. That's a great view, but what happens if you want more proactive error reporting? So you can use Stackdriver error reporting to understand, hey, there's a new error. Here's exactly what's wrong. John's code may have been error-free, but that's not true for everything that we're running right now. We can see um, up at the top a bunch of open alerts that have been opened because our code has thrown an error. If we click on one of those, you can actually see that top one says, deletion of inactive user failed. Error, an internal error occurred, quota exceeded. So it tells us exactly what the problem is and how we can go and resolve that in the Google Cloud Console. It also tells us how many occurrences of the error occurred, when they happened, when the last one was. Um, and I actually get emails for every single error that occurs in friendly picks. It's really nice. OK, we've seen logs. We've gotten error reports. Now we want to build dashboards to understand exactly how things are working in production. Stackdriver provides logging or monitoring and alerting with a bunch of different metrics about each of these Firebase and Google Cloud services. So you can create really granular dashboards that tell you exactly what's going on in your service. This slide is intended to be a little overwhelming to show you just how much information we're giving. I think the real-time database actually spits out about 20 or 25 different metrics that give you really, really fine-grained insight into what's going on in the database. Using the Stackdriver console, it's also really easy to create custom dashboards off of these metrics. And actually, a demo that I'll show will go into, into to greater detail, and I'll make a new dashboard. But you can create things like in that top left, we're seeing how much data is stored in cloud storage in the real-time database, and we're setting an alert that says, hey, anytime something is over 5 gigabytes of data stored, send me an email. You can configure those, again, those alerts in the Stackdriver console. So on the left side, we're saying any time a metric goes above that large number, which happens to be five gigabytes, um, any time that threshold is exceeded, send an alert to FirebaseMike at gmail.com. There's a really cool feature of Stackdriver as well where you can actually add documentation. So if you have markdown docs, maybe your company stores everything in a wiki or other markdown, you can copy that in, and that will get sent along in the alert. So you can actually debug immediately once you get that alert. On the right, I've set up a bunch of different alerts. Um, you can do some, some really simple things that are just basic conditions that say, hey, if this metric is over 5 gigabytes for more than a minute or this metric no longer exists, send me an alert. But you can also do more complicated things like velocity alerting. So I have an alert that says, 
if the number of connections to my database doubles in a minute, send me an email, right? Because that's, that's sending me information that says, hey, I just got this huge load spike. Maybe I need to do something. Or, hey, the number of objects stored in my storage bucket has doubled. Maybe I want to move things around, or maybe I want to start you know, eliminating old data. This is what one of those alerts looks like when it actually fires. Um, so I run a couple production services. Uh, one of them, for instance, uh, I run a Minecraft server. I got an email saying, hey, my server is down. What do I do? And I, as you can see, down in the bottom, I actually have documentation right there that says, you know, is the VM up? So SSH into the VM and make sure it's up. Make sure the disks are mounted. Make sure uh, that my systemd job is working perfectly. Um, so it works for both VMs, but it'll also work for the various other cloud uh, platform services that I mentioned. And then once you acknowledge it, you get another email that says, hey, the incident is over. Everything is fine. You can also do alerts to SMS. And I believe we have PagerDuty and other tools like Slack integrations that you can send them to kind of wherever is most convenient for your org. OK. So we built our app. It's running in production. It can scale. We have great visibility. Um, everything is going fine. You're sitting in your desk one day. Um, and someone who kind of looks like John walks over and says, hey, uh, how much is this going to cost? Right? Like, I have a bunch of questions. I, I need to go and report to my VP. Like, maybe this is, is or isn't going to work out. Um, and they say, you know, what's it going to cost over the next month or the next year? And you're sweating bullets. Uh, you go to the Cloud Platform website. Luckily, we have this awesome pricing calculator. Um, so on both Firebase and Google Cloud Platform, you can kind of dial around and say, hey, you know, based on the, the information I have in Stackdriver, it's kind of projecting that I'm growing at you know, x gigabytes of data stored every month. Let's see what that looks like extrapolated over to 12 months, what it's going to cost me. Um, and in the, in the Cloud Platform pricing calculator, you can even start tweaking things like, hey, I want to now move this data to a cheaper storage class. Maybe it's not being accessed as frequently, so you can archive that data. That's going to be cheaper for you, and you can start doing that kind of thing. It's really, really awesome. And similar to Stackdriver, we had kind of the estimation portion. You can also set up billing alerts on top of that. So maybe you budgeted $1,000 a month for your storage costs. You can set up a budget that will send you a billing alert when you've exceeded that. It's really nifty. Let's actually see that, switching over to the demo. We're going to go through all of those things just so that you believe me. OK. Here we are in the Google Cloud Console uh, using Stackdriver logging. So you can see this massive, massive scrolling thing of all of my cloud functions. It's not just cloud functions. I can actually look that audit log that John showed earlier can show up in here, and I can get certain methods. Um, I can get all of the kind of the, the Google Cloud project things. I can see when service accounts were used. Um, but let's focus on the cloud functions for a minute. Within that, you can also get per function logs. So as you can see, I have a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of different functions running in friendly picks. Uh, let's say I only care about all of the delete old posts functions. So I can filter based on that and see a list of every single one of those that's happened. You can go back to the, the full one. You can also see things uh, registered by errors or warnings, so kind of filter based on that. Um, I think there's some regular expression filtering as well. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, you can start typing and say, hey, uh, let's see on succeeded. Succeed. Let's try that. Uh, nothing found. Darn. Um, OK. So logging. And then let's pop over to error reporting. So you can see Friendly Picks is throwing a couple errors in production. Let's see why those happen. There's an error permission denied, last occurred. About 20 hours ago, we can drop in. It'll load, and it'll tell us, hey, this part in your code, you can actually see a bunch of other errors that have been thrown. Maybe we should go and fix that. The other thing, you can say, hey, maybe I actually don't care about this. We'll mark it as resolved. Go back, and it no longer shows up. So we filtered, maybe I actually do care about the resolved. I can see it there. So it's a nice way of actually managing kind of the day-to-day the -day operations of your application. OK, let's pop over to the Stackdriver console. And you can see that same dashboard that I showed you earlier. We have data stored. We have bandwidth. We have the number of database requests. We have the number of storage requests. I want to know when are my functions executing and what's happening to them. 
So I'm going to go and say, add a chart. We'll call this functions executions, cloud functions. And you can see that we have a metric called executions. That's a count of executions broken down by status code, for instance. And you can actually see the name of the function and the value in kind of number of executions per second. Um, if I wanted to, I could also group by, say, the function name. Um, and you'll get not only this is kind of the aggregate sum of all of the things that are happening in my function. Um, but I could, if I wanted to, instead filter by uh, give me functions that are OK. So only give me the functions that are succeeding, or only give me the functions that are failing. Um, and maybe here I also want to group by the function name. So this will give me just the number of functions that have succeeded grouped by function. And we will save that. And it'll actually give me the historical information as well. So you can see this one particular day, May 7th, a couple days ago, um, we had a huge spike. And we were getting you know, two cleanup account requests every second uh, for this little period of time. Um, and act actually, you can see that there's a sliding line on the screen. So you can actually time correlate across different, uh, different things. You can also kind of zoom in and see, hey, I want to look at this particular time. So it looks like between about 2 PM uh, and 2.10 PM, we had a huge spike. And that corresponded to a bunch of changes in the database, a bunch of changes in storage, and our function executing. So it's really nice. If you get an alert, you can then pop over the dashboard and see exactly kind of what's going on across the different products. Speaking of alerting, we can hop over. We can look at, for instance, the alerting policy on that velocity alert. You can see nothing interesting has happened recently. But maybe we want to edit it. Um, we've, say, found out that it doubling is not that troubling. I like that. That rhymed. But let's edit that and say maybe if it goes up by 500%, we want to change that. So we can save the condition and save the policy. And if something changes, we'll get alerted about it. Um, I will try one that I think is going to be fun. Uh, so it looks like we have just about a gigabyte of data. I'm going to set up a, or I'm going to change my storage over quota threshold, uh, which is alert me anytime the amount of data that I have goes above a certain amount. I will edit that, and I'll actually just say, um, so it's currently at five gigabytes. Uh, I will set that to. Oh, that's still higher than what I have. So we will drop that. There we go. So we'll drop it to below the threshold. We'll save. Uh, we'll save that. And I'll keep going through the demo. But at the end, you can see I have email tabs over here. I'm going to see if I can get an alert. So I'm going to see if it will send me an email saying that that thing fired and that I should go and deal with it. Um, obviously, it may take a little while because, as you can see, the granularity on here um, we only kind of check maybe once a day what the bucket size is. Um, but I could do things uh, like database requests or storage requests or function executions that are updated more frequently and get alerted uh, more frequently there. OK. So lastly, we're going to set up budget alerts. Um, so going back, I want to say um, you know, this is a server that I'm running myself. I'm paying for this with my personal credit card. I want to know when I'm spending $50 a month. So I've set up an alert that says, Notify me when this project is over $50 a month. And I can actually set up percentage alerts as well. So I can say when I'm at $25 a month, $45 a month, and $100 a month. And note, this is just a proactive alert. This isn't going to shut my server down, right? Everything is going to keep going. Um, so that's kind of a two-edged sword, right? Part of it is if your, your website goes on Hacker News and you get this huge load spike, you obviously don't want the, the quote unquote hug of death where everyone goes on Hacker News and suddenly your website is returning 503s or, or um, you know, whatever, 429s or, or 402s uh, for quota exceeded errors. You want your website to keep working. But on the other side, you kind of want that visibility into, am I going to get this huge credit card bill? Um, if you want, you can also programmatically manage these. So you can send alerts to PubSub. And if you really wanted to, you could actually hook up PubSub to a cloud function to then go anywhere you want. So there are a lot of really nice integrations. Um, I will save this. I'll move it back down to 10, and I'll actually see if I can quota alert myself. So I changed it. I've already spent $18. Uh, it should probably send me an email, oh my god, Mike, you're blowing through all of your money. You should stop. Uh, we will actually pop over. I have filters. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like that storage one fired. 
but I have kind of a, a bunch of historical uh, alerts from Stackdriver. Here's what they look like. Again, you can see, hey, this is exactly when it started. Here's the project. You can view it. It'll pop you back over to the Stackdriver console, and you can go deal with it. And then once it's resolved, again, you get that nice resolution email. And I'll see if I got another email from the other billing alert. No, it doesn't look like it. But again, here's a previous one that I fired. Sent it, hey, you've hit 100% of your $50 a month budget. Maybe you should go deal with that. OK, let's go back to the slides. So John started the presentation by talking about what Firebase provides to make sure that your organization can use it, right? The fine-grained control that you and your team need so that you know, I'm not mucking around, uh, sending crazy push notifications, or screwing with data in the database. I'm only doing exactly what I, in my role, need. John also showed how you can provide a great uh, foundation for compliance and legal requirements through Firebase. So your lawyers are going to be happy with it. And lastly, we just went through how Firebase handles global scale and gives you visibility into everything that's happening in your app, both from a production standpoint as well as a financial standpoint. So yes, Firebase is ready for work. Thank you all very much for coming. John and I will be over in the Firebase Flutter and Cloud sandbox after this talk, and we're happy to talk to you about any and all of these needs. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the last day of Google I.O. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exit. Very nice. And so what is Nest doing with OpenThread? Yeah, so if we, we move over here, uh, Nest is actually uh, enabling a number of products uh, with OpenThread. The first is a, a connected deadbolt for your door. It only communicates via thread. It's got no other connectivity technology with it. Uh, and because it's using thread, uh, it can actually last for years on AA batteries. But I can do a quick demo here. Uh, so if I open up my mobile app, uh, hold down the button, we'll see the door unlock, and there it goes. And that's all happening over thread. Of course, the mobile is communicating over Wi-Fi. It goes to a thread border router to this battery-powered device. Would that work if my phone were not connected to the Wi-Fi? Uh, it would work. So, yeah, so as I mentioned, our application layer operates over any IPv6 network. So uh, it just happens that this mobile phone is only on Wi-Fi. Uh, but uh, you know, if it was connected to cellular, that would work as well. Very cool. That is very interesting. And if I were a developer and I were interested in finding out more about OpenThread to use in my products, where would I go? Yeah, so we have a website at openthread.io. We have our source code at github.com slash openthread. Uh, and you can reach us at Google Groups at openthread-users. All right. So if you're interested in making your own cool internet-connected device that I don't know, does something, does something amazing that I haven't thought of yet, um, go ahead on over to openthread.io and check it out for yourself. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Bye, y'all.
Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're really excited to have you all here today. My name is Jen Devins. I lead the user experience team for Google Accessibility. And with me, I have uh, Andrea Wong. She's a researcher on accessibility. Catherine Ideal, who is a designer on accessibility. And Bethany Fong, who is the lead designer on Google Material Design. We're really happy to have such a great crowd here that's interested in inclusive design and accessibility. And we're looking forward to sharing with you how you can make your products more inclusive. But before we dive in and get into specifics, we wanted to start with just some basics. What is accessibility, inclusive design, and why it's important? As described by the Web Accessibility Initiative, accessibility, usability, and inclusive design are all very closely related. Their goals, approaches, and guidelines overlap significantly. And when we sit down to design and develop our apps, it's really effective to address them together. Let's start with accessibility. Accessibility focuses on enabling users with disabilities to perceive, interact, understand, and navigate tools and services products, and that they can contribute equally without barriers. Now, some of the guidelines we think about with accessibility, such as clear color contrast or uh, clear, concise writing, are useful not only to users with disabilities, but also those that might be or that don't have disabilities but might be in different situations. For example, we know that alternative text can be useful to users who are blind and can't see the screen, as it describes the imagery and visual icons. Alternative text can also be useful to users who might be out in remote locations with low bandwidth or using old technology. Another example, it's clear that providing enough time for users to interact with and read content on the screen is useful for users who might have a motor impairment or cognitive impairment. This extra time is also very useful for users that might be learning a new language or have low literacy or even children learning to read or simply just people distracted. And this is how accessibility is a key component of inclusive design. Inclusive design is all about considering the wide range of human abilities. We think of age, gender, ethnicity, and others. And as you can see, accessibility overlaps significantly with these areas as well. And that's why we feel like accessibility is a really clear starting point. So at this point, we could just throw up on the screen a checklist of guidelines for you to follow to ensure that your product is accessible. And that's a great place to start, no doubt about it. However, what we've seen is that may often lead to a product that's technically accessible, but not necessarily usable, let alone a great experience for all users. And this is where usability comes into play. Now, how many people, by a quick show of hands, take time to reach out and get feedback and input from users? Quick show of hands, right. It's, it's an important and really useful thing to do, right? Unfortunately, we know that a lot of users with disabilities are left out of this really key critical point in the process. If we're not out there talking and observing our users, we'll never understand what are their true experiences? What are their challenges? And most importantly, what are their insights that could actually benefit everyone? And in the end, you could be left missing out on a large number of potential users and also miss out on helping existing users who might be in these limiting situations. Okay. So that's the basics. We got the stage set. 
Let's, we, now, now we want to walk you through more of a case study to demonstrate how to design and develop with accessibility in mind. We're going to today, we're going to use our fictional app. It's a travel and hospitality app called Crane. And we're going to use this throughout the rest of the talk to demonstrate specifics of how to make products more inclusive using the standard user-centered design methodologies, as well as material, de material design system, which includes clear guidelines, components, and tooling. OK. So to get this started, we're going to break it down into four primary stages. We have defining the product vision, design, development, and after design. Now, this framework probably seems familiar to you, and that's on purpose. We're not here to introduce yet another process for you to follow. Instead, we see this as a toolkit of ideas and things that you can do to enhance your product to make it more inclusive. Because in the end, inclusive design is really just simply good design. OK, so now Andrea is going to walk through the first stage of defining the product vision. Thanks, Jen. Stage one, defining the product vision. No matter what you're building, understanding what problems are solving for your users is the key to product success. So who are your users? Most teams start with the assumption that all their users are fully abled. But that may not always be the case. So let's say you're building a Photos app. And you think, well, why would someone who is blind use my Photos app? Actually, a person who is blind may use your app because they want to take photos and then share them with friends and families or post them on social media just like everyone else. Consider these three people on the screen. There's a man in a wheelchair with Lou Gehrig's disease, so he has impaired motor functioning for upper and lower body. There's a boy with a broken arm. And there's a woman holding a full bag of groceries. Let's have a pop quiz. Which of these three people have limited mobility? Raise your hand if you think it's the man in the wheelchair. OK. Hands down. Raise your hand if you think it's the boy. Thank you. And lastly, raise your hand if you think it's the woman. So if you raise your hands all three times, you're correct. All three of them have a different relationship with limited mobility, whether it's permanent, like the man, temporary, like the boy, or situational, like the woman with the groceries. Yet they're all experiencing the exact same need right now. It's a good reminder that for every single one of us, we'll have accessibility needs at some point throughout our lifetime. Disability is a much broader term than we might think. And often, when something doesn't work well for a user with no disabilities, that pain point is amplified for people with disabilities. And that's actually good news for you, because it gives you much clearer signals of what you should be focusing on. Because when everything doesn't work, when something doesn't work for everyone, it clearly is something you, you should be paying attention to. And that's, in fact, what we found with our studies at Google. All users have the same core needs, because they're all trying to you know, meet the same goal, whether it's sending a photograph, writing an email, buying crypto kitties, whatever it is. So at this point, you're probably asking, well, how do I do research with people with disabilities? The answer is, do what you usually do. Are you, let's say, in the early stage right now where you're just chatting and sitting down and talking to users? If you are, that's actually the easiest and the best time to be including users with disabilities into your process, because you can get their context, their needs, and everything right from the very start. You can ask the exact same questions as you would to someone without disabilities. The only difference is you have to ask a few additional questions about the assistive technologies that they may be using and their context of use. So for example, 
you'll be asking, say, how do you use your SIPS technologies when you're navigating a mobile device? Or how does your impairment impact or not impact your interactions when you're planning travel? Or maybe even which workarounds, if any, do you use to get to what you need? And always, always follow up after each question with why. Tell me more. To really dig in there to get the context of their needs. The bonus here is their answers may inspire new ways of interactions that you've never thought of before. Or maybe you're past that stage already. That's fine. Right now, you're testing a low fidelity like paper prototype. That's fine. You can still test with people with disabilities. Let's say you're testing with a user who is blind and uses a screen reader, which is an assistive technology that reads out loud the contents on the screen. So you're doing that, but you don't have a screen reader friendly prototype. What you can do here, though, is write a script of what the screen reader might verbalize and have someone on your team act as a screen reader. And that person can read each step out loud to the user as they walk through the user flow during the study session. By integrating people with disabilities, whenever you're talking to people without disabilities, you're automatically ensuring that their viewpoints will be included and part of the process throughout the entire design and the development phase. Along with understanding user needs, you need to have a general comprehension of assistive technologies and the different tools that people may use to interact with your product. Trying the technologies yourself is a great place to start. But the best way to learn is to observe the real experts. Those are the people who use these technologies day in and day out. And if you can't find someone to observe in real life, that's OK. You can just go online and ask, look for any kind of video, whether it's like going to the ATM, going to the grocery store. There are countless great videos online to explain the different ways people use different technologies. The goal here is to understand what makes a good versus a poor experience, what are the common pitfalls, and the standard expectations that people have when using your site or app. Later, using our fictional app Crane, we'll walk you through designing a great keyboard navigation model. Starting with the keyboard uh, navigation model creates a very good foundation for you when building for other assistive technologies, which we won't go into here. You may be feeling a bit overwhelmed right now on how to design to meet all those needs. But the great thing about design inclusively is that people and teams have been working for years to understand what design inclusively actually means. So as Jen mentioned, material design components includes accessibility guidelines baked right in that anyone can follow regardless of the size of your team. Doing the right thing, though, isn't necessarily mutually exclusive to good business sense either. It could even increase your market share. According to the American Institute of Research, who came out with this report a few months ago, working age people with disabilities in the US alone have a discretionary income of $21 billion. That's the third largest market segment in the entire country. Then if you think about their families and friends who may also use your product to interact with them, or you know, they may just simply appreciate good design. And this is not just the US alone. According to Gartner, People with disabilities and their friends and family worldwide have a collective disposable income of $8 trillion. Think about that. OK, that was a lot of information. So let's go over the important points to keep in mind. One, talk to people with disabilities to inform their product vision. Two. Learn assistive technologies from the experts. And three, build a better experience for all users and potentially capture more market share. Now I'm going to hand it over to Catherine, who's going to go over stage two design. Right here. Oh, you're right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. 
Hi. Now that you've defined your product vision, it's time to design your app. At this stage, you'll need to think about interaction design, visual design, UX writing, and motion design. But don't worry. We'll do a design challenge together using our fictional app, Crane, to learn how to do this. So Crane is a travel and hospitality app that lets users book flights and accommodations on a computer or phone. In terms of interaction design, you might be wondering, how do I even get started designing accessible and usable experience for everyone? Well, design as you normally do. Have your wireframes and your sketches, and we'll get started there. This is a wireframe of filter options on mobile when you search for a flight on Crane. Here we can see that the checkboxes are aligned with the label, but they're pretty far apart. When designing your layout, ensure that related content and controls are grouped together. This makes it easier to understand and also easier to reach for people with motor disabilities, especially for people with ALS or a traveler on a bumpy train. So what we did here is that we placed the checkboxes right next to the labels. It's just a better experience for everyone. In terms of interaction design, you can also have a huge impact on all users by thinking about the tab interaction model, meaning a great keyboard experience. Here, we have a wireframe on web of the flight search results. Tabbing on the keyboard allows you to jump from one interactive element on the screen, as we can see right here. This would be the default tab experience if we didn't design it at all. It would take 94 tab stops to go from point A, the back button, to point B, the filter options. This is a slow experience. So what we can do is actually group major elements together, like this list of individual flights. Now it only takes seven tab stops to reach point B. And once you've grouped your big tab stops together, don't forget how to quickly navigate to those smaller elements such as the individual flights in this big list of flights. Here, we'll go with an up and down arrow option to navigate between them. Overall, this is a much better and productive experience for power users, much like yourselves right here, and assistive tech users alike. Here are some things you can do to make your app more accessible in terms of interaction design. Group your content and your controls together. Design your tab interaction model. And don't forget the air navigation as well. Now, on to Bethany to talk about visual design. Thanks, Catherine. So now that we've laid a good foundation in terms of interaction design, let's refine our visuals. Now, to start with the very basics, I'm sure you all have felt the pain of viewing light gray text on light gray background. Let's not put our users through that. So the number one way that you can be a hero for these users is by ensuring that color contrast is between your foreground and your background colors is going to be high enough. And you can use our material color tool pictured here to check the legibility of your choices and check them against different background colors, like the three shades of purple here that we were exploring for the Crane app. So let's apply this. Going back to our app, where the user is filling in their information to purchase their flight. These faded colors that you see are trendy, but the contrast is so low that it's hard for even most sighted users to have a legible experience here. And remember, this is going to be better not just for users with low vision, but someone with dilated eyes after a doctor's appointment, or people like yourselves out in the sun all day with glare on your screen. So let's add more color contrast. First, we're going to zoom in on how we can add contrast into the text field component. We increase the font weight and color darkness in the text fields, which makes it easier to scan and ensures a better visual hierarchy. And we also increase the background color darkness on the button at the bottom. 
making the text more legible, and making the call to action much easier to spot, which is really important because you're trying to get your users to purchase something here. And already, with the before and after, you can see that this is a much better design. Other than just looking more aesthetically pleasing, the text is more legible, the relative importance of elements is clearer, and the calls to action are a lot easier to spot. So now, your user is filling in their information into those much better text fields and is getting closer to booking that flight. But it looks like they made an error. Some users can tell because of the bolded orange outline. However, some users with color blindness might miss this important piece of information. And this can be fixed by supplementing any information that's coded in color through other means, like icons or shapes. So we're going to check out the Material Icons site and search for error icons. It's good to use a central resource like this because these are common visual metaphors that may be recognizable to a wide variety of users. So looks like we can go ahead and use this one. So we're going to download it, add it to our text field. And now there are two ways to understand that this is an error state. And this makes it clearer for everyone, not just users who are colorblind. And for our last visual design example, let's look at focus state and element size on screen. So when users choose a seat in this travel app, it's important that they can select the seat that they want and that they know that their selection was successful. And on mobile, this means having a touch target size of 48 dip by 48 dip, or about 7 millimeters wide, which is calibrated against the size of an adult fingertip. Makes sense. And on web, try to ensure that your focus is highly visible. You can see it as the bold purple outline around seat 8A. So when you're doing your visual design, when keeping it accessible, make sure that you have high color contrast. Make sure that you have multiple visible indicators for any important component states. And lastly, make sure that your touch target sizes are going to be large enough for people to actually reach. Back over to Catherine. Thanks, Bethany. I'm back. With writing, you have the power to guide all users with accessible on-screen text, as well as meaningful off-screen text that will be verbalized by the screen reader. A screen reader is software that sits between you and the application, and it works in tandem with the keyboard. The keyboard moves the focus, and the screen reader will verbalize whatever has come into focus. We have this example from Google.com, if you heard of it, and it will read this button as, Google search button, because the screen reader automatically reads out loud the label, Google search, and the control type, button. So back to our Crane app. Here we have a checkout screen. It has several interactive elements, but let's just focus on these four buttons. And remember, the screen reader automatically reads out loud the control type. So it will verbalize these buttons as button, 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 button. That's problematic. We don't know what the buttons will do, and the cancel order and complete order actions are right next to each other, which could lead to major user error. Instead, what we can do is add meaningful and concise accessibility labels in addition to the default button verbalization. So here we've added previous step, checkout progress, cancel order, and check out order. Now we know what each button will do, and they won't be a major gaffe of canceling an order rather than completing one, and vice versa. You can be a champion for screen reader users by writing accessory labels in addition to the default verbalization provided by screen readers. In terms of motion design, have you ever had something important flash before your eyes, blink, and then be gone? Well, this just happened to you, and it's a major pain point for users with low vision or someone who isn't paying attention. Try to ensure that alerts like snack bars are present on the screen long enough so that everyone can see them, like right now, and have an option to easily dismiss them, like a dismiss button or a tapping out function. Likewise, consider supporting screen magnification users. Here on web, when a user hovers over a seat, 
they get additional information about that seat in a hover card. But it covers the rest of the screen when magnified. To help our users get back to whatever they are doing, consider an easy escape hatch, such as an escape key shortcut or a close button. To ensure that your motion design accessible, present alerts for long enough and have an option to easily dismiss them. Likewise, easily escape hover information during screen magnification. At this stage, we've designed the interactive, visual, writing, and motion aspects of our product. Now it's time to talk to users. Get some feedback and check if you're on the right track. Also, see if you ran into any major blockers you didn't anticipate. Consider running a heuristic evaluation. It consists of having a small set of examiners evaluate your app against known usability principles, otherwise called heuristics. So right here, we have three heuristics from the material design, accessibility guidelines, um, and they're clear, they're robust, and specific. So let's check. Is your app clear, meaning are its layouts non-crowded, and are its calls to action visually distinct? Is your app robust? Does it support a variety of user capabilities? Finally, is your app specific? Does it specifically support a variety of user technologies in the ways that the user expects? Let's try this out with Crane. So here we have two button variations, and we want to see if it's clear enough for vis low vision users. Well, we may find that these two buttons actually have the same color contrast, but we may also find that people prefer the one on the right because the shopping cart icon makes the purpose of the button more obvious for people with and without disabilities. After completing your product, conduct a heuristics evaluation. And feel free to use the accessibility guidelines provided by material design. Is your app clear, robust, and specific? Now back to Bethany on how to develop your app. Thanks, Catherine. So you've moved on to the development stage. And you'll want to make sure that all of those decisions you just made in the design stage hold through to the final product. So the first thing you can do is use standard components when designing. If you use material components, they will be pre-vetted, work well within a holistic design system, and they'll be usable and recognizable to your users. If you use something non-standard, note that you'll perhaps have to design the full component yourself, as well as marking it up with the appropriate metadata, particularly for screen reader users. You'll need to provide labels, structure, and traversal paths. And designers, one tool that you can use is Gallery, created by Google to help you manage design iterations and get quick design feedback. If you use our material theme editor with Sketch, which is a popular design tool, and upload your mocks to Gallery, you'll automatically see all measurements, or red lines, as designers call them. For example, you can see here how large this price text is and make sure that the touch target size is going to be large. This allows for a piece of text to scale up or down according to the user's individual settings. This is really important for users with low vision who may have large text turned on, but usually the rest of the UI remains the same size. So follow the specific platform standards for how scalable text should be implemented. And here's the same screen with the large text now rendered correctly. You can actually read it, which is great. So engineers, you can keep users with various impairments in mind as you code, just as a designer would periodically consider a user with low vision, no vision, or some mobility challenges. And one way of focusing this work is to schedule periodic bug bashes and fix-its from a specifically accessibility point of view. And there's also a number of tools that you can use during development to check your accessibility on web and on Android. These include Accessibility Scanner on Android, which is the app shown here, which is really easy to use because it checks your app screen by screen for any accessibility errors. And come by the Accessibility Sandbox during I.O. to speak to our engineers to learn about other dev tools that you can use during your own process. 
So as you're developing, don't forget to use common components when you can and then just inherit the work that we've already done for you there. Use scalable text and use accessibility development tools throughout your process to check yourself as you go. All right. Thanks, Bethany. So now I'm going to talk about the last stage, stage four, after development. At this point, the bulk of your development work is complete, and you're about to launch. This <laughs> At this time, we recommend using a tool like Prelaunch Report from the Google Play Store. Some of you may already be using Prelaunch Report, but the good news is it now includes accessibility. So upload your app to Alpha or Beta Channel, and it'll crawl through your app to identify a number of ways to improve it, like crashes, latency issues, and now, of course, accessibility. And you won't need to instrument your app ahead of time. For the web, we recommend automated accessibility tools that's built right into our Chrome Dev tools. So inside the Audits panel, you'll see a tool called Lighthouse. Lighthouse will run about 40 automated tests against your site to check for common accessibility issues. When it's finished, it'll give you a score. It'll point out the failing elements. And the best part is, it'll link you to documentation with instructions on how to fix those failing elements. And if you've done everything right up to this point, if you listen to all of us, then everything here should be a breeze. One more thing. No great onboarding experience is complete without good help content. And help content is a resource that people with disabilities often utilize. So make sure you include in help content on accessibility and make sure that content is actually accessible. This is a great opportunity to help all users get off to a great start with your app or your product and recover quickly when they get stuck. Yay, you've launched. Now that we're here, you're probably going through your metrics, your analytics, you're checking the effectiveness of your launch, the user engagement, and so forth. You're hopefully also doing user studies, and you're measuring satisfaction to see how well your app is being received by everyone. At this point, include respondents with accessibility needs so that you're hearing all the feedback. This is also the perfect time to stop and understand what benefits your team has reaped from designing inclusively from the very beginning. So here, do a post-mortem, decide what to cut, what to keep, what to change, and apply that to your next cycle. Over time, design inclusively will become second nature to you. Let's go over the main points. One, check for common accessibility issues with pre-launch report and Lighthouse and countless other tools out there. Make sure you have accessibility help content that's accessible, and get feedback from users with disabilities. And now, Jen will summarize all this for us. Thank you, Andrea. All right, so there you have it, our toolkit of ideas that hopefully you can apply to your process. We know it's a lot of information. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there that you can rely on. We wanted to leave you with one thing you can do during each stage of the process starting today. So if you're starting out and you're defining your product vision, can't stress it enough, get out there and talk to users. If you're curious of where should I find users with disabilities, I don't know anyone, there's lots of organizations nationally and internationally that you can reach out to and they'll often put you in contact with their members. And in fact, today in the design and accessibility sandbox across the way, there are members from the National Federation of the Blind that are willing and, and wanting to give you feedback or just answer your questions. If you're in the design stage, you probably started working on your interaction workflow model and you're thinking about it, have it drafted. Before you get too far, take a step back and think, no, how would a user that's using just a keyboard go through this interaction model? How would they get their task done? This is a great place to start and you'll be, be very happy you did this earlier than later. If you're in the development stage, 
use standard components. They've been stress test, and they're fam familiar to users, which is great. You don't want users to have to relearn their app or each, for each screen. And finally, if you're nearing that finish line and it's after development, just as Andrea mentioned, we really recommend ensuring that you have accessible onboarding and help content. And if it makes sense for your app to have accessibility-focused tutorials and onboarding material. Macing, making inclusive products is critical. We all have the power and responsibility to remove barriers and empower all users to be productive and connected. Thank you so much for your time. If you're interested in learning more, you can attend the Accessibility and Design Sandbox right next door. Thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Brand I mean what it does? Of course. Now it has all the actions available on the watch. So let's see it. Do I need an umbrella tonight? So it gives me the weather information. What's added is I can continue this conversation using suggestion chips. Or I can talk it to uh, ask more questions, but such as uh, what about tomorrow? These are called suggestion chips that are relevant to the context and gives me more information. And these are first party actions. And I'm going to show you other third party actions because Google knows about the weather, but not everything. Google cannot turn on the light on this one because this is not Google product. Uh, would you tell it to let there be light? Say. All right, I'll do that. Let there be light. There we go. Whoa! That's amazing. Yeah. Is any any really other cool. yeah, any other third party devices it can talk to? We actually have our robot vacuum uh, right behind me, so let me try to uh, start cleaning this floor. Start cleaning. Whoa, look at it go. Go little robot vacuum, go. Conveniently somebody has gone. Get those chips. Get them, get them, get them. That is awesome. And is there an action that will make my kids put their dishes away after dinner? You can build your own. That's the whole point. All right. You can have your own actions. All right, that'll be available next year. <laughs> wow, that was fun. All right, so I have one last question for you. Uh, what time is it? Not, I'm just kidding. Uh, my last question is, if I'm a developer and I want to find out more about uh, building something cool on Wear OS, where would I go? Uh, so now, developers can build actions on Google for the Assistant and just keep the watch in mind and make sure you test on watches. And of course, everyone should come check us out at wearos.google.com to learn about the platform and everything it has to offer. All right, so there you go, actions on Google and wearos.google.com. And hey, did you like this video? Want to see something just like it or kind of close to it? Head on over to g.co slash io slash guide for more videos like this. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Florina Montanescu and I'm here with Chet Haas, the Android Toolkit Lead. Hi, Chet. Hello, Florina. Tell me, Chet, what's new in Android P? Oh, are there new things? Let me think. Uh, yes, in fact, there are. Um, so there's a few new things. Um, one of the important ones uh, that we heard about in the keynote, too, was about dynamic app bundles. But I think there's another video on that, so I'm going to lead people to do their own research on that. Um, something else that was big was slices and actions. So both of these are ways of propagating intents that your application can take care of um, deeply in other applications. So you can propagate this information in a way that maybe the assistant or search can take advantage of that and perform that action uh, via like a button. Right, so it can say, "Oh, I can, I can handle this." You put it in an actions.xml file, and then search or some application assistant, whatever, can uh, propagate a button into the UI so the user can click on that to perform that deep action. Slices is kind of like that. It allows you to perform these actions, but with a, a much richer UI. Basically, it's a way for an application to propagate rich UI to perform all kinds of things in another process. Um, you can think of it as related to remote views, but way better. Uh, so that's 
that sorry, that's that's exposed in limited ways right now, but we'll probably be building on that in, in more interesting ways. And there's APIs for developers to take advantage of that. How about the battery? Is there anything else finally for battery? How about that battery? Well, we are all power users, unfortunately, which means we need to keep working on things that we can do at a, at a platform level to preserve battery for users to get longer battery life. A couple of the things that are interesting that are going on in this release uh, includes app standby buckets. Um, so we determine the level of activity that a user has with an application, and based on that activity level, we expose capabilities of the platform to that application or not. It may not be appropriate for an application that the user hasn't actually run for a while to be taking up CPU and battery doing this thing in the background that probably the user didn't want them to be doing. Uh, so that's one thing. Another is uh, background restrictions. So if we notice that applications have bad behavior characteristics, things like holding wake locks for a very long period, which means that the system can't go to sleep, or waking up frequently, or using services when they're not on power that they shouldn't be as frequently as they are, then they'll be propagated into a list that the user can see through settings and then disable background capabilities for that app to make sure that the user has control of how much battery is being used. Okay, cool, so we covered slices, battery, anything else exciting in Phoenix? Uh, well, there's exciting and there's necessary. Um, one of the necessary things that's there is that we're preventing applications from calling private APIs. Uh, it is possible now to call APIs which are not in the public platform, but through Reflection or JNI, you can get to these methods anyway. And we allow that because we didn't have a way to really stop that. You can sort of query this and go for it. Well, now in the ART runtime, we can detect that you are calling these methods from an application when they shouldn't be, and we can prevent that. So in the preview release, which we encourage everybody to pick up and play with, we have these methods in a light gray or dark gray list, uh, which means that you're going to get either a warning in the log or a toast popping up on the screen. So if your application is calling these and shouldn't be, you're going to get a warning about it. But when that release comes out, it'll be on a blacklist and we'll simply stop it from being called. So the call to action would be go run with the preview release for key and make sure that your application is safe from these. Um, and if it's not, then either fix your application or if it is some facility that you absolutely need, then maybe it's something that we can work on and we can put it on a whitelist instead, but you need to tell us that information, which is why we have the preview, so give us that feedback. Okay, great. There's this Android no, 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 no. there, there no? no? That, that's a totally different object. I think we need to talk oh. about text. Yeah, so what about text, text? Text happened in, in my larger toolkit team, so I understand that. Okay. Uh, in fact, you understand that. I want to ask you about text. So what happened in text? So in text, we released a few new APIs. Um, now you can pre-measure text. So this means that you can move all of that measuring work that takes quite a lot of time um, from rendering a character to a background thread. And, and why is that helpful? Well, because then the text is displayed faster. So faster rendering means less frames skipped. Sure. So it, it's also good because like, it. If it's time for you to display the text and then you have to measure it, it's not very helpful, but a lot of times you know ahead of time when you're going to need that, so you can actually ahead of time shove it off to a background thread so that by the time you need it, then you can display the text, which is awesome. What else we got? <laughs> we added a new feature for the user, the magnifier, yep. and we also added an API for that, so we now have three methods. Uh, magnifier show update and I think this miss and this means that if you're developing your own custom views that also display text you can also show that magnifier in your custom view. Also it, it's not limited to text that's the cool thing is we are using it for text because we wanted to make it easier for people to manipulate the cursor but you can use it for whatever you want if you need a zoomed in view that API is general purpose. Okay, that's great. And I think we also added some more improvements on uh, Smart Linkify. Do you know more about that? I do. Smart Linkify is like Linkify, except it's smarter. Uh, so we already have the ability to uh, create links in a block of text for you if we detect things like phone numbers and addresses. That's been there forever. But now through machine learning models that we have on the system, which are used for things like smart text selection, we can detect more complex entities there. Uh, like you may select a word which is part of a larger phrase which we detect because of this entity detection in the model, um, you can ask Linkify to detect those as, uh, as entity links as well.
Can I now go back to this? Because it feels like it's looking over our shoulder. Ah, yes. Okay. So, so. what's with the Android with a jetpack? Um, well, that would be Android Jetpack. So Android Jetpack is a set of components as well as architectural guidance for helping developers build better Android applications. Uh, most, I would say all Android developers are familiar with a lot, of, a lot of what is in Android Jetpack already because we have taken all the goodness of support library and put it under this banner and we are going to continue to add to that specifically with the intent of making Android development better and easier. So I'll give you some examples. One of the big ones, one of my favorite things about support library is AppCompat and the way that we baked in the uh, releases for certain APIs into the package names. So now we have package names like V4 and V9 with some of the APIs. We don't even support those releases anymore. So I think all of the existing developers don't even think about it. That's just noise at the top of their at, at the top of their file, right? It's one of those imports they never look at. But I think if you're new to Android or if you're looking at the documentation, I think it's terribly confusing. So we're doing a major refactor where we turn all those package names into Android X dot whatever to be a little more sensible. Major effort. Um, it will require refactoring on our side, a lot of it, um, but also on developers' sides, but we're giving tools in Android Studio to help with that. Um, the other part of it is uh, the existing architecture components are a big piece of it, things like lifecycle support and room, view model, uh, all of that stuff is good. Also the new paging library, which went uh, 1.0 this week, uh, paging and recycler view, and we have two new things. Actually, they're, they're to our sides here at the demo table. We have navigation controller and we have work manager. Navigation controller makes it easier to create the links of the flow of your application. Um, it, it makes things like up versus back easier. And we also have a tool in Android Studio where you can visualize this and create those links. Um, so it's sort of an integration of the APIs as well as the tool uh, for making this complex application flow a lot easier to develop. And then Work Manager is about an easier way for creating and executing background tasks. Um, so before we would recommend, well, Job Scheduler is really good for scheduling things at particular times, you know, when Wi-Fi is there, when you're charging, whatever. Um, and that works really well if you're on KitKat and above. What if you're on an earlier release? Well, we also have Job Dispatcher, uh, which is in the Play Services APIs. Well, what if you're on a device that doesn't have Play Services? Well, then you're probably rolling your own solution. So applications would need to do all three of these. Work Manager is an attempt to have a simpler, more elegant, fluent API for doing all this stuff that handles all of that for you. Okay, great. So lots of new things, both in uh, Android, but also with Jetpack. Jetpack. So check out all the videos that we have uh, from, from Google I.O. And also check out the documentation on developer.android.com. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Florino. Android Jetpack is here to accelerate Android development by facilitating a modern app architecture, eliminating boilerplate code, simplifying complex tasks, and providing robust backwards compatibility. Jetpack consists of architectural guidance supported by a set of libraries and tools in four key areas of Android development, architecture, UI, behavior, and foundation. Each Jetpack component is individually adoptable, but are built to work well together. Jetpack builds on the popular architecture components we introduced last year. These components facilitate a highly testable, robust app architecture while individually addressing developer pain points, such as lifecycle management or data persistence. We've also added three new architecture components, Paging, Navigation, and Work Manager. Paging facilitates gradual on-demand data loading from a local or network data source, allowing apps to work with large data sets, including support for RecyclerView. Navigation provides a framework to build app flows that comply with Android design guidelines, with proper behavior for up and back buttons, support for deep linking, automated fragment transactions, support for the overflow menu, navigation drawer, and bottom navigation. This is combined with a powerful graphical editor included in Android Studio to allow you to visualize, design, and test app navigation graphs. Work Manager makes it easy to schedule one-off or periodic asynchronous tasks. Tasks can execute in order, in parallel, or in even more complex configurations. 
It's also easy to query for the state of tasks and to provide constraints, such as requiring unmetered network or charging. Perhaps most importantly, Work Manager takes care of compatibility issues, so you know that no matter what platform the user is on, tasks are scheduled efficiently and with system-wide health in mind. UI components like animation, transitions, layouts such as constraint layout, text, emoji, and fragments, along with the TV Leanback library, the Wear UI library, and the Auto library are now part of Jetpack. Behavior includes support for evolving Android areas such as notifications, permissions, and sharing. Jetpack adds support for slices, which allow your app to expose templatized pieces of itself to integrate with other apps, such as Google Search and Assistant. Foundation includes AppCompat, libraries for automated testing, and new Android KTX Kotlin extensions, which make Android development with Kotlin more concise, idiomatic, and modern. And we're just getting started with Android Jetpack. We have a roadmap of useful libraries and tools in development to help your Android projects take flight. To get started, check out developer.android.com slash jetpack.
Hello and good morning. Thank you for joining our session to talk about integrating your smart home devices with the Google Assistant. I'm Mark Spates, and I brought a few of my colleagues with me. I'm Michelle Turner. I'm the uh, director of the Smart Home Ecosystem. Uh, and I'm David Shire. I lead engineering for Smart Home on the Assistant. Awesome. So when we started this project a couple years ago, we had a vision. And our vision was to have the Google Assistant be the center of intelligent interactions with IoT devices. We selected the word intelligent for a very specific reason. We believe that users would demand that their assistant in their home understand the environmental context as well as the device capabilities when they start to control these devices. <clears throat> to achieve this goal, last year, we launched the ability for developers like yourself to integrate smart home devices using the Actions on Google platform. Just a quick reminder, Actions on Google is our platform for developers to create experiences around education, games, and many others through the Google Assistant. When it came to smart home, one thing that we focused on was having a seamless, easy experience for developers to connect these devices to the Assistant. We also understood that we had to allow this connectional understanding that we were gaining from the home and devices to also to be accessible to our developers. With that, we also created the home graph. This is a very simple visual representation of the home graph. The home graph is the key to these intelligent interactions that we have with users. I'll just walk through it quickly. If you look at it, it's broken down into three main parts. The first part is the structure. Understanding the structure and the, the name of the structure, the address of the structure, who's in the structure, what rooms are in this structure, what devices are in this structure. Is there anyone home? What's the presence of this structure? Then the next thing that we look at are rooms. Rooms are extremely important signals when you think about interacting with an assistant when it comes to contextual relevance. A command in the living room versus the kitchen can mean very different things. So when you look at the room level, we're saying, what is the name of this room and what devices are in this room? The third and probably one of the most important components are devices. When we look at the metadata that we want to get from devices, it's things like names, type, trait, attributes, and state. If you combine these three elements, you start to see how we're building our understanding and our contextual relevance to help users get to the exact control that they want. So we launched this last year, how we've how, how we been doing. Uh, we have over 400 partners who have used the Smart Home API on Access on Google. We hope that number goes up and some of you guys leave and start to also create some of these integrations for us. The other cool part is we control over 5,000 smart home products on the market today. So if you walk into any of your favorite electronic stores or any of your favorite sites and look at these smart home de devices, there's a good chance that the Google Assistant actually can control it. But we're seeing an evolution. When we first started this, I remember talking to David, and we were all excited that we can say, turn the light on, turn the light off. And we, were, we were like, oh, man, we did it. We just changed the world. Like, it's our Edison moment. But what we realized very quickly that on and off wasn't enough. We, we wanted to be able to have the user speak to the assistant in the way that they speak to their partner, their spouse, or their children, or their family. And this evolution is a very simple thing from saying, turn the temperature to 72 degrees versus make it cooler, make it warmer. And how do we achieve that? The first step that we took was we decided to make sure that every single device we actually support it directly so that we had a deep understanding of how that device works and what are the actual traits that we need to create so we can match those to the grammars that the user will actually want. So 2016, we had a very uh, small start. We have four devices. But you can see in 2017, we brought so many devices to the market that we support directly and we understand with deep knowledge from cameras, doorbells, washers and dryers, sensors, air purifiers, refrigerators, there's tons. But we're not done. There's a bunch more in 2018 that we're bringing, all the way down to tubs and toilets, right? There will be a day where you talk to your tub, believe it or not. And there's a trait for that. And David will tell you about it. But let me just walk you through really quickly, how are we using all this data? 
How are we using AI? How are we using machine learning to actually create a better user experience? So this is a very simple graph. But if you think about this light, to the user, to a five-year-old, they point at it and they say, mommy, daddy, that's a light. What we want to understand about that light is a little bit different. We want to know what's the name of that light? What traits does it have? Does it support on off? Does it support color, brightness, state? And where is its location? Because that allows us to take the right action when a user says, make the lights in the living room, dim the lights in the living room a little bit, or make the lights in the living room brighter. Because what we're doing is we're going back to that home graph and we're saying, what's the name of that light? Where is it located? What's its current state? What's its current brightness? Oh, its current brightness is X. We'll raise it by Y. This is how we are starting to really take this data that we're having about the home and devices and its contextual awareness and make it a better user experience. But it just doesn't stop with lights. Lights is easy. Think about all the other devices in your home. So you'll be able to say, hey, Google, raise the temperature a little bit. Hey, Google, is the front door locked? Hey, Google, do the laundry. Hey, Google, dry my clothes. Or hey, Google, start vacuuming. Those last three remind me a lot of like me being my mom's assistant, right? It's like, hey, hey clean the house. Uh, but these are the type of things that we believe you will start to see from the Google Assistant because we've built this really cool back end with contextual understanding about the location and environment and deep understanding of the devices. To give you a little bit more about how as a developer you can take advantage of this, David will walk you through actions on Google. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as Mark just noted, we've spent the last year uh, really expanding this platform. We launched it a year ago at I.O. Uh, we had, at the time, maybe a dozen, 20 partners. And now we're, as Mark said, you know, 400 partners, um, 5,000 um, partner, uh, 5, uh, devices, device products. We've also got tens of thousands of developers playing with this. And a little later, I'm going to talk about um, how we actually do that. But first, I'm just going to walk through a little bit about how this works. Um, we do a cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration. So for most of our partners in the IoT space, they've already got a cloud. They've got app control. They've got devices that are wired to their cloud. And so it's very, very easy to take that cloud integration and plug it into our lightweight API. Uh, most of our partners here, we say, integrate within six weeks. That's end-to-end -end from start of project to launching the partners. Uh, it includes testing, it includes evaluation, it includes you know, whatever we need to do to make sure everything's good to go. We have partners that actually do the work uh, in under a day, uh, because in many cases, it's just that easy. Um, and as Mark said, I'll go into a little more detail. You know, we use these concepts called types and traits. Uh, the re reason we do this, we don't say, this is the platonic washing machine. All washing machines aspire to this ideal device. Instead, we say there's a type of machine, a type of device called washing machine. That, for that it's a washing machine type tells us a little bit about it. It lets us learn that um, we can call it a washing machine. We can make it look like a washing machine. Um, you know, it's like a washing machine is like a duck in that regard. But that doesn't tell us what that washing machine does, because each washing machine has its own state, its own, um, its own uh, settings. You know, one of them has a, has a you know, permanent press mode, and one of them doesn't. One of them has steam, one of them doesn't, and so forth. All of that is where we go to traits. And we use traits as the building blocks of the smart home. And this lets, us, lets partners innovate in their own way, in new, in new ways, which is what we did at our demo. If you go to our sandbox, they have a mailbox over there. We have a somewhat dumber mailbox here on stage. I'm going to show you how we build this later. But that, this mailbox in the sandbox, no one of our partners has built a smart mailbox before. But the, uh, we did this for the demo um, because all the traits were there. Camera, uh, light, uh, on off for the light, the toggle for the flag, object detection for mail completely innovate a new device based on the existing functionality we have. And because we all put this in the home graph, and the home graph understands context, understands state, understands change, and as you can well imagine, a lot of the Google secret sauce and machine learning and intelligence starts to operate on the things we learn from the home graph, we start to be able to take all these devices and actually truly make the smart home smart. Um, all of this today, uh, you can integrate with one API. It's very simple. I'll show it to you later. Um, you integrate with the cloud. You integrate a couple of commands. You, you let us query devices. You let us execute devices. You tell us the devices are there. You can call us back at any time to do notifications, to push a state changes, to change the devices. So um, that's all you do. One little rest, RESTful e API. 
Um, we have uh, reference implementations we'll show you and lots of documentation, a full team of, of um, de developer relations and, and support engineers to help you. And you don't need to do grammar. You don't need to do internationalization. You don't need to do UI. Everything else like that is provided for you. And as you can imagine, with all of the other devices we're going to be rolling out, that you know, the same we do it all for you happens on you know, smart displays and so forth as well. So this is sort of the status quo we're in today. I'm going to turn it back to Michelle to talk about the fun stuff coming next. Great. Thanks, David. So as Mark mentioned and David mentioned, we've spent the last couple of years building this platform out. And now we're in a state where we're able to add a lot of new features to really build on the intelligence and help you guys create better and more integrated and interactive experiences. At the end of the day, what we all want to do is create solutions or to problems that people have in their homes, things that they're going to use every day. And so the fundamental features that we're adding over the course of this year are going to help you do that. There are four main features that we're adding for the rest of this year. Um, something called request sync, report state, new object detection trait that David's going to show you, and some new things for entertainment devices. So let's start with request sync. Request sync is really very simple. Um, right now, if uh, I go to the store and I go buy another you know, half dozen uh, smart lights to go put in my home, I have to add those devices. And they don't necessarily, the fact that I've added those devices don't necessarily get synced up um, onto the partner app very quickly. And so what we're doing with request sync is um, you push the state to the Google Cloud to let us know, actually it goes into Home Graph, to let us know that these new devices have been on board. So I go out to the store, I get my new devices, I screw them in, we bring them, I pair them up, get them going, and they automatically just work. Today, if I did that, I would have to unlink and relink. And that's a real hassle for most users. And so we've taken that uncomfortable step out for users, made it easier for you, and made it a lot easier for your customers. I think one of the most painful points of smart home for a lot of new users is just getting started, even with things like lights. So making that onboarding process simpler and easier is really important. And that's part of what Request Sync does. We've also added a new API for report state. Report state is really important. Um, and, it's, and I'll tell you why it's even more important than ever. I, I spent a lot of time talking to a number of you in the uh, sandbox the last couple days about why we need report state. So imagine a, a situation where you go up and you change your thermostat on the wall. Go up, I shift it from 65 to 72. What we normally do on the back end is we pull you to figure out when that device has been updated. But you guys all saw the new displays and the new inter user interfaces for the phone in the keynote. Well, now we have new user interfaces on these smart displays and on phones that will show the devices. And with report state, when you push report state to us and into the home graph, we can get that state information instantly. So there's no cognitive dissonance between, I just went over and changed my thermostat and my smart display is still holding an old state of um, uh, temperature information. So report state is uh, very important. It's one of the things we're starting to require our developers to give us so that we make sure that that user experience for our consumers is spot on. The other reason you want to use report state is so that we're not polling you all the time, um, which can get annoying and puts a lot of load on your server, especially if you have very active devices. In the future, report state is going to allow us to unlock a lot of intelligence. The state information that we can get, we can work with you together to start creating more intelligent experiences, like understanding that in the kids' room, the light is turned out every night at 7.30. So maybe we should just do that for you. So report state's really important now to make sure we have great experiences for our consumers. And it's going to be really important in the future as we start building more and more intelligence. So the next feature I want to talk to you about is object detection. And this is one of my favorites. This is actually a trait. We uh, originally built this trait uh, actually a few months ago. If you're familiar with the Nest Hello Video doorbell, you may know this feature. And uh, it will actually let you know someone's at the door. And we did that integration using the new object detection trait. Let's take a look. Let's see if I can, here we go.
someone's at the front door. Okay. So if you haven't seen that before, a simple push of the button and it notifies out on the, um, on the Google Home Mini through the Assistant. What's really cool about this trait is that it actually changes the model. And this is one of the things I really want to stress with you. What we're trying to do at Google is give you guys the ability to create more interesting integrations. So with the object detection trait, normally the assistant controls the device. You say, OK, Google, turn on the lights, right? With this, you take an action on a device, and it tells the assistant to give a notification. Oops, I just fired the assistant off, sorry. Um, so Dave is going to come out right now and show you a little bit more of, of what you can do with object detection. Cool, thanks. So um, I'm going to do a demo here of how notifications work. Uh, object detection is actually a specific case of a general facility we're adding to the, to the smart home where partners can send notifications on objects. Uh, and notifications become another aspect of objects and devices that you push into the home graph, just like traits and attributes and states and commands and so forth are aspects of, um, aspects of devices. Uh, in this case, uh, notifications attached to traits. So just like in, you know, in Java where you have an object and the object might receive messages, might, might declare the errors it throws, when you declare a trait, you, can also, you also are saying, hey, this you know, for example, uh, this uh, washing machine supports a run cycle. Therefore, it can now send slash receive, depending on, on your perspective, notifications of cycle errors. You know, the washing machine has failed during the rinse cycle. Um, we've built this ob uh, object detection as our first case of this. And um, uh, like, like uh, the, the video showed, we built it, first use cases, doorbells. But we built these things as general cases, the example in the lab uh, in the sandbox is uh, for mail detection. And here we're going to build something a little more interesting. But we're going to show you, you know, how I'm going to go back, recapitulate a little bit, register a smart home project, show how linking works, show how you can deploy a cloud service here or elsewhere, how the notifications are sent through, um, through in this case, Node.js and Firebase from the device itself. And finally, show you some code, show you some debugging tools. Um, this is basically the flow of this demo. So this is a smart mailbox. It's really a pretty dumb mailbox, but it has a very smart Raspberry Pi down there uh, that has some sensors wired into the box. Um, and uh, again, not a shipping product, but an easy demo that is a maker, you can build something like this. The mailbox uh, has a cloud service that we have on Firebase. Uh, it sends a notification of it's in, in whatever protocol. It's a, you know, in this case, it's a, a get request for the payload that this sends to our, our cloud service. Cloud service is where the smarts are. Um, cloud service is also part of our API. It calls the assistant with a one platform API call, sends the notification. The notification then uh, goes into the home or goes directly to the Google Home I have up here, and we'll see that demo. And of course, the fa all of this is driven by the fact that initially, and I'll show you the code for this. Initially, the mailbox and other devices were synced from the uh, partner service to the assistant for my demo user, and therefore, in the home graph, we know that this device supports. Um, actually, te technically, it supports everything uh, that the one in the sandbox does, the, the flag, the lights, the um, camera, and so forth. There's actually no camera in here, unfortunately. But all the traits are there. So I am going to hop on, whoops, I'm going to hop on over to the, um, to the uh, laptop screen here, uh, which of course locked on me. Uh, and um, great. So, uh, some, of you, some of you saw this last year. We have rebuilt this quite a bit. Last year, we were doing a demo that was largely at the command line. Uh, you, don't, you need no command line functionality for this now. Uh, those of us like me that miss the command line are a little sad. But for the vast majority of people, we are now entirely using the actions on Google Console. So no more G actions, writing action packages. This is much more native for us. So I'm just going to walk through a very simple example. And I'm, I'm, we're short on time, so I'm going to do this very quickly of how you build an, a, a, um, a smart home project today. So I'm going to add a project. Uh, now, if you're doing this, you pick a project name. Recommendation, you know, pro tip from what we've dealt with partners, pick a name that makes sense. We're no longer auto-picking names for you, uh, so you don't get something like purple chaos giraffes. Uh, you know, pick a name, because you're going to be using this with us later if you deploy this, uh, deploy this to production. So that said, let's call this purple chaos giraffes. <laughs> and, um, 
uh, let that create spin, 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 very slow because I'm on stage and it knows I'm on stage, so it's going to slow down. Um, this is creating a project in the Actions on Google console with my Google account up here. Um, and uh, wow, it really is slow. Uh, and uh, now I have all these things. This is the full Actions on Google panoply. So I could build a shopping app, or I could build a chat app, or I could build you know, a quote, quote of the day app. Uh, all of those are using conversational actions. But for smart home, we are really recommending and very strongly recommending that you're using these APIs, because this is what gives you home graph and notifications and full understanding. And so today, the setup is, in fact, very quick. Uh, to, get, to get up and running, this is going to take only a couple minutes. So I'm going to name this something random. And I will then. And forgive me, my network is especially slow today. Account linking. Uh, many of you have done this already. OAuth is the mechanism for account linking to existing service clouds. Uh, this is pretty standard OAuth. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary here. I'm going to make some keyboard mash keys. Do not use these keys at home. Uh, And of course, I don't. That is protected by RFC. Did you know there's an actual RFC protecting example.com in perpetuity? No one ever knows that, but it is real. Uh, and testing is awesome. And at this point, we are pretty much set up. We're going to go ahead and create an action. I am going to give it, I need exactly one thing. I need the endpoint for the action. And again, this is a demo. I'm not going to set this one up. I'm going to switch to the one I have set up. Uh, and at this point, I have now deployed this. And this will show up on my phone. Actually, I have not. I have now deployed this. And it will show up on my phone. Um, and uh, it will complain, because I don't have the URL set up for OAuth. But this is now set up on my phone and will be available in a second to show that. But instead, I'm going to switch back over here to my stage demo project. This is the one we're actually using. Uh, and um, here I've got the action set up. It's pointed at a Firebase app. Um, and the Firebase app here is, I'm going to show you the Firebase app. Um, you can deploy, I mean, we get this, asked this question a lot. Do I need to use Google Cloud? Do I need to use Android Things? Do I need to use Weave? Do I need to use you know, Thread? Uh, you know, Google has, as Google always does, a number of technologies that you can use to be a completely full stack Google developer in everything you do. And if you want to do that, that is awesome. But it is completely and totally not required. If you have an existing cloud, you can keep it. Uh, you can make the, integrate this with any uh, infrastructure that you want. You just need internet, uh, you know, you know, decent security, OAuth, and implement the, our lightweight JSON API. Um, in this case, we've done this demo using Firebase. It's a Node.js app. It's using the Firebase databases you can see to actually do all of the triggering. You can see our, um, our trigger types here, or our, um, our traits here right now for object detection. Uh, and so on and so forth. That is, um, the, that is how we implement in Firebase database the actual representation of the commands that we, that we run this through. And so I'm now going to show you, I'm now going to show you a little code. Um, we have this implemented as a Node.js application. Mm -hmm. This application is a slight variant of the one that's in the code lab. So if you go over to the code labs uh, by the front of I.O., there is a smart home code lab that's building a washing machine. It is very much this code. Uh, there is, uh, this is also on GitHub. Um, so you can, you can play with this yourself and use this if you want as a reference implementation. This is not a full, you would not want to use this as it is for your IoT product in market, because it doesn't have a persistent database. It doesn't have a lot of the user handling that you'll want for, um, for your, obviously, your own product. But it does a full reference implementation, including a lot of these traits here. Um, and so just to show you a little bit, what we're going to demo here is um, primarily object detection, like, um, like Michelle said. But instead of doing mail, uh, because these things are extensible, I'm going to show you how you might build a product that detects, like in my, in my, uh, in my um, neighborhood, we have some other needs for this sort of thing. And I'll show you how that works. But first, let me show you um, how you declare this. So we have a sync handler. The sync handler is um, 
basically just, this is on Node.js, it's simply building the payload. That's actually remarkably uninteresting. Uh, the device list here in the reference is building devices. So this is a fixed list. You run this, and because there's no database, it defines a number of objects for you um, uh, that you can use for tests. So here's, for example, a washing machine. As I was saying, this washing machine implements um, you know, on, off, and start, stop, and modes and toggles. So it's going to have modes for permanent press, hot, cold. It's going to have toggles probably for um, quiet mode or bleach mode or whatever. Um, and it has a sensor built in. Uh, and then we've built down here somewhere a mailbox. Hmm. A mailbox. Of course, that's the next one. And here you can see these are all the traits that we have used, uh, including the outgoing mail toggle here is, um, is a little, uh, is, is a toggle. We just have a special code for it because you have to do attributes for toggle. Um, this, this is all the things that the light in the box and the sensor and the flag and the detection and the camera stream uh, support. And to see all of these in action, go to the sandbox where the camera is working and the flag is working and so forth. And with that, uh, let me show you the notification. The notification in this case, again, Node.js, very simple. It's taking a pass through from the payload, from a HTTP endpoint that the box calls our implementation in uh, Firebase. And it simply then has, ignore the hack line, it simply sends this notification back through, um, where is it? The report state, report state and notifications use the same call. Uh, this uses a Java web token to call us at any time. It's how you do sync, it's how you do state reporting, and it's how you do notifications. And so this is running. It's running in Firebase. I am going to show you, if you can switch to my phone for just a second. Oh, fast. I'm going to show you. I've already set this up, so I've already connected to this agent. Um, you can see I've got all the virtual devices that this one advertises, which are the devices in the sandbox. But I've got the mailbox here. I can't, there are no, actually no commands on the mailbox right now. But I want to show you object detection. Um, object detection in this case, like I said, we implemented, instead of doing mail, we, we implemented animal detection. Uh, because object detection can detect anything, doorbell face recognition, whatever. Um, this was supposed to be originally a live uh, demo, a uh, live animal demo, but our lawyers said no, that was a liability, and I was being grossly irresponsible. So I'm afraid <laughs> this is no longer a live animal demo. But could I get the mic turned on on the Google Home? Thanks. So not a live animal demo. I apologize. <laughs> but if all works well, <laughs> There's a raccoon in the mailbox. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, kind of a lame. <laughs> Kind of a lame demo. We were reusing the uh, the detection logic for mail, and it's a little harder on on fuzzy animals because it's not fuzzy logic. So it's a little little tricky there. But you can see, just like with the Nest uh, facial recognition, which to be fair is many 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 more thousands of engineering hours of time than that raccoon demo. But you can see, you as an IoT partner can do what you do best. You build a cool device, and we'll handle all the grammar, the understanding, the notifications which go to, go to now you have access to the ecosystem in the house. You don't have to send messages to the phone. You can do notifications around the house of interesting things. And we'll see over the, um, over the coming, uh, coming weeks and months, we'll be adding notifications of a lot of different types to existing traits for security events, safety events, other notifications, you can imagine, you know, when, when the oven uh, timer is going off, you're in the other room, you want to know the roast is done. Those sorts of notifications are available, and you can now be two-way into the smart home ecosystem. Uh, and these are things that will be rolling out uh, significantly over the coming months. Um, like I said, this reference example, by and large, minus the raccoon, is in, is in Git and in the, in the sandbox. You can do this with... Um, all of our ecosystems, you can run it on, it's, this is on Firebase, run it on your own cloud, 
run it on, I, I know some other companies out there have clouds, I, I forget their names, but you can run it wherever, wherever you like uh, on your existing infrastructure. Um, you can run anything you want on your client. Uh, we do have Android things, and you should absolutely, in, in this space, you should go and see the Android things uh, sandbox. There's some very cool stuff. We have some cool projects where you can easily integrate Android things with the smart home ecosystem. We'll be doing a lot more of that. Uh, someone just showed me this uh, walkthrough. This is actually the last year. But uh, this walkthrough you can find by searching for home automation and, and Android things. Um, somebody did a very easy walkthrough demo of Android things running uh, directly with the API. And you can do that walkthrough. Um, we, also have, um, we also have several open source projects natively integrated today. So um, over here, we have Home Assistant somewhere. Uh, where are they? Home Assistant right there in the middle, has.io. And we have OpenHab, um, which are both right there in the middle, which are both open source platforms that are already integrated. So if you want to play with smart home devices and don't want to in implement this awesome API, you can use those for your projects as well. Um, and the um, last thing I wanted to show in a developer tool, because this is something that we've been asked for extensively in the last few years, or last few months, last six months, is we have done a lot more work to integrate developer tools into the Google ecosystem for smart home. So this here is the stack driver. Oh, can you switch back to the laptop? Thank you. So this here, if it's hard to read, I apologize, is the, um, is the stack driver for this account. So here's the iOS stage demo. I've logged into stack driver, and all of the errors that we see on our side, uh, and I had to generate some yesterday to get this, but um, all or last week, all of these errors are um, things that you would not see because they're outside of your ecosystem. If we call you, we call, make a call to the mailbox, and you help hit your server, and the mailbox fails, you know. But if, if an open off is failing, if sync data is wrong, if the notification that you send can't be delivered after you've given it to us, all of those things are errors that we don't have real-time reporting. So they're now going into Stackdriver. You can integrate this with your service. You can use this with debugging. You can pub sub from Stackdriver. If you have another logging service, you can subscribe to your Stackdriver alerts, directly integrate them with your logging. Uh, and all of that is, is now available and highly recommended. makes the development process much easier. Um, that's really end to end on the demo. Um, like I said, please visit our um, visit the uh, Android or the Android, the Smart Home Sandbox. Uh, we have uh, lots of more demos like this there. Um, talk to us. We have um, we have our um, development team ready to support uh, developers. We have we have uh, folks answering questions online. We have other events like this. Uh, and you know, throw us your questions. Uh, we have a dedicated team of folks just building new traits, building new device support every day. We have a lot of stuff that is available, but not yet on the public website. So if you see something that you want that's not there, talk to us. It's probably something we've already built. And if not, we'll probably build it for you. So talk to us. And um, uh, with that, I will turn it back to Michelle for one more thing. One more thing. Thanks, Dave. That was awesome. Does the raccoon have a name? <laughs> Sorry? Does the raccoon have a name? Uh, the raccoon's name is Craig. Craig? Yes. Okay. We spent significant time on this yesterday. <laughs> Excellent. We'll get the backstory later. So we do have one more thing. So um, we are uh, announcing here that we are also opening up new APIs for control of um, entertainment devices. And if you've been to the sandbox, you've probably seen the demo that we have in the booth of the dish hopper box that's currently working in there. That's our first implementation that'll be launching in a few weeks. We'll take a quick look at it for those of you who haven't been okay, there yet. Google. Switch to HGTV on the hopper. <laughs> so there we go, it switched to HGTV. Okay, Google. Switch to ESPN on the hopper. There we go. By the way, that's Mark's and my cool little setup in our office of the uh, the mini smart home. So these new media or, or entertainment device APIs are meant for devices that aren't Android TV and are not cast enabled. 
and there's millions of them out there, like the one in my living room that's a smart TV that has no voice interface, there's no mic, there's no speaker. And what we want to be able to do is light up the assistant to make home control easier for those types of devices. So what we've done is we've announced a set of traits, and this is the list of traits we have specific to entertainment devices. So we have transport control, gives you the ability to, to move the media, um, you know, rewind, fast forward, et cetera. Uh, change the volume up and down, get the state of the media, do recording, understand what channel you're on. You sort of mark switching to the channels. Uh, we played a lot of ESPN yesterday. And um, in some cases, we are also doing media initiation, and this is by early access partner only. So if you happen to be um, at a company that's doing entertainment devices, please come talk to us. We'll be in the sandbox and happy to talk to you more about this. One other thing that I wanted to mention in addition to our APIs, um, and just touch on lightly, this was slightly covered in the keynote, but we now have a number of surfaces in which your smart devices will be shown. So not only through voice control on a variety of speakers, but now on the phone, You'll have the new Assistant app that will show the status of your smart device on the phone and also on all of the new intelligent displays. So multiple surfaces for your um, smart device to be displayed on and interacted with. So Mark mentioned this earlier, that we're up to 400 partners and over 5,000 devices. This is, these are some, uh, just some of the partners that uh, we've launched since CES, which was in January. So we're growing very fast. We've added new partners like LG, Dish, Hisense, Vivint, Xiaomi, Panasonic. Um, a, a huge variety of partners have been coming on with really interesting integrations. So if you're thinking about getting started in smart home, please come talk to us. As David mentioned, we are in the sandbox. Um, we're in the Google Assistant sandbox, which is tent A. We also have a code lab going where you can go try this out for yourself, do some of the uh, coding that David just did, get your basic project up and going. If you are already a developer with us in smart home and want to understand more about report state, we've got a code lab on that as well. And we will be hanging out in the sandbox after this, so please come and talk to us. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those. My next project with Melina Matsuko, who is a director um, for Insecure, we're doing, I'm, I'm just working on the pilot for Why the Last Man, which is a graphic novel. Yes, I've read the entire series. Okay. <laughs> so good. <laughs> So I'm going to be designing the um, pilot. We're working on that currently. I can't really say much more than that, but it's super <laughs> exciting. The script is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and our approach to it is going to be, I think, something really cool. So I'm really super excited about that. Worked with Beyonce again. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the future is um, wide open. And if Denis Villeneuve is uh, listening, I'd love to do Dune. <laughs> Yes. I throw that out every opportunity I can get, Denise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and all the work that you do. Thank you so much. It's super exciting. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I think I'm going to learn something today, too. So, you know, it's all about soaking in all this greatness. So, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. I can't imagine how anybody passes a problem that they know that they can fix and doesn't try to fix it. That's not some complicated thing. It's just stop talking about it and start doing it. I feel an absolute obligation to serve. I did two tours in Iraq as a helicopter pilot. I loved being part of the cavalry. But then I got injured and that caused me to lose my ability to fly. One day you're a soldier, and then overnight they rip off that tag and slap a veteran on your chest. I didn't know where to start looking for the next thing. What I do is math and engineering, 
So I had to find a way to apply those things in a meaningful way. The service doesn't end when you get out of the military, it just changes. And I started reading about the research that they were doing at the Human Engineering Research Lab. And I thought, man, I gotta go be a part of that. Carl's mission is to help people with disabilities increase independence and quality of life. I prepare the software to support the research that we do. One of the big things that I've done is help us transition to using Android tools. They make things really accessible. Anybody can sit down and start using these technologies and perform the tasks that we hope that it'll be useful for. That's the right thing to do, is to make things not just able to be used, but to be used with the same sort of joy or ease as I do. A big part of why open technology is so attractive to engineers like myself is there's such an active community of people designing and innovating. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> All three of my children have a disability. The fact that my son has autism is just one little part of him. But almost his entire existence is defined by that autism. There was part of me that hoped someday I'd be able to help my son be able to live independently and give him a future. What's that? That's part of why I became an engineer, is part of why I got into this field. There's gonna be a time where someone like my son will have gotten a better opportunity, a better swing at this thing. I'm not gonna sit around and wait for somebody else to fix the problem. There's not a minute to be wasted thinking about anything but the good things that we can do.
interested in AI. <laughs> Woo! Me too. <laughs> Me three. Okay. And so then uh, the other, um, so now we have Greg Corrado and uh, actually there's one amazing coincidence. Both Fei Fei and Greg were undergraduate physics majors at Princeton together at the same time and didn't really know each other that well in the 18 person class. We were, we were like, studying too hard. No, it was, it was kind of surprising to, you know, go to undergrad together and then none, neither of us in computer science and then rejoin later, only once we were here. <laughs> All Google. paths lead yeah. to AI and neural networks and so forth. But anyhow, so Greg is a principal scientist in the Google Brain Group. He co-founded it. And more recently, he's been doing a lot of amazing work in health with neural networks and machine learning. He, he has a PhD in neuroscience from Stanford. And so he came into AI in a very interesting way. And maybe he'll talk about the similarities between the brain and what's going on in AI. Would you like to add anything else? Or? No, yeah. sounds good. OK. So I thought, since both of them have been involved in the AI field for a while, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it's recently become a really big deal, but it'd be nice to get a little perspective on the history, you know, uh, in yours in vision and yours in neuroscience about um, AI and, and, and how it was so natural to, for it to evolve to where it is now and what you're doing. Start sure. with Fei Fei. I guess I'll start. So, first of all, AI is a very nascent field in the history of science of human civilization. This is a field of only 60 years of age. And it started with a very, very simple but fundamental quest is can machines think? And we all know thinkers and thought leaders like Alan Turing challenged humanity with that question can machines think? So about 60 years ago, a group of very uh, pioneering scientists, computer scientists like Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, started really this field. In fact, John McCarthy, who founded Stanford's AI lab, coined the very word artificial intelligence. So where do we begin to build machines that think? Humanity is best at looking inward and ourselves and try to draw inspiration from who we are. So we started thinking about building machines that resemble human thinking. And when you think about human intelligence, you start thinking about different aspects, the ability to reason, the ability to see, the ability to hear, to speak, to move around, make decisions, manipulate. So AI started from that very core a foundational dream 60 years ago started to proliferate as a field of multiple subfield, which includes robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition. And then a very important development happened around the 80s and 90s, which is a sister field called machine learning started to blossom. And that's a field combining statistical learning, statistics, statistics with computer science. And combining the quest of machine intelligence, which is what AI was born out of, with the tools and, and uh, capabilities of machine learning, AI as a field went through an extremely fruitful, productive, blossoming uh, period of time. In fact, Fast forward to the second decade of 21st century, the latest machine learning booming that we are observing is called deep learning, which has a deep root in neuroscience, which I'll let you talk about. And uh, so combining deep learning as a powerful statistical machine learning tool with the quest of making machines more intelligent, whether it's to see or is it to um, hear or to speak, we're seeing this blossom. And last, I just want to say three critical factors converged around the, the, the uh, last 
decade, which is the 2000s and the beginning of 2010s, which are the three computing factors. One is the advance of hardware that enabled more powerful, capable computing. Second is the emergence of big data, powerful data that can drive the statistical learning algorithms. And I was lucky to be involved myself in some of the effort. And then the third one is the advances of machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So this convergence of three major factors brought us the AI boom that we're seeing today. And Google has been investing in all three areas, um, honestly, earlier than the curve. Most of the um, effort started even in early 2000s. And as a company, we're doing a lot of AI work from research to products. Yeah. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the divergence and exploration in various academic fields, and then the reconvergence as we see ideas that are aligned. So it wasn't, as Faye says, Faye says it wasn't so long ago that fields like cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even things that we don't talk about much more like cybernetics, were really all aligned in a single discipline. And then they've moved apart from each other and explored these ideas independently for a couple of decades. And then with the renaissance in artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're starting to see some reconvergence. So some of these ideas that were popular only in a small community for a couple of decades are now coming back into the mainstream of what artificial intelligence is, what statistical pattern recognition is, and has really been delightful to see. But it's not just one idea. It's actually multiple ideas that you see that were maintained for a long time in fields like cognitive science that are coming back into the fold. So another example beyond deep learning is actually reinforcement learning. So for the longest time, if you looked at a university catalog of courses and you were looking for any mention of reinforcement learning whatsoever, you were going to find it in a, in a psychology department or a cognitive science department. But today, as we all know, we look at reinforcement learning as a new opportunity, as a, something that we actually look at for the future of AI that might be something that's important to get machines to really learn in completely dynamic environments, in, uh, in environments where they have to explore entirely new stimuli. So I've been really excited to see how this convergence has happened back in the direction from those ideas into mainstream computer science. And I think that there's some hope for exchange back in the other direction. So neuroscientists and cognitive scientists today are starting to ask whether we can take the kind of computer vision models uh, that, that Fei Fei helped pioneer and use those as hypotheses for how it is that neural systems actually compute, how our own biological brains see. Um, and I think that that's a really, it's really exciting to see this kind of exchange between uh, disciplines that have been uh, separated for a little while. You know, one little piece of history I think that's also interesting is what you did, Feifei, with ImageNet, which is a nice way of expl explaining, you know, um, building these neural networks where you labeled all these images and then people could refine their algorithms by... Go ahead and explain that just real quickly. Okay, sure. So, um, about 10 years ago, that the whole community of computer vision, which is a subfield of AI, was working on a holy grail quest, uh, problem of object recognition, which is you open your eye, you can see the world full of objects like flowers, chairs, people, you know, um, and that's a building block of visual intelligence and intelligence in general. And to crack that problem, we were building as a field different machine learning models we're making small progress, but we're hitting a lot of walls. And uh, when my student and I started working in this problem and started thinking deeply about what is missing in the way we're approaching this problem, 
we recognize this important interplay between data and statistical machine learning models. They really reinforce each other in very deep mathematical ways that we're not going to talk about the details here. And that realization was also inspired by human vision. If you look at how children learn, it's a lot of learning through big data experiences and exploration. So combining that, we decided to put together a pretty um, epic effort of we wanted to label all the images we can get on the internet. And of course, we Google searched a lot. And we downloaded billions of images and used crowdsourcing technology to label all the images, organize them into a data set of 15 million images uh, in, um, organized in um, 22,000 categories of objects and put that to, uh, together and that's the ImageNet project. And we democratized it to the research world and released it open source. And then we, starting 2010, we um, held an international challenge for the whole AI community called ImageNet Challenge. And one of the teams from Toronto, which is now at Google, um, won the ImageNet challenge yeah, yeah. with the uh, deep learning convolutional neural network model. Mm -hmm. And that was year 2012. And a lot yeah. of people think the combination of ImageNet and the, the deep learning model in 2012 was the onset of what we Greg gave is people doing. a way to compare how they were doing. Exactly. And it was really yeah. good. So yeah. And so Greg, you've been doing a lot of uh, brain-inspired research, very interesting research, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of very impactful research in the health area. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the ImageNet example actually sort of sets a playbook for how we can try to approach a problem. Um, the kind of machine learning uh, and AI that is most practical and most useful today is ones where machines learn through imitation. It's an imitation game where if you have examples of a task being performed correctly, the machine can learn to imitate this. And this is called supervised learning. And so what happened in the image recognition case is that by, by Feifei building an object recognition data set, we could all focus on that problem in a really concrete tractable way in order to compare different methods. And it turned out that uh, methods like deep learning and artificial neural networks were able to do something really interesting in that space that previous machine learning and artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence methods had not, which was that they were able to go directly from the data to the predictions and break the problem up into many smaller steps without having be being told exactly how to do that. So that's what we were doing before, is that we were trying to engineer features or cues, things that we could see in the stimuli that then we would do a little bit of statistical learning on to figure out how to combine these signals. But with artificial neural networks and deep learning, we're actually learning to do those things all together. And this applies not only to computer vision, but it applies to most things that you could imagine a machine imitating. And so the kinds of things that we've done, like with, um, with Google Smart Reply and now Smart Compose, we're taking that same approach, that if you have a lot of text data, which it turns out the internet is full of, what you can actually do is you can look at uh, the sequence of words so far in a conversation or in, in, um, a, uh, in an email exchange and try to guess what comes next. You know, and, you know, I'm going to interrupt here a little bit and um, get a little more provocative here. All right. So you're talking about, uh, you know, neural inspired machine learning and so forth. And uh, so, you know, this artificial intelligence is kind of bringing into question, what are we humans? And then there's this thing all there called artificial general AGI, artificial general intelligence. What do you think's going on here? Are we getting to AGI? I really don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, 
there's a variety of opinions in the community, but my feeling is that, okay, we've finally gotten artificial neural networks to be able to recognize photos of cats, right? That's really great. <laughs> um, uh, we, we also, it's now can... Uh, Fei Fei, know, was that AGI when we recognized a cat? No, <laughs> that's not enough yeah. to define AGI. So the kind of thing that's working well right now is this sort of pattern recognition, this immediate response where we're able to recognize something kind of reflexively. And we now have, I believe, machines can do pattern recognition every bit as well as humans can. And that's why they can recognize objects in photos, that's why they can do speech recognition, and that's why they can win at a game like Go. But that is only one small sliver, a tiny sliver, of what goes into something like intelligence. Uh, notions of memory and planning and strategy and contingencies, even emotional intelligence, these are things that are, have just, we haven't even scratched the surface. And so to me, I feel like it's really a leap too far to imagine that having finally cracked pa pattern recognition after some, some decades of trying, that we are therefore on the verge of cracking all of these other problems that go into what constitutes general intelligence. Although so, we have gone way faster than either of you ever expected us to go, I believe. Um, yes and no. H humanity has a tendency to, un um, to, to overestimate uh, short-term progress and underestimate long-term progress. So eventually we will be achieving things that we cannot dream of. But Diane and Greg, I want to just give a simple example to define AGI. <laughs> so the definition of AGI, again, is an introspective definition of what humans and human intelligence can do. I have a two-year-old daughter who doesn't like napping. And uh, I, I thought I'm smart enough to scheme to put her in a very complicated sleeping bag that doesn't get herself out of the crib. <laughs> and uh, just a couple of months ago, I was on the monitor watching this kid, two-year-old, where for the first time, she, I was training her for napping for, by herself. She was very angry. So she looked around, figured out a weak spot on the crib where she might be able to climb out, figured out how to unzip her complicated sleeping bag that I thought I schemed to do really, you know, uh, to, to, to prevent that, and figured out a way to climb out of a crib that's way taller than who she is, and managed to escape safely and, um, and <laughs> without breaking well, okay, her legs. Okay, okay. How about AGI equivalent to my cat? or equivalent to, my, to a mouse? If you're shifting the definition, sure. <laughs> I see, okay. <laughs> but even cat, I think there are things that the cat is capable yeah. of doing that... So, uh... so I do think that if you, if you look at an organism like a cat from a behavioral level, like the, what, how cats behave and how they respond to their environments, I think that you could imagine a world where you have something like a, a toy that you know, is for entertainment purposes that approximates a cat in a bunch of ways in that the sorts of behaviors that the human observe, you're like, oh, it walks around, it doesn't bump into things, it meows at me every once in a while. I do believe that we can build a system like that. But what you can't do is you can't take that robot and then you know, uh, dump it in the forest and have it figure out what it needs to do in order to, to, to survive and make okay. things work. Okay. But, but it's a goal. It's a healthy goal. To, it's a to, healthy goal. And, and along the way, like, you both, at least we all three agree that AI's capacity to help us solve all our big problems is going to outweigh any kind of negative, and we're pretty excited about that, I guess. Like, like in cloud, you're kind of doing some cool things with AutoML and so forth. Yeah, so um, we talk a lot, Diane, about the belief of building benevolent technology for human use, right? Our technology reflects our values. So I personally, and I know Greg's whole team is working on um, bringing AI to, the, to people and to the fields that really need it to make a positive, uh, positive difference. So at Cloud, we're very lucky to be working with customers and partners from all kinds of vertical industries, from 
healthcare where we collaborate, to agriculture, to sustainability, to um, entertainment, to, to retail, to commerce, to finance, where our customers bring some of the toughest problems and their pain points, and we can work with them hand in hand to solve some of that. So for example, uh, recently we rolled out AutoML, and that is the recognition of the pain of entering machine learning. It's still a highly technical field. The bar is still high. Not, not enough people are trained experts in the world of machine learning, but yet, our industry already has so, many, so much need to you know, tag pictures, understand imageries, just as an example in vision. So how do we answer that call of need? So we worked hard and thought about uh, this, this suite of pro uh, product called AutoML, where the customer, we lower the entry barrier by relieving them from coding machine learning custom models themselves. All they have to do is to give us the kind of, provide the kind of data and concept they need. Here's an example of a ramen company in Tokyo yeah. that has many shops of uh, ramens and they want to build an app that recognizes the ramens from different uh, ramen stores. And they give us the pictures of ramens and the concepts of their store one, store two, store three. And what we do is to use a technique, a machine learning technique that Google and many others have developed called learning to learn, and then um, build a customized model for the customer that recognize ramens for their different stores. And then the customer can take that model to do what they want. You know, I can write a little C++, maybe some JavaScript. Could I do AutoML? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We're working with teams that uh, they don't have, not even C++ experience. And the, we have a drag and drop interface, and, uh, and, and, and you can use AutoML that way. Because uh, I really believe that you know, there are so many problems that can be solved using this technique that it's, it's critical that that we share as much as possible about how these things work. I don't believe that these technologies should live in walled gardens, but instead we should develop tools that can be used by everyone in the community, and that's part of why we have a very aggressive open source stance to uh, our software packages, particularly uh, in, in AI. Um, and that includes things like TensorFlow that are available completely freely, and it includes the kinds of services that are available on cloud to do the kind of compute storage and model tuning and serving that you need to use these things in practice. And I think it's amazing that we, the same tools that my applied machine learning team uses to, to tackle problems that we're interested in, those same tools are accessible to all of you as well to try to solve the same problems in the same way. And um, I've been really excited with how how much it's, uh, how great the uptake is and how we're seeing expanding to other languages. Uh, mentioning JavaScript, quick plug for tensorflow.js is actually really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yep. Oh, and you should probably run it on a TPU. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, it does give a nice boost. But um, so, so you're doing, you're building, I mean, with machine learning, we're bringing it to market in so many ways because we do, we have the, the tools to build your own models, the TensorFlow, we have the auto ML that brings it to any programmer. And then what's going on with all the APIs and, and how is that going to affect every industry and what do you see going on there? So cloud uh, already um, has a suite of APIs for a lot of our industry partners and customers from translate to speech to vision to... Um, which are based on models that we built. Yes, yeah. we can build, uh, for example, Box is a major partner with uh, Google Cloud where uh, they recognize a tremendous need for organizing uh, customers' uh, imagery data to help customers. So they actually use Google's Vision API to yeah. do that. And, yeah. 
And that's a, a, a model easily delivered to our customers through, through our uh, service. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, Greg, how do you think that's going to uh, play out in the health industry? I know you've been yeah. thinking about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so healthcare is one of the problems that a bunch of people are working on at Google and a lot of people are working on outside as well because I think there's a huge opportunity to use these technologies to expand the availability and the accuracy of healthcare. And part of that is because there's, um, there's a, doctors today are basically trying to weather an information hurricane in order to provide care. And so there's, there are, I think there are thousands of individual opportunities to make doctors work more fluid, to build tools to solve problems that they want solved, and to do things that help um, that help patients and improve patient care. I mean, but I think I, you're, you, you were telling me that so many doctors are so unhappy because they have so much drudgery to do. Is this, is this a big breakthrough? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that there's, a, there's been a great, um, you know, when you go to a doctor, you're, you're looking for medical attention, right? And right now, a huge amount of their attention is not actually focused on the practice of medicine but is focused on a whole bunch of other work that they have to do that, that doesn't require the kind of uh, insights and care and connection the real practice of medicine does. And so I believe that machine learning and, and AI is gonna come into healthcare uh, through assistive technologies that help, help the doctors do, do what they wanna do better. By understanding what they do in a system no substitute for the human. No, the I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No substitute. Speaking of human, uh, Feifei, do you want to talk a little bit about why um, you've been so, you think this humanistic AI approach is so critical? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the history of AI, we've entered phase two. The first 60 years is AI as more or less a niche technical field where we're still laying down scientific foundations. But starting this point on, AI is one of the biggest drivers of societal changes to come. So how do we think about AI in its next phase? What is the frame of mind that should be driving us has been on top of my mind. And I think deeply about the need for human-centered AI, which in my opinion uh, includes three elements to complete the human-centered AI uh, thinking. The first element is really advancing AI to the next stage. And here we bring our collective uh, background from neuroscience, cognitive science. You know, whether we're getting to AGI tomorrow or, or, or in 50 years, there's a need for AI to be a lot more uh, flexible, nuanced, uh, learn faster in more um, unsupervised, semi-supervised, uh, 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 one-shot learning ways uh, to be able to understand emotion, to be able to communicate with humans. So that is the more human-centered way of advancing AI science. The second part is the human-centered AI technology and application is that I love what you're saying that there's no substitute for humans. This technology, like all technology, is to enhance humans, to augment humans, not to replace humans. We'll replace certain tasks. We'll replace humans out of danger or our tasks that we cannot perform. But the bottom line is we can use AI to help our doctors, to help our disaster relief workers, to help decision makers. So there is a lot of technology in robotics, in design, in natural language processing that is centered around human-centered AI technology and application. The third element of human-centered AI is really to combine the thinking of AI as a technology as well as the societal impact. We are so nascent in seeing the impact of this technology, but already, like Diane said, that we are seeing the impact in different ways, ways that we might not even predict so I think it's really important and it's a responsibility of everyone from academia to industry to government to bring social scientists, philosophers, law scholars, policy makers, ethicists and, and historians at the table 
and to study more deeply about AI's social and humanistic impact. And that is the uh, three elements of human-centered AI. That's, that's pretty wonderful. And, and I think we at Google here, Alphabet, are working as hard as we can to do humanistic AI. Um, you know, you mentioned a, um, you know, what we need to be careful about out there with AI and regulatory. What are some of the barriers to, you know, I think every company in the world has a use for AI in many, many ways. I mean, it's just exploding in all the verticals. But there are some impediments to adoption. For example, in financial, the financial industry, they need to have something called explainable AI. And could you just talk about some of the different barriers you see to being able to take advantage of AI? We should start yeah. with healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that there are, there are a bunch of really important things to consider. So one of the things is, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, have, have machine learning systems that are designed to fit the needs uh, of the folks that are using them and applying them. And that can often include not just giving me the answer, but telling me something about how that was um, derived. So some kind of explainability. So in the healthcare space, for example, um, we've been working on a bunch of things in medical imaging, and it's not acceptable to just tell the doctor that, oh, you know, something looks fishy in this x-ray or this pathology slide or this retinal scan. You have to tell them, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? But more importantly, you actually have to show them where in the image you think the evidence for that conclusion lies so that they can then look at it and decide whether they concur or they disagree or, oh, well, there's a speck of dust there and that's what the machine is picking up on. And the good news is that these things actually are possible. And uh, there, I think there's kind of been this unfortunate uh, mythology that AI and deep learning in particular is a, is a black box. And it really isn't. Um, uh, we didn't study how it worked because for a long time it really didn't work that well. But now that it's working well, there are a lot of tools and techniques that go into examining how these systems work. And I think explainability is a big part of it um, in, in terms of making these things uh, available for a bunch of applications. So I, in addition to explainability, I would add bias. Um, I think bias is a issue we need to address in AI. And I see bias from where I said two major kind of bias we need to address. One is the pipeline of AI development, starting from the bias of the data to the outcome of the bias. And we have here a lot, uh, heard a lot about if the machine learning algorithm is fed with data that does not represent the, 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 the problem domain in a fair way, we will introduce bias. Uh, whether it's uh, missing a group of people's data or, or uh, biasing it to a skewed distribution, um, this, these are things that would have deep consequences, whether you're in the healthcare domain or finance or legal decision making. So I think that is a huge issue. Uh, very nicely that Google is already addressing that. We have a whole team at Google working on bias yeah, in, in this. That's true. And, and another bias I think it's important is the people who are developing AI, it's the human yeah. bias. And, and the lack of diversity is also another it's bias. It's so important and that kind of brings me to maybe our, some of our, we're getting close to the end, but um, if you, uh, you know, where is AI going? I mean, how prevalent is it going to be? I mean, we look at our universities and these machine learning classes have 800 people, 900 people. You know, there is such a demand. Every computer science graduate wants to know it. Where is it going? I mean, will every high school graduating senior be able to customize AI to their own purposes? Um, and, and how will, you know, how, wh what does it look like five, ten years from now? So from a technology point of view, I think that there, because of the tremendous investment in resource, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector now, every, many countries are waking up to uh, investing AI. 
we are gonna see a huge continue um, development of AI technology. I'm mostly excited uh, either at cloud or seeing what Greg's team is doing, AI being delivered to the industries that really matter to people's lives and uh, work uh, quality and productivity. But Diane, I think you're also asking is, um, how are we educating more people in AI, right? So Both making it easier to use and educating them, and, and what's it gonna look like? I, you know, what do you predict? So, that's a really tough question, because at the core of today's AI is still calculus, and that's not gonna change. <laughs> so so I, th I think that from the kind of, from the, the tech, uh, the tech industry perspective or from the computer science education perspective, I think that we're going to see AI and ML become as essential as networking is, right? Like, no one really thinks about, oh, well, I'm going to write some software and it's going to be standalone on a box and it's not going to have a TCPI connection, right? Like, we all know that you're going to have a TCPI connection at the end of the day somewhere. And everyone understands the basics of the networking stack. And, and that's not just at the engineering of the level of engineers, that's at the level of designers, of, of, of executives, of, um, uh, of product developers and leaders. And the th same thing I think is gonna happen with machine learning and AI, which is that designers are gonna start to understand how can I make a, a completely revolutionary kind of product that folds in machine learning the same way that we fold in networking and internet technologies into almost everything we build. So I think we're gonna see tremendous uptake and it becoming kind of a pervasive background part of the technologies. But I think that in that process, the ways that we use AI are going to evolve. So I think right now, you're seeing a lot of things where AI and machine learning adds some, some spice, some extra little coolness on a feature. And I think that what you're going to see um, over the next decade is you're going to see more of a core integration into what it means for the product to actually work. And I think that one of the great opportunities there is actually going to be the development of artificial emotional intelligence that allows products to actually have much more natural and much more fluid human interaction. We're beginning to see that in the assistant now with speech recognition, speech synthesis, understanding dialogues and exchanges. But I think that this is still in its, in its infancy. We're gonna to get to a point where uh, the products that we build, they interact with humans in the way that the humans find most useful, just out of the box. And I spend a lot of time with high schoolers, because I really believe in the future. You know, we always talk about AI changing the world, and I always say the question is, who is changing AI? And to me, bringing more human mission thinking into technology development and thought leadership is really important. Not only important for the future of our technology and the value we instill in our technology, but also in bringing the diverse group of students and future leaders into the development of AI. So, you know, at Stanford at Google, we all work um, a lot on this issue, and personally, I'm very involved with AI for All, which is a nonprofit that educates uh, high schoolers around the country from diverse background, whether they're uh, girls or, or students of underrepresented uh, minority groups, and we bring them onto AI, in, onto campus, university campus, and uh, work with them on um, AI thinking and yeah. AI studies. And, and at Google, we're just completely committed to bringing all our best technologies to everybody in the world. And we're doing that through the cloud and we're bringing these tools, we're bringing these APIs and the training and the partnering and the processors. And we're pretty excited to see what all you guys are gonna do with it. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. everybody.
Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Great to see so many people here. My name is Oscar. I am from the developer relations team. And today, we're going to speak about camera. In this session, we'll cover three major topics. First, we're going to talk about the inner workings of camera on Android. Second, Snap is here with us today. Uh, they're going to showcase how they use the camera APIs in production to millions of users. And we're going to close with our vision of the future of how camera API should evolve and the ecosystem that goes with it. Let's jump right in. Developing camera app is a series of compromises. Some are outside of your control as a developer, but understanding those will help you make better decisions where you have control within your app. Let's cover how camera works at the physical level. Um, as any decent photographer knows, it is a pipeline of steps at the physical level. Visible light goes through a lens that directs it to filters, which passes the light on to millions of light sensors. Then that converts the light finally into a 2D matrix of pixels. When you think light sensors, uh, the first name that may come to mind is the almighty CCD. Nowadays, we have many other kinds, such as CMOS or APS, that are actually more commonly used in today's modern cameras, DSLRs, phones, etc. From now on, we refer to this component as the camera module. The output of the camera module is a raw picture, a raw frame. It is not entirely unprocessed, but it has not been processed outside of the camera module at this stage. You can think of the camera module as a black box that dispatches these frames. In early hardware, we had three physical pins for different kinds of pictures. Nowadays, in modern designs, we have a single pin, thanks to tricks like multiplexing and higher clock speeds and so forth. But the conceptual model remains as having separate processing pipelines for each kind of image. We have Generally speaking, three broad use cases, video preview, photo, and video recording. We'll cover those separately. The camera module, as I said, is a black box. And it contains an increasing amount of smarts within, some of which are in a closed feedback loop. Um, you, as a developer, we as developers, will have very little visibility into what goes on in there. To give you an example, when you set, say, autofocus or auto white balance, the camera module may be looking for faces to see how to better optimize those settings. And you don't really have any control over that. From a framework standpoint, all developers do is send one configuration in, and you get one frame out. This is very, very important. You send one configuration in, one frame out. For each frame, there is a configuration that goes with it. To help you with this, we have a set of template configurations. We'll cover those later as well. So let's zoom into the preview pipeline, the one on top. As I said, each pipeline shown is a broad use case. When it comes to preview, you can think of it as the viewfinder. So whenever somebody is holding their phone up and you want to see what the camera sees, this is the use case we're talking about. we need to compromise on some things. Obviously, the camera can only do so many things at once. When it comes to preview, we choose to compromise on quality. We care much more about latency. We want the user to be able to see what the camera sees much faster. This just generally results in better latency because we are able to compromise, as I said, on quality. Some of those compromises come in the form of, for example, reduced motion stabilization or less noise reduction. Moving on to the photo pipeline, you may want to enable our users to capture high quality images. Keep in mind that, as I said before, one frame configuration in, one configuration in, one frame out. Different frame configuration may mean that you will not be able to reuse the same raw frame. One example of this is if you are requesting uh, different um, exposure. So at the physical level, the sensor needs to expose the frame for a different period of time. That means that you're going to have a different frame entirely. If you are mindful while you set up your pipelines, you may be able to avoid this compromise entirely. 
So when it comes to photos, we care much more about the quality, a lot less about the speed. So we choose to compromise on that latency in lieu of having much better quality image. Lastly, we have the video pipeline. This is for the video record use case. Um, as the diagram indicates, you're seeing that all these pipelines should be parallel in theory. In practice, we have a number of bottlenecks, and frames can only come so fast out of the camera. Some of those bottlenecks include the exposure time. Some of them can be the processing power, memory, bandwidth limits, and a number of other things. In the video pipeline, it's almost a blend of the previous two. We care about the speed. We definitely need to have frames coming consistently out of the camera at a certain rate. But at the same time, we also care about quality. So it is very important that in this kind of use case, we find the right balance. Generally speaking, we can only test for so many things. Android runs in many, many devices, not just the high end, but you're talking about low end too. Unfortunately, we can only test, as I say, so many things. In general, the best tested scenario is when you have preview pipeline running plus one other. Um, you're going to have a really hard time if you want to have all three pipelines running simultaneously. So we discussed trade-offs made by the hardware. We discussed trade-offs made by the framework. And now we're going to dive into the application layer, what we as developers can do. Let's walk through the end-to-end -end process of a frame. From the creation of a request until the pictures are finally in memory ready for us to use. Follow the steps, ECS, ABC, and then profit will just fall on your lap. If you don't believe me, ask Snapchat. The first decision you have to make as a developer is selecting the right device out of the ones available on your list. Device here means the camera module, um, not devices in phone device. Each phone may have multiple cameras. Um, generally speaking, you probably have at least one front, one back. This is especially important now that we have multi-camera APIs. You may have multiple devices that are, say, back-facing that you can choose from. So you will have to go through those devices and see which one fits your use case best. Once you've successfully opened the camera, you're going to get the camera device instance. And that is necessary to proceed forward in the open camera callback. You can use the very same callback to monitor the status of your camera device. Um, it is entirely possible that the camera may be yanked from you if a higher priority process requests the device. This could happen very easily in a multi-window environment, for example. Second step, you need to allocate your camera output targets. This is where each of the pipelines that we shot earlier are going to copy your frames in the form of buffers. The memory may already be allocated. Then all you need to do is to get a reference to the underlying surface and pass it as a target. Otherwise, you may have to wait for a callback. Once the targets are ready, the capture session, which is specific to the device that you open, can be created. It is worth noting that, as I said, the camera capture session is specific to that device that you opened earlier. Once the session is ready, you can build a capture request. One of the predefined templates must be used. If you don't want to take any of the hints from the system, you can use template manual for full control. Otherwise, the framework is going to provide a set of templates that closely align to the camera conceptual model we discussed earlier. So you have templates for preview, you have templates for photo, and you have templates for record. The capture request contains specific frame configuration and the output target. Recall, frame configuration in, output frame out. A couple of things to note is the output target must be one of the previously defined ones. You cannot just use another surface here and attach it. It needs to be one of the surfaces that you declare first as part of the session. This is the configuration part of it, of the configuration in frame out. To recap, we've chosen the camera device that we want. We created the camera session for that particular device. And now we built a capture request that will be used in that session we can finally ask for a camera frame. We send the capture request to the session, and then we work for the callback. We can do this in two ways. 
we can send a request once, and we can make it repeating a request. This makes more sense in use cases like, for example, preview or video record. You don't want to be sending a configuration for every single frame. This is a very easy way to just send one configuration and ask the framework to continuously repeat it. Now, which callback do you want to listen to? That really depends on what you want to get out of it. If you want to get the frame metadata, you should look inside of the um, capture callback. If you want to get the frame for CPU processing, one of the options is using image reader. Generally speaking, you can just get whatever pixel information out of the output surface that you have set up. Image reader is just one of the easiest ways to do it. If you want to get that into the GPU, a great idea is using render script allocations. Obviously, that's not the only choice. You can also use OpenGL texture buffers. And this is the cycle, step one through five, that we need to go through for every single frame. Recall, one configuration in, one frame out, and a bunch of trade-offs in the process. All right, thanks, Oscar. My name is Mustafa Abrar. I'm a software engineer at Snap, and so I work on the Snapchat app. Today, what I want to do is take what Oscar said about the lower layers of the camera and sort of work up to your app and design choices that you make and how they influence how you interact with the camera. We'll talk about some trade-offs in terms of architecture, how to architect the camera framework inside of your app, and we'll talk about specific challenges in sort of a more narrow use case. So nowadays, um, if you've ever used Snapchat, I'm hoping everyone has, the first thing that happens is it opens directly into the camera. And the reason for this is that people use the camera now as a means of communication. They're taking a picture, they're adding metadata, creativity, and then sending it. And so it's really like the cursor where what do you have to say? And trying to get that out as quickly as possible is sort of the thing we really value. There are a few key camera design decisions that we've made, and these will influence how we interact with the camera. The first of those is full screen. In video, in pictures, front camera, rear camera, all of them are full screen. Now, you typically don't see this on a lot of cameras. If you take your camera out, usually picture mode is 4 by 3 aspect ratio, because a lot of times you share it online, the camera actually optimized for specific aspect ratios. And so since your display is usually you know, 16 by 9 or some other uh, aspect ratio that might not you know, be available for picture mode, we have to make a trade-off. Usually, the devices will have something that matches, but it might be really high resolution. And to just encode that and create a JPEG out of it just takes a long time. So we have to make trade-offs in terms of the resolution we select for taking pictures and video and so forth. The second part is single mode. There's no video mode. You, can, you don't swipe and enter a video mode. And when you have this design choice, it leads to a set of optimizations you can't take advantage. For example, videos, there's a recording hint on Android that you can tell the system the user is about to record. There's a lot of optimizations that you can set. But if you don't know the user's intent, if they long press, it's a video, if they just take a picture, uh, single tap, you don't know ahead, so you can't decide up front what configurations are always going to work. We try to do static configurations that are good in a lot of scenarios, and then we have certain that are dynamic, and we update those depending on what the user's intent is. The other part is, for a long time, Snapchat has offered lenses, a lot of interactive features inside of the camera. And each of those things forces certain trade-offs. For example, if there's a lot of motion, your face is moving, and you're trying to track a user's face, optical image stabilization, there's a lot of things that might not work well with these other things that want to keep track of where the user is. Um, also, it has a lot of memory overhead. There's a lot of GPU work going on, and you need to balance all the work that you do. The last part is you can't cheat. You have to capture the picture in front of the user so they can get their message out as fast as possible. Most cameras, if you take a picture, it hides the latency and it saves it in the background. So you don't see it. It just kind of falls away. And you don't really see how long it actually takes. But for us, because the real meat is when users edit the canvas of their image or their video, we have to do it right there and then. It's, and so you have to make certain trade-offs to have la low latency to get there. Now, to support these and some other features, you need to kind of think about how the overall architecture of your app is going to be if you truly want it to be universal. 
So there's a few best practices that I'll share. Um, some of them really just sort of help and broaden the width of devices that you're able to target, and also how well they perform on those devices. And you know, over time, you're going to add features, lenses, interaction. So you want a framework that's extensible so that you could plug and play different things. So the first thing you have to interact with is the API that Oscar mentioned. It's the part you interact with the camera, and there's a set of APIs. There's two versions. There's camera one. Um, and it's been around for many years. And then there's also Camera 2, a newer API. Uh, although Camera 1 is deprecated, you know, when you have hundreds of millions of users, it's, it's a big chunk that's still on Camera 1. So you need to support it regardless of what the, what the device says. Um, the second part is there's different modes for Camera 2. For OEMs to slowly adapt, they have a legacy mode, which is simply you know, we've made our API work, but under the hood, it's really camera one. And also, camera two varies by device. Some devices say, yep, camera two works great here. But in reality, deep down, it's still camera one. And so the performance you get might vary even across devices. So you really need to know each of the different products that you want to target. And so what we do is we support both. Since 2016, we've written both uh, camera one and camera two in terms of code. And then what we do is we add a layer on top that's basically what our application sees to just unify what it looks like underneath. And then if you have shared code, for example, picking resolution, it doesn't really matter which version you're using. The, the logic for the full screen that I mentioned can be shared by both. So there's some shared code, but the application deals with the top part. The next part is there's millions of devices. A lot of them have bugs. They say uh, they support a certain feature. It doesn't work. You zoom in beyond 99%, some bug comes. So we have a lot of configuration that allows us to decide on specific devices and models what behavior, what configuration to adopt. And so this remote configuration is really key. And over time, you have to groom it. You have to maintain it. It's a very key part of something that's just code. Now, let's build up this architecture. So I've talked a bit about sort of the camera interaction, the code that talks to the camera server, which is the Android system process that manages the camera. Uh, and it talks through binder IPC, which is a form of inter-process communication. But if you expose this to your applications, it's a little too raw, because you might have a video chat feature, a camera, and video note. And if they all try to talk to the camera, they could do things that sort of conflict with each other. There's life cycling, a lot of things you need to be aware of. And so what we do is we have a queue, an operation queue, that allows us to coalesce things that are redundant, allows us to manage sort of invalid states. And so we avoid a lot of conflicting things across features by having an operation queue and a thread that processes them. And the next part is, so everything on your right, the gray side, is really about the UI. You know, like the, the shutter button you see, the autofocus, the animations, all that. And then it has a state machine that says, OK, the user tapped autofocus. Let's do the animation. Let's ask the camera to autofocus. The... And then it saves your intent in memory and tries to drive the asynchronous process to get it done. And so the right-hand side and the left-hand side have sort of different responsibilities. And then over time, your surface comes in. That's the preview frames that Oscar was saying. It starts showing up on your screen. If you have interactive features enabled, like lenses, they get composited on top of it. And this is done in OpenGL. And we try to do it synchronously and not avoid copying anything large. And then ultimately, your UI is composited on top. And so as far as the user is concerned, it all looks integrated. But in reality, it's multiple layers that are coming together. Now, if you look at this architecture, what you notice is that the left and the right have sort of different things that you're concerned about. Um, and one way to think about it is client-server architecture. The right-hand side is like the client. The left-hand side is your runtime, your processing. And the concerns are different. So from a performance perspective, the left-hand side needs to worry about processing frames really fast. It needs to worry about stability, a lot of things. And the right-hand side is really about animations, um, you know, new features, a lot of the candy in terms of how the user interacts with the camera. And so one cool thing you can do is, if you ever work with client server, is sometimes the server is slow. You know, it takes hundreds of milliseconds, sometimes some issues. So what we do is we have ways of replacing components. You can use Dagger. You have other approaches where you say, OK, let's just abstract out the camera so that the UI thinks it's talking to the real thing. And we'll just mock the APIs to the Android system and maybe do a no-op 
or send black frames, whatever we want to do. And one place where we take advantage of this is performance testing. So for example, if you add uh, new UI logic and you want to see if it regresses the camera in any way, you don't care how long the camera operations take. And because they're variable, if let's say it takes 100 milliseconds to open the camera and it's variable because it's a system service, then over time, you might not be able to catch 10 millisecond regressions. And so in this example here, what I'm showing is a startup regression test with a mock camera. So the camera's been mocked out. It's starting the app repeatedly and saying, OK, let's collect the metrics and see how long it's taking to get to a stable point. And then we can actually catch regressions across several commits to see you know, what change might have caused it. Another example is instead of replacing the whole camera, you can replace part of it. You could say the frames that are coming out, let's just replace them with something else rather than the whole camera. You could keep other functionality intact. And so in this case here, we could replace the frames with a video file. And so this is very useful in situations where, let's say, you're automatically testing your face tracking. In the lab environment where you run integration tests, there's no faces. There's no people in the lab to look at the camera. And so what we do is we actually use the video files to drive that interaction. So here's a picture of me running some lenses testing where the frames have been mocked out from a video file. And so there's me. Hello, IO. Um, and you can see the paper showing it's not the camera. It's just a video. But everything else is real. It took a snap. It edits it. It does a lot of things. So you can mock out parts of the camera to allow you to add new features and just test things in isolation. And so this is kind of, in terms of an architecture, it's one way to do it. There's many ways. But this gives you the performance considerations on the left, the remote configuration to get a wide range of devices supported that have different cameras, multiple cameras, no, like front facing, rear. Um, and so the remote configurations for that, the performance considerations, and the UI and the extensibility. Now, let's jump into a specific use case. Um, Snapchat's known the majority of our media is just images. And everyone always asks, what, how do you guys take photos? How does it all work? And we break it up into several stages. The first stage is capturing, quickly capturing the content so that you can actually process it and allow the user to be creative. Once they add all their creatives, you composite all of the different layers of creativity that they've done, and you transcode it into something that is efficient to transport over the network to the recipient. And the last part is rendering. That's the part where the recipient looks at the content, and depending on the choices you make in your player, can really affect the quality of the image that they see. And all of these are complicated things, and we have teams dedicated to each one. But I'll just touch on the capturing one for today. Now, Oscar mentioned you tell the camera, hey, capture a frame, and you wait back, and your callback is called. But there's a lot of latency involved in this step. Uh, in camera one, the API is called Take Picture. And it takes 400 milliseconds on a really high-end phone from last year. Whereas if you take the preview frame that's optimized for low latency, it's an order of magnitude smaller. And you can see the P90s are quite high. And so what we do is periodically we'll optimize as much as we can our code for specific devices that we feel are you know, pretty good latency. And we enable it remotely for users on those devices. And Users are delighted. Wow, the quality went up. It looks really cool. It just happened today. People will notice it right away. But also, they notice the delay. The, and if you're trying to communicate and there's any lag or anything, you'll notice it right away. Um, and so what we do is we try to do a trade-off. We do both. We'll take picture and screenshot on certain devices. And if it takes too long, we fall back to the screenshot. So we have a lot of tricks to sort of work around this. You can see examples here where the quality, when you really zoom in, is noticeable. But it's not always a slam dunk. In this case here, take picture on the left is causing noise. And sometimes the algorithms might overcompensate, and you'll see speckling. So it's not always just turn it on. Certain front-facing cameras, we disable it, even though it can sometimes result in higher quality, especially in low light conditions. So we balance that. And so really, it's a hierarchy of trade-offs. Um, Oscar talked about the low level. You've got the design choices of what you've decided in your application, and ultimately user intent. Is the user sending a picture to someone that's disappearing and you want to favor latency versus is the user preserving something? So hopefully some of the tips we've shared will help you guys build a better camera app. Thank you.
Thanks, Mustafa. Hi, everyone. My name is Vineet Modi. I'm the Android Camera Platform PM. Oscar earlier identified a series of trade-offs required to use the camera to APIs. Mustafa further elaborated on that theme on how they apply those trade-offs in the real-world situations. I'm going to change the conversation a bit and talk about how working together, we can truly elevate both the developer and the end user experience. The camera is evolving today. It's moved on from mere photography as an immersive medium. A great example of this is what was demonstrated in the keynote by Parna, where the camera is now used to do geo-navigation. In addition, cameras are everywhere today. From IoT devices, there's a great example in the Android Things booth, to uh, your laptops, to multiple cameras on devices. And that's a trend that I want you all to take away. Mul uh, devices with more than two cameras are becoming the norm. Recall the, uh, the camera model that Oscar talked about earlier in the talk. How do you extend that model in a multi-camera situation? Let's walk through an example. Imagine a device with three back cameras. The native camera app today has access to the physical streams from each of these sensors. In addition, the native camera app has something called the logical camera. This is a virtual camera. It's made up of all the physical sensors. It is a combined fused stream. And it takes care of some of the trade-offs that Oscar and Mustafa alluded to in terms of power, performance, and latency. So in the native camera app, you actually have four cameras, one virtual, uh, three physical, in a three-camera device. But as developers, you only get access to one of them. This is often depends on the different types of devices. And in this case, you end up making trade-offs. You're using the APIs differently from the native camera app. So we're pleased to announce that starting with Android P, you'll get access to all the cameras, from the logical camera to all the physical streams. This applies to both the front and back sensors, as well as all many different form factors. Here's some example use cases. The lady on the, uh, in the picture, she, this is an image of a bokeh mode. You can use uh, this new multi-camera API for depth, optical vision, uh, getting monochrome frames directly from the sensor, and many more. But most of all, we're excited of the use cases that you guys are going to build. So let's walk through this API real quick. The first thing you would do is check the camera characteristics and check if the device supports the logical multi-camera API. Next, you would check to see which physical cameras make up this logical device. Today, we start support by, for RGB and monochrome, and we're looking to add more. Here, it gets very interesting when you have a logical camera that is abstracting one front and one back sensor. Finally, you would check to see if the frames from all of these sensors are synchronized. So I know what you're thinking. Great, new API. Which devices will support it? Is it worth your time to invest in this new API? The answer is yes. Starting with Android P, all new devices will support this new API. And we're working with many partners to ensure that upgrade devices also support this API. So let me call out a few partners. We worked very closely with Huawei to ensure that monochrome sensors are supported. They actually helped us test this API. We worked with Xiaomi to ensure that a majority of their devices support this API as well. So later this year, you'll see devices from both Huawei and Xiaomi supporting this new multi-camera API on upgraded new devices. And finally, the Android One team. We worked with manufacturers from this team to ensure that this API is, works across all tiers of Android and is not exclusive to just the high tier. I want to share that together, we really can elevate the camera experience. Working with you, our partners, our manufacturers, we're really trying to make sure that we can bring amazing experiences. And most of all, we're very excited to see what you're going to build with these new APIs and knowing what trade-offs you need to make using these APIs. 
We'd love to continue the conversation in the after session meeting space. And thank you, Oscar and Mustafa, for sharing their insights. Thank you, Snap, for giving a glimpse on how millions of users get a delightful experience. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Enjoy I.O. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session. If you've registered for the next session in...
is IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm at the Community Lounge. This is where anybody can swing by, meet up with old friends, or make new ones. I'm going to go find some certification alumni to talk to them about the program. Hey, Marga. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Doing good. How are you? Awesome. <laughs> Really great. <laughs> I'm sitting here with Henry, Ashesh, and Somia, and they're all alumni in the certification program. I'd like to ask you just a few things about the program, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Let's start with how did you get involved? Like, what made you want to get certified? Okay. So, actually, before in, in Indonesia, they have like a scholarship. So they, they give out the 500 scholarship for the people to take with the university and certifications, and I was I. I registered on that one and I, I got it and then after that I, I tried the uh, certifications and yeah. So your path was some scholarships to certification? Yes. Ashesh? Okay, so uh, if you see the reason I went for the certification, in our professional life uh, we strive for a few things. One of them is uh, to prove the word to ourselves and second is to prove our word to others. Like. So to proving birth to ourselves, we go for a benchmark, right? We try to achieve it. So for me, that certification was a benchmark, a milestone achieved. And once I've achieved that, there's only one way, that is to go for something higher, right? So this was one reason to prove myself the worth so that I can, you know, go for more higher things. So certification was a commitment to me, to myself, to go for in search of more knowledge. And second thing is to prove worth to others. So if you see, when you go for the job, uh, there are very various phases, there are interviews, there are tests and everything, but the first phase is always the qualification. What degrees do you hold, what certifications do you hold? If you don't cross that door, there's no point. I mean, you might be a very good programmer or something, but to have a certification, you are always have a key to open a door. So that was the other thing which I went certification for. So in short, to gain confidence and to be job ready. Right? Thank you. And Soumya? So I've been working on Android since 2010. What pushed me to do the certification was probably that, you know, like like Ashish said, you know, there, there's a benchmark or there's a standard with a certification. And after working for so long in Android, worked on various kinds of applications, how do you differentiate yourself from the others? Thank you. Can you each tell me one thing that has been helpful in your career because of certification? Sure. So uh, actually, in my current organization, we now have a team of about 20 mobile developers, mobile team more, more or less. And uh, what, what I noticed was uh, we had the support of the management for conducting various certifications and things like that. But uh, when we did the certification and I told my team that, see, I did this and it was cool. And it, it, you know, it gave a validation to the team also that how we are doing this. And after that, very quickly, we have almost 10 team members now who are certified already. So that was a big boost. Uh, energize her to them too, you know, from a team lead to the rest of the team saying that, oh, you should do this. And then that has worked out very positively for them. I work for Paradise Publisher saying, we're into ebook publishing. So we provide a platform to indie authors. For that, we have an app, Android app. So uh, the thing is that we had outsourced it to some other company. So when we outsource something, we have to uh, engage our resources. And not being a large company, this could be a problem. Right, so we had to talk to them about exposing our internal APIs, and then our boss had to sit with them. So this was this was this was the one thing which motivated. Like when I was uh, uh, getting into Android, uh, that th that point of time, I thought, okay, I will try to make the Android app in house for my company. But the certification was not there, so I was also a little hesitant to ask my boss that to give this job to me, because you know the app matters as such uh, financially. Once I got the certification and I told my boss, he was very happy about it and of course he was quite confident. So till now I have developed two Android apps for my company that is in-house. So we have more control over the app, especially since I am working already, I know the back end and everything. And our consumers also get a more robust and something you know more user friendly app. So this certification has helped me to gain the confidence with my boss and to move my career in Android app development. Before I took the certifications, it's like whenever I apply to a company, I always choose the Android developer job. And then they always give me the interview for iOS developer job. 
So and then I, I try the certi certifications and then after I get certified, it's it's naturally they it just knock them to their senses that okay I'm certified by Google. Uh -huh. So then they they give me more chance. They give me chance for interview for the test. Yeah. Otherwise before it, no one they just give me the test for iOS. Thank you all so much for sharing your story with me today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about certification, head on over to g.co slash dev slash certification. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Having a technical background or having technical knowledge, do you think that it can help um, make the creative process burgeon and grow, or do you think it can hinder the creative process? It can go both ways. Um, but I've definitely found myself early in my career kind of uh, noticing that, yeah, I, I've started thinking about how to actually implement uh, an, a design, and that sometimes hindered my design process because I was thinking so much of how to actually make the solution happen. That's quite a challenging thing. So how did you manage to break through so it's not stopping you but maybe enhancing the stuff that you actually do? I think one of the things that I always struggled with is that uh, from a visual standpoint, like I'm not a super talented visual designer. I've seen some amazing visual designers that I'm just like, oh my goodness, like that is really, really slick and I love that and um, that's not like my strength. And so I was a, a lot, came back more from like the coding perspective, being able to actually implement some stuff in code, which they couldn't. Um, but you know, there, there was this kind of this deciding factor of realizing Am I more of a designer or more of a, a developer? Like, you know, I'm not necessarily that great at the graphics, but there's still so many other ways of design that can kind of spread in. Uh, so really like doing some research and finding about more about UX design and realizing that is really kind of what, what I wanted to focus on yeah. um, is kind of what led me to that. So it's, it definitely was this, this kind of process of navigating through it. It's like, where do I fit? Am I a designer? Am I a developer? Where, you know, I, from the first projects that I started doing, um, you know, a lot of the time I did a lot of websites. And when people come to you, they go, hey, we need a website built. They don't necessarily say, <laughs> hey, we need a front end developer to come, <laughs> come, come do this, especially if you're working with uh, smaller businesses and clients. So you do take on the designer and developer hat um, to kind of make that happen. A lot of developers are very afraid to learn about design. It's like, because I get a question, question like, if, if I was to, to write an article, the perfect article for the developers would be how to, be, how to learn to design, or how do you, you know, which makes no sense to me, because learning to design doesn't really mean anything. It's just like, what, what part of design, you know, what discipline of right. design? Um, but there's still that question of, okay, what is the first step that someone who wants to really, as someone who's gone through this process yourself, what was your first step to say, okay, that's it, I'm becoming a designer? Right. I think, you know, following a lot of design patterns, at that time I didn't really understand that they were called design patterns, right? You kind of, you implement them um, in the sites doing a lot of web work. You yeah. kind of take on, okay, the navigation uh, menu, where does that live? And you're following a lot of the patterns that have already been created, and so you kind of learn to explore through that and then, you know, testing out the site and realizing, oh, this doesn't feel right, like something's off, let's, let's work on how to make this better. Um, but I think one of the, the great things that can really help designer or developers wanting to go into design is looking at a lot of like the material spec guidelines are actually really, really helpful because not only does it actually tell you, hey, here's some guidelines of what to follow, but it actually does a really go a good job of explaining why you're doing that certain thing. And the rationale thing. and logic. And yeah, exactly. So that actually is really helpful because then you're able to understand why was this created? Like what was the thought process behind um, adding potentially a, a bottom navigation, or why would you have a side uh, side nav? You know, it's it's really getting to kind of explaining that, so you're able to learn from learn from actually interacting with something and seeing how they're doing it, but also getting finding out why they decided to do that. Because I think so much of design is so much it's problem solving, right? Yeah. So. Um, so many people forget that when they think of design, they think of the finished product, but there's so many different stages of how you got to that finished product. Um, and so a lot of it, being able to understand how someone was thinking through that really, really helps you um, from a development perspective, get into that design field of understanding, oh, okay, how do I get from thinking of how do I develop this versus how do I even arrive to the solution? I think that's, the, that's kind of the big difference there. As developers, you, know, you have 
something that's already uh, designed for you for the most part. I mean, some people get handed things. Some people get handed an iOS mock uh, and said, hey, make this, make this into Android. So then at that time, you kind of become an Android uh, designer yeah. in that aspect. What do you think is like the biggest thing that stops developers really understanding design? One of the things that we do at uh, Google is we do design sprints. So the design sprints are really great because it brings people from all the different disciplines and specialties together um, to work into solving a, a challenge that we have. You know, so you have product managers, engineers, designers, researchers, everyone um, in, in the room together and kind of thinking and working through a problem, which is really fantastic because you get all these different ideas. Um, and one of the things that I really notice is we're, as we're bringing in designers you know, and uh, engineers and all these people together is that when we're walking through the challenge, the engineers are already thinking of the solution yeah. and already thinking about how to implement it. They go straight to that, which makes sense. That, that is their role, right? As engineers, um, usually you are given something and you have to go, oh, how do I, how do I make this happen? How do I, like, I'm thinking through problem solving, how to actually get to that solution. Whereas designers, we don't know what the solution necessarily is. So I think a lot of the blockers is automatically wanting to know the answer yeah. instead of being more aware and being okay with saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but let's, let's explore it together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the biggest hindrance that can really stop developers into getting into design is wanting to have all the answers. It's, it's okay not to have them. I mean, and what do you think developers can actually do um, to get past that? I mean, because I find, like, for me, it's always sketching and just experimenting. Right. So I suppose it's how does the, the developer maintain that kind of playful space where they're not thinking, right, uh, here's the library we're going to use to do, like, a whatever widget or a fab or whatever, but what can they actually do that allows them to to not thinking about like the end result or breaking from that cycle. Yeah, you actually bring up a great point with sketching. That's probably one of my favorite exercises when I'm working with different people to get them thinking of, uh, of solutions. So it's particularly if you're developing an app or so is, hey, let's get some sketches out there, get a Sharpie and just start sketching out through some ideas. Um, because that really, that doesn't, you can really get some ideas on paper and not be uh, married to them, you know, and not feel like really connected because you spent all this time developing the solution and realizing, oh, it doesn't really work. Um, and so if you start really low f fidelity with some sketches, that can really open up your mind in terms of thinking about different solutions. Because as you're sketching through it, you're realizing, oh, like maybe I want to use this fab button or something, or everyone loves fab, right? So <laughs> you want to incorporate it somewhere, and then you realize, hmm, maybe that's not the, the right thing to do. And I haven't spent all this energy developing or even designing this. So then I can kind of toss that and move on and create a different solution. So sketching, I think, is a great uh, resource instead of people go straight. A lot of people like to prototype in the code. Um, but I usually like to challenge people and go, hey, start sketching some ideas, and then once you've landed on something that you think you, you want to explore some more, then dive into code or dive into sketch or whatever you're, you're using. So I suppose um, for the engineer to really understand design is almost like, okay, just start sketching first um, and start thinking about the thing you're going to build and the possibilities rather than straight to the end solution.
Naomi Makovsky, and I'm on our global product partnerships team here at Google, and I focus on transactions on actions on Google. And I'm Charon. I'm a PM on assistant and actions on Google. Now, if you think about your typical day, it's probably full of transactions. You're buying coffee, you're getting your groceries, you're paying for dinner with your family and friends. And this week, we spent a lot of time talking about the shift toward assistance and how actions on Google can help users get things done. So today, we're going to dive into transactions, how users can buy physical goods, services, and now digital goods from their favorite brands, all of you, through the assistant. But before we jump into what's new, we're going to take a step back to understand the big picture. We're at an amazing point in technology where users are actually turning to their devices to get things done. And we can help them accomplish their goals across the widening landscape of these devices. They're turning to devices in their I want to know, I want to go, I want to do, see, hear, understand moments, expecting to get from point A to point B or have a dinner reservation booked for them. But it's not just their mobile device that they're turning to in these moments of need. Users are turning to the devices all around them as they have smart speakers, smart cars, smart TVs, refrigerators, ovens, vacuums. These, this technology is embedded in everyday devices, and it's more accessible than it's ever been before. And as we've discussed throughout I.O. this week, our approach at Google to this era of digital assistance is the Google Assistant. So we're seeing a few things happening. So first, interactions are more natural than they've ever been before. The experiences with our devices are far from the call center menus of the past or even the chatbots of yesterday. People are turning to their devices with queries that are more natural, and they're querying beyond the keyword. So they're asking for things like, do I need an umbrella today, as opposed to weather, 10011. Secondly, the platforms where these digital assistants live have become mainstream. And there's increased familiarity from the youngest members of our households all the way up to the oldest. You can take my parents' house, for example, where my 66-year-old father cannot fall asleep without the sounds, the ocean sounds from his Google Home. And uh, my mom's thrilled, as you can probably imagine. But lastly, and most importantly, it comes down to our users. Our users are more curious, they're more demanding, they're more impatient than they've ever been before and they turn to their devices in their moments of need. So every time they want to know something, go somewhere, do something, and so on. And as a result of their behavioral shift, so too have their expectations. Users want their experiences on Google to be a few things. They want it to be more personal. They want personalized results just for them. In fact, queries that end in for me have increased over 60% in the last two years alone. They want their experiences to be in real time. From brands, they want real-time response to current events. They want to be entertained. They want to be consoled. We see this on social channels today. As they shop, they want immediate results. They want to know what can be delivered to them in just a couple of days. But more than that, they want to know what's open now, what can be delivered now, what hotels they can even book tonight, at a discount, of course. And we've seen, in fact, that same-day travel as an entire category has increased over 100% in the last two years. But more than just the what and the when, it's really about the where. Users want their brands to be everywhere they are, in their home, on their phones, in the car, everywhere they're going. So as we've been developing the Google Assistant, we've thought a lot about the when, the where, and the how. Users are already interacting with Google. So when they wake up, they're asking Google Home what their day looks like. When they're on the go, they'll turn to Google Maps for help with driving directions and navigation. They're searching on Google. They're watching videos on YouTube. They're playing games on their Android devices. There's already fluid interaction across surfaces, devices, and properties. And it spans from information retrieval to content consumption all the way through action completion. So we've been diving into these areas, and we think about how actions on the Google Assistant can help a user throughout their day. How can we streamline their morning? How can we do help the user do more when they're on the go? And of course, how can they have a relaxing evening at home when the day is done? The ability to transact with your favorite brand is key to task completion. And this is crucial for any platform to be truly assistive. But more than that, the user has to be able to do so in an effortless way. So before we dive into the exciting updates, I know you're all excited to hear, we're going to talk a little bit about the state of transactions today. 
Last year, on a stage very similar to this, we announced that transactional capabilities were coming soon to the Assistant via our Transactions API. And just seven months ago, we launched basic transactional capabilities via our Transactions API in the United States. And now we're doing this in even more countries. We're live in the UK, France, Germany, Canada, Australia, and Japan, and we're coming to more countries over the course of 2018 and beyond. Now, when we talk about transactions on the Actions on Google platform, we're talking about the ability for a user to purchase a good, hire a service, book a reservation with their favorite brand on the Assistant. And now, no matter what type of transactional experience the developer builds, the foundational elements remain the same. The developer will always guide the user throughout the purchase process, and we have APIs and other helpers, account linking and location included, to assist along the way. So we're going to break this down a little bit further. No matter whether you're a developer building a flow that supports the purchase of coffee or the booking of a cycling class, it'll still boil down to three transaction types. First, there's a reservation or appointment booking. Now, this could be free or charge or have a cost associated at the time of that booking. The next two require payments. So the developer could support a transaction via the user's payment method that's already on file with their business. We call this bringing your own payment method. Now, this, of course, requires account linking, since you need to know who that user is in order to charge their card. But the developer could also use a payment helper from Google. So if you want to support a guest checkout flow, this is an excellent way to get that information from Google. And we'll talk about this one in a bit. Let's start with transactions. So it's a fairly simple flow. You build the reservation, you propose it to the user, the user confirms. And like any other transaction on the Assistant, you're able to send them updates throughout the life cycle of their order to make sure that that booking is always top of mind. So it's been a great week at I.O. Had maybe a few more French fries than I'm used to eating in my typical week. So I think I'm going to need to book a spin class when I get back to New York. So let's consider a quick example. I tell the Assistant, and I talk to my favorite spin class, that I'd like to book a class for Tuesday at 6 p.m. Jay's cycle spot will then confirm this booking. Sure, you want a, a booking a Tuesday at 6 p.m.? I say yes, and my booking's complete. And then in the Assistant app, I get updates until that spin class to tell me that this is still in progress because I haven't quite made it to that class yet, and I'm always reminded where I'm going, what I've purchased, and the stage of that order. Now let's talk about a case where the payment is required at that point of booking. Now remember, this can mean you're bringing your own payment method or you're using Google to help you facilitate that transaction. So first, you'll want to check that a transaction is enabled in the first place. And we can also help you with some other basic settings and information to assist along the way. In fact, we have an API where you can, you can check that transaction settings are turned on so you don't get the user throughout the flow only to find out that they can't transact. If you're shipping a good, you'll probably need the user's delivery address, so we can help with that too. When a user sets up the Assistant, they choose the information that they're entering into the Assistant, like payment information, delivery addresses, and so on. So should a user share this information, and should you need it, we can help by passing you this information, of course, with the user's consent. So if the user hasn't already entered information, like their delivery address, we can also help you by prompting the user for the entry and then resuming the conversation. So great, we know the user wants to transact, so it's time to start building that cart. Our APIs take an order object that's flexible and easy to adapt to your use case. And our client libraries contain builders to help you build quickly and validate along the way. So you simply pass us an order object that's similar to what you see here, and we'll take care of presenting it to the user in a way that's clear and consistent, so the user always knows exactly what they're buying and how much they're paying for it. Now, we know friction can lead to some drop-off in the conversion funnel. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this. And we know that it's not just about creating a seamless cart building process, but getting that user through the point of transaction as easily as possible. So let's take a look at what this means when you bring your own payment method or when you use Google Pay. If you're bringing your own payment method, you're using credentials that the user already has on file with you. And it'll look something like this. And we accept a variety of types, from credit card all the way to cash on delivery. It's really up to you. And we use the information that you pass us to let the user know exactly how they will be paying. So here you'll notice that the user is going to be paying by a card. 
and it's my gold card to be exact. This is the display friendly name that the user is, seen, or is able to see that matches the payment profile that they have previously set up with your company. Now, if you choose to use a payment helper from Google, we'll just need a bit more information from, about your processor. Users have already saved hundreds of millions of cards to their Google accounts, and we can securely pass this information to you during an assistant transaction with the user's permission. So you tell Google who you need to charge and how much you need to charge them for. Google then encrypts the raw credit card with your payment processor's key to generate an encrypted payment credential and passes you that token. You charge that credential like you would any other credit card you have tokenized on your app or your site. And this is already part of the Google Pay API. It's the same data that you provide to when you use Google Pay in your, Google, your Android app or site. One API that works everywhere. And Google Pay supports the processors listed here, and we'll have more coming soon to the platform. Now, of course, a transaction is not complete at that point of purchase. There are updates that the user will find useful and follow-on actions to help them with next steps. And with the Transactions API, you can send updates to the user throughout the lifecycle of the order. For example, you can let them know when the order is received, when it's being processed, or even when it's complete. Also, you can add follow-on actions. So this enables the user to do things like modify their purchase, place a reorder, contact you. The user can seamlessly take this quick action for that action post-transaction. As you saw, we made huge progress on enabling transactions on the assistant platform last year. During this time, we worked with a lot of you guys, got your feedback, what works, what does not work. And that has really helped us shape our roadmap. So thank you so much for that. Today, we'll share a lot more exciting updates as we launch transaction on more devices, in more countries, in more Google platforms. We'll also talk about supporting a lot more complex transactions. And then I'll end the talk with my favorite topic on supporting digital transactions on Assistant. So app developers like yourself can start monetizing uh, Assistant. Our growth on voice speakers has been huge this year. And it's only continuing to grow. Like as you saw through the keynote and through all the um, IO sessions that we've had so far, it's a big focus area for us. And we'll continue investing in it. So starting this week, we are announcing the support for users to be able to transact over voice. What that means is users can buy physical goods, physical services, make reservations on Google Home, on third-party speakers, and even the smart screens that are la launching in July. We talked a lot about our vision and mission to help users accomplish their task. We want to go beyond where we just connect a user with a service provider, but also help our users accomplish their tasks in ways that are safe, that are convenient, and that are fast. And throughout my session today, and through some of the demos I'll do, you'll see that theme resonating. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep touching base on that. Let's get back to our user journeys. You've seen this slide before. Um, and let's start with the morning routine. If you are anything like me, nothing gets done in the day before that first cup of coffee. And mostly, most days a week, that is my first transaction of the day. So we'll show you how Assistant can help solve for simple but essential tasks. So now the fun part, which is the demos. As I walk through the few demos today, I have picked up user tasks that are everyday use. You and me use that often so we can see the pain points, but also visualize the opportunities associated with each of these flows. The other thing I'll do is after each of these demos, I will pause. I'll walk you through how we build this, because there's a lot to learn from each of these demos. Hey, Google, order my usual from Starbucks. Hi, Tarun. Starbucks here. That's one tall soy latte. Anything else? No, that's all. And are you picking that up at your usual Starbucks? Yes, that sounds good. OK, that'll be $3.45. But the balance on your Starbucks card is only $1.04. Do you want to reload your card? Yeah, put $20 on it. OK, I've added $20 to your Starbucks card with Google Pay. Your total is $3.45. Are you ready to place the order? Yes. 
Okay, I put your order in and it'll be ready soon. Enjoy. Can't wait to pick up my coffee after this session. So what you saw here is something that our users will be able to do fairly soon, starting in a week or a few weeks from now. Um, there are two things I want to highlight from this demo. Um, the first thing is personalization. Like, if you saw, if you remember the experience, Starbucks knows my name, greeted me by my name. It even knew the drink, which is my usual drink. You don't have to jump through hoops or conversational turns, as we call it in our world, to figure out which coffee you want. Starbucks even recommended me a usual location based on what my current location is, where I have ordered in the past. So you don't have to like, have a conversation to understand where you want to pick up the coffee. So don't you love a barista who knows your name and knows what drink you want when you walk into the local Starbucks? Those are the kind of experiences we want to build on Assistant. Personalization is very important to drive user trust, to drive user delight, and loyalty on Assistant. The second thing I'll talk about is the payments piece. Now, if you think through the flow, in the first couple of conversations, Starbucks knows of what coffee I want. They know what location I'm picking it up for at. So for most users, that's it. Like, uh, that's all the information Starbucks needs to have a great coffee waiting for you when you actually enter the Starbucks. But I went through a not so happy path to highlight a point that when it comes to payments, when it comes to transactions, seamless transactions are important. But equally important is clear transparency to the user on what they are buying, how much they are getting charged for, and what does the transaction look like. So as we go through some of these experiences, you will see that resonating. So just to summarize, we are opening up transactions over voice this week. The, the devices we support are Google Home, the third-party speakers, and the smart screens when they launch. We are already live in US, and over the next week, we are opening up UK, Canada, Germany, France, Japan, and Australia. So you're thinking as a developer, what does it mean for me? Do I have to start from scratch? Do I have to build the whole experience again? What the new APIs look like? What the cost of doing this is? And every time when I launch a new surface, do I have to build my actions again? The short answer is no change. If you already had an action that was using transactions working on phones, it will work out of the box for the Google Home devices too, for the smart screens too when it launches. So there is no work needed on your side to light up new surfaces. We do the heavy lifting to make sure it works across all surfaces. Now, sometimes as a developer, you might want to have a different experience on voice versus when users on a screen. And that's fine too. Like you can actually build those experiences. We support it. The underlying mechanisms of transactions remains the same. So that does not have to change. So if you don't have an app, an app on Assistant yet, you have double the reason to go and build one because you get every new surface that we launch free with any of these transactions. The previous screen talked about when you bring your own transaction method. Uh, but even if you use Google Pay, there is no incremental work to kind of light up the transaction on the voice surfaces. There are two other things I'll talk about, um, which I think were in the demo. The first thing is built-in intents. We launched built-in intents this week. What this means is when a user says, order me my coffee, or get flowers for Mother's Day. By the way, it's Mother's Day this weekend, in case you dropped the ball. But when you say, um, uh, get me flowers, or, 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 or uh, order me a coffee, this is how Assistant knows um, which action can fulfill one intent. That's what we use for matching and ranking. So as a developer, it's very important for you to sign up for the right intents. The second piece I'll highlight is the conversation design. Use Dialogflow to create great conversations. Stay succinct. It is very important to have your brand reflected in the conversation. Make sure you use the brand tonality. Like when you talk to your users, Without seeing you, they should know that it is your brand that they are having a conversation with. So now when we talked about the building blocks, I talked about quite a few of them. The one which is one of the most important ones is account linking. And if a user starts on phone, for today most part, we would send the user over. If a user starts on Google Home, we will send the user over to phone, to account link. Um, and 
the drop-off percentage is very, very high. And no, we don't like that number. We have a 90% plus drop-off when we punt a user over from a Google Home device over to the phone to do account linking. So today or this week, we are starting a developer preview for account linking over voice. So what does that mean? What that means is users can sign in into an existing account using voice. They don't have to be sent over to a screen or a phone. A user can create a full new account all in itself over voice without having to go to any other surface. And if a user is already signed into an existing surface, they will automatically sign in when they come to any of the voice devices. Sounds magical, right? So I'll talk about how it works um, as well. So the flow is fairly straightforward. You ask the user for sign in. The user gives their consent. Once the consent is there, we share with you a Google token, which has a lot of details about the user. Think of it the user's Gmail address and some additional information. You look for that user in your user DB. If you find that user, you can link the account, you can create the session, you can create a token for the user and send us that token. And we will use that token for future use. If you do not find that user, you can create that user with the information that we give you and send us the token. So the 90% drop, the drop-off number that you saw earlier can come down as low as zero uh, with some of these experiences. It's, it's, a, it's a straightforward integration. I think I'll walk, walk you through some of the, what the APIs look like. On the console, there is a se separate setting that you have to sign up for. Do you want OAuth? Do you want Google sign-in? You can choose both depending on different surfaces and what experiences you want to build for. The sign-in API is straightforward, speaks for itself, ask for sign-in. Uh, so when you ask for sign-in, we prompt the user to go through the flow. Validate token, I think, is the most important piece. So when a permission is, when the user grants the permission, uh, we share all of this information about the user with you, which includes the email, which includes what the verify, is this a verified email or not? We send you the name, the given name, the last name, um, and much more, so that you can create an account on your side if you want to. Now that you're already thinking voice and the beautiful experiences voice offers, um, Let's talk through some of the more things. So here is the summary of the building blocks that I talked about on how to create a great transactional experience. Google sign in and the voice experience we talked about. Built-in intents, that's how you identify and get a lot more implicit traffic. Personalization, like needless to say, it's very important to drive user trust. Conversation designs, and then the voice transactions. And for the friends who are visiting us from all the different parts of the world, we are opening up over the next few months in Mexico, Brazil, Spain, Italy, and India too. And our pace of adding more markets will only grow, grow through the last part of the year. A lot of exciting stuff happening on Voice. And I'm sure you guys will want to see what those APIs look like. We'll share the link towards the end of the talk where you can go and see all of this in a lot more detail. Uh, but let's continue our user journey. So we talked about the morning routine. Let's talk about users on the go. You see she already has a coffee in her hand. Uh, so let's talk about some of the users on the go. While users on the go, they interact with many more Google surfaces outside of Assistant. They are on Search, they are on Google Maps, and much more. And we want to provide a consistent experience to our users when they move from one surface to another. Like why should users' experience be any painful on any Google surface, right? So we are bringing our transaction primitives across all Google surfaces. When I talk about transaction primitives, I mean identity, which is the Google sign-in piece we talked about, payments, receipts, and a lot more helpers, like delivery addresses and locations and so on. So these are now available across multiple surfaces. So let me show you guys a quick demo on how this works on search. And we'll, we'll go into a lot more details with that. So as I talked about the essential tasks when I talked about the coffee, here is another one of my essential tasks, which is getting movie tickets. So movies near me, um, Avengers, everyone knows, is actually breaking every possible record out there. Uh, they are doing fairly good. Let me try to book a movie ticket. Uh, 11 p.m. show after the event sounds good. Uh, Fandango, they offer a fast checkout. Let me try that. 
So the Fandango experience on what we have built is all on AMP. And if you know of AMP, AMP is all about how to uh, deliver content fast. And now we're bringing transactions into AMP. What that means is even the transactional experiences will get very fast. By the way, what I'm showing is all production. It is not a hacked up demo. So the speeds you will see are very much what our users see when we, when we take it live. I can zoom out. I can select two tickets. Next, the uh, general admission. Sounds good to me. Uh, next, this is where we show we share the payment information over. As a user, you don't have to give in your payment information, your email, and so on. Obviously, none of this is shared with um, Fandango till the transaction is done. I look through the order, looks good, complete purchase. And the transaction goes through. I have two tickets booked for me for today evening. <laughs> and the other thing with this is, if you see at the bottom of the screen, there is a My Orders experience where I can go, I can find, I can track, and I can manage all my orders. Uh, so if, if I want to find where this, where is the receipt for this, I want to look for the tickets, a single place where any user can go and get that information. They can even ask the assistant, what time is the movie tonight? And the assistant would answer it for them. One more thing I wanted to show here was, a lot of you guys might be Fandango VIP exclusive customers. Looks like I am not. Let me try to sign up, because I don't want to lose the points I get on buying movie tickets. I probably watch one a week, by the way. Uh, this share and sign in looks good, verifying. And, I'm a, and this is account linking. I have an account created on Fandango side. It is linked to my Google profile. So next time when I go in and try to get Fandango tickets, I don't have to go through this flow at all. It's all linked through my Google profile. So um, that's the demo that I had for Fandango. And this is not just about movie ticketing. Our users can do so much with these experiences coming from search on maps or from other things. Users get a fast, the beauty is that users get a fast checkout because of these experiences. These flows are what we call convenience optimized. Users almost never had to fill out a form. And I'll show you a much more complicated experience in a bit. And there's a single place for all our users to track all their receipts. So they don't have to think through what merchant I did I buy it from, what does the receipt look like, let me dig through my email address, and so on. And from a merchant's perspective, think of yourself. You have full control over the UI, and therefore giving you the ability to create differentiated experiences for your users. So if there's a customer coming to your website, there's a visitor, it's coming to your AMP experience, you convert that visitor to a customer, to a loyal customer. So I think that's, that's one big value prop of this experience. You get much higher conversion rates. With Google Pay, we have partners who have 2x higher conversion rates what they had earlier. With Google Sign-In, we have seen conversion rates go up by 20%. So that's a big lift for a lot of our partners and developers. And then merchants spend less time planning on the transaction primitives, which is you focus on what makes sense for your business. And what I showed with Fandango, you'll see something like that coming soon with AMC as well. So we are going big in movie ticketing vertical, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> activities. But let's now talk about a way more complex experience, DoDash, which is ordering food. When you order food, um, food ordering includes a lot of nuances. There is massive menu br browsing. Like if you go to a new restaurant, menus these days are like 10 pages long. It takes you like 20 minutes to see what all is uh, being offered. So there's a lot of menu browsing. On top of that, there's a lot of customization. You want to see. Uh, or as, as a user, you want something gluten-free, I want extra spicy, I want dressing on the side, and whatnot. So after you actually have uh, the, what you want to order figured out, then there is delivery instructions. I want delivered at this time. I want delivered in the window of three to five. Or delivery instructions, like three knocks on the door, and you can leave the food at the door, or something like that. Right? Um, and then after that is the payments, the receipts, the, uh, the tip you want for the dasher, and so on. And then lastly, the more important piece is track your order. Kid me not, when you are hungry, you want to know real time where the dasher is, right? And, and you want that experience to be fast, and it should just work out of the box. So let's look like what the DoDash experience looks like. Um, I'll show a quick video. Yeah. Order delivery from Kuchina Venti with DoDash. So this is the DoDash experience. It comes up on Assistant. This is the menu browsing piece I was talking about. 
This is the customization, all super fast, build using AMP um, and the transactional experiences. Add to order. No order is complete without a desert, so let's add a desert too. Uh, and they have good deserts, by the way. Uh, they're around the street. So check out the same thing with the payment is already selected, delivery address is already on the file, and you can do the transaction uh, place order, order placed. So very, very seamless experience for our users, even without signing in, can actually complete transactions coming from multiple different entry points. So I think we talked about food ordering um, and, and so on. So let's talk about users' um, last phase of the customer journey, which is have a relaxing evening at home. Uh, today we are announcing the developer preview for digital goods. What that means is our users can now buy digital goods on Assistant. Uh, we want to support this on Assistant, on phones, and on voice devices. When we start, or uh, when we launch this, this will be across multiple markets. US, UK, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, and Japan. Uh, the seven markets we talked about earlier. So it's been a tiring day and a tiring week for a lot of us. Um, and when you go back to your hotel or to your room or to your house based on where you are from, uh, you might want to unwind and relax. I prefer meditating, so let me walk you through an experience. So this is Headspace. Um, this is the basic session, the free package from Headspace. Uh, you want to meditate for a little bit, uh, 10 minutes, two days in a row, and that's all Headspace offers for free. So do you want to subscribe to Headspace now? Yes, makes sense. Subscribe to Headspace. The three products Headspace offers are a $12 monthly, a $95 annual, and a $400 lifetime. Um, I'm cheap, so I'll stick with a $12 monthly package. Let me try that subscription. Subscribe to the $12 monthly package. So here is a proposed order. Remember when I talked about uh, you have to highlight to the user what product they are buying, what credit card is being used, and what the price point is? You want to propose that to the user before they say subscribe, a user says subscribe. The transaction is done. You are on your way. Um, the receipt is, is sent to you. You have this um, experience enabled. Now, the beauty of this solution is that users can consume their digital goods across Google surfaces. If a, Google bought something, if a user bought something on their Android experience, like the Headspace Android app, they can access their digital good on Assistant. And if a user buys something using this on Assistant, they are able to access the same experience on Android too. So from a user's perspective, no matter how they jump different devices across Assistant, across the Google surfaces, the, the purchases they make, the experiences they have seamlessly flow. And from a developer's perspective, digital goods on Assistant is an Assistant Play integration. So if you already are a developer who sells digital goods on Play, this is a little bit of incremental work to light up transactions on Assistant 2, or Digital Transaction Assistant 2. You continue using your Play Console. You use your Play Console to manage inventory and so on. High level, the flow looks something like this. A user requests access to a premium experience, or you can upsell a premium experience to the user. We check, does the user have access to this queue? If yes, you can deliver a premium experience to the user. If not, you call the Google APIs we tell you what all SKUs can you sell to this user based on any filtering criteria that you might have. Um, you propose the order with the product to the user. The user confirms yes. We process the transaction, and we send you the purchase token, saying, here is the transaction confirmation. Here's the purchase token. And you deliver the, the premium experience from there on to the user. So this is a great opportunity for our developers to monetize, be it the gaming space or premium content and experiences. So uh, for example, the Headspace experience was premium experiences. You could have premium content too. In the gaming space, it, a lot of you guys might be aware of coins or extra lives, extra turns, what have not. And I think whatever you can sell uh, from a gaming perspective works beautifully in this experience. And also a la carte digital media purchases, um, like rentals and so on, are all digital goods that you can start lighting up with this experience on Assistant. So just to recap. With digital goods, we are opening up the ability to sell digital goods on all assistant surfaces. This is in-app purchases and subscriptions. And we plan to light up all assistant surfaces in all the markets that we have transactions live in. 
And over the last few months since we've launched, so many great brands have developed apps to reach their users on the Assistant and enable that user to transact with them wherever they are. So you can buy your pizza from Domino's, you can order flowers for Mother's Day from 1-800-Flowers, and pretty soon you'll be able to get your favorite cup of Starbucks coffee from the Assistant as well. And as we launch these new features and continuously develop additional functionality, we're so ex excited to see what you develop for your users and what we can all build together. So thank you so much for joining us on this third day of I.O., and we hope to see you next year. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits. We'll be making room for those who've registered for the next session. If you've registered for the next session in this room, we ask that you please clear the room and return via the registration line outside. Thank you.
Hey there everybody, Todd Kerpelman here at the accessibility section of the Sandbox and I am joined by Patrick Clary who is a product manager here at Google. Hi Patrick. Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty well. So um, tell us what's going on here at the accessibility Sandbox. Yeah, so in the Sandbox we're doing various things. Um, we're showing demos of liftware, we're showing off some of our wheelchair accessible transit directions we have in Google Maps, we're showing off our automated captioning for YouTube, we're doing accessibility design reviews over here, and we're also showing a brand new product which we announced yesterday called Lookout. Oh, and, and what is Lookout? Tell me more about that. So Lookout is a product for users who are blind and low vision, and the goal is to help them become aware of physical objects and the space around them. For example, people that might be present, uh, text in their environment, and also physical objects or products. Can we, can we see a demo of Lookout uh, telling us what's in our environment? Yeah, let's, let's do that. So I have the app here, and I'll go ahead and select the icon. And then for this, I'll, expect, I'll select an experimental mode, because that's kind of fun, right? And we'll see what it shows. Drink with text and B18NOND. ISVO I'm on. So it detected some text on that, and it read it out. As you can see, it said Murphy, which is the brand of wine we have here. Let me point it at this glass and see what it does. Wine glass at 12 o'clock. So what else can you do with Lookout? Well, one interesting about Lookout is it's designed to basically be worn, so we can put it in a lanyard like this. And this allows the user to be hands-free and just engage in their activity. Um, and there's controls that facilitate this. So for example, if I want to start recognition, I can knock on the device. And then if I want to pause recognition, I can cover the camera. And there we go. And uh, if, if I'm interested in trying Lookout, where would I be able to get it? Yeah, so we'll be right, rolling out to trusted testers uh, pretty soon here. And you can go to google.com slash accessibility uh, to sign up for a trusted tester spot. And then later this year, we'll be pushing it to the Play Store. All right, so uh, be on the lookout. Ha! See what I did there? Is it, look, is it, uh, be on the lookout for Lookout coming soon to a Play Store near you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the tour. Yeah, my pleasure. Welcome to Google I.O.'s Main Street. I'm Timothy. I'm Sorina. I'm still Todd. <laughs> We're going to go have some fun. Fun! So how's your I.O. been? Amazing. What's been the favorite, your favorite thing you've seen so far? Uh, I think the, the session on artificial intelligence. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Kemmler. I'm a product manager, and I work on Android accessibility. Hi, and I'm Ricardo Garcia, a software engineer in the audio framework team in Android. How's everybody's last day of I.O.? Last, last session, woo! You made it through. Thank you so much for coming out. It was a great I.O. Um, today, we have a lot of really exciting things to talk about. Uh, primarily geared for developers. Uh, we're going to be talking about a new sound enhancement feature in Android P called Sound Amplifier. We're going to be doing a little bit of a live demo to show how we can improve the sound 
in any type of situation for users and how you can do the same as a developer, we're going to go and do a deep dive into the inner workings of sound amplifier and the dynamics processing effect upon which it's built, live with code examples. So it's going to be really cool. Let's dive right in. Listening is difficult, even in an empty field with a massive set of ears. But the everyday reality is we live, work, and play with an increasing amount of environmental noise. In fact, unwanted sound is one of the most common environmental problems. It's not only annoying, but it prevents us from understanding our friends, colleagues, and loved ones. No matter how well we can hear, most of us can relate to the following acoustically challenging situations. Trying to understand your date in a loud restaurant or a loud bar. Trying to listen to a caller in a really loud airport lounge. Trying to listen to a speaker who's talking way too softly, like me now. One could think of environmental noise as a form of situational disability. But what if you could hear better using just your smartphone so you'd never miss a word in the conversation? Now you can, because today we're introducing Sound Amplifier. What is Sound Amplifier? Sound Amplifier is a new accessibility service that helps users focus on real-world conversations using only your Android smartphone and a set of headphones. Users can tune to hundreds of personalized levels to optimize their listening experience to the current environment. Its two sliders for loudness and tuning dynamically adjust over 100 audio presets in the background. These settings can be applied independently to each ear. Adjusting them improves the sound quality in an array of situations, including the following. Enhancing sound in loud, distant, or otherwise acoustically challenging situations. Increasing the volume of somebody who speaks so too softly. Turning up the TV volume to one that's acceptable to everybody in the room without blasting everybody else. So now I'm going to go in and talk a little bit about how we built it, the APIs and the effect upon which it was built, and I'll do some demos. Sound Amplifier is based on Android P's new dynamics processing effect. The effect is a four-stage signal processing architecture, and I'm going to walk you through each stage, and then Ricardo is going to come in a little bit and really deep dive in, into this and show, show the developers in the audience exactly how they can adapt this to their applications. So first, stage one. Stage one is pre-equalization. You can think of pre-equalization as an equalizer that you can programmatically adjust any audio frequency. Think bass, mid-range, treble, the entire audio spectrum. Stage two is a multiband compressor. The multiband compressor is the heart and soul of the dynamics processing effect. Because what it does is really unique. It can simultaneously adjust down really loud or irritating sounds. Don't worry, I won't make any. Or, and just adjust up sounds that are too soft. It could do all of this without changing the characteristics of the underlying audio that you put into the system. The third stage is also an equalization stage. It's post-equalization, allows you to fine tune the output from the original MBC and the original um, pre-equalizer. And lastly is the limiter. What the limiter does is protects, protects users from additional gain or additional volume above a certain developer-designated threshold so that there are no loud, jarring, or uncomfortable uh, no noises. 
So now I'm going to switch, switch over and do a, do a little demo. So I'm going to play a very typical Google micro kitchen uh, water cooler type of, type of break where there's a loud espresso maker in the background. And I'm, I'm in this. I star in this. Um, so you can hear the sound. Is, is you, you can't really hear the conversation. Swam far enough to escape from Alcatraz. Right? Do you really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so you should have swung two Alcatraz. So I could but dynamically adjust this and start like to hear the conversation. Out. Remember, this is customizable or tunable oh, for every user. So Doing this again, again, I, I get to star again. I'm really not this into myself. Uh, here's me talking, kind of rehearsing this talk right now. And I'm speaking too quietly, so this will be another example of how I can adjust the sound so that I can hear it better. The other thing that I also forgot to mention was you use this with your headphones, so you can think of what's in the video as you know, what you would be hearing in your headphones. So listening is difficult, even under the best circumstances, in a quiet field with no background noise and a large set of ears. So you can hear the boost. But in noisy conditions, the everyday reality is that we work, play, and live with an increasing amount of environmental noise. So listening is difficult. So it's very easy to fine tune any acoustic situation to the environment, to your, to your ears, and so forth. And Ricardo is going to deep dive in and talk a little bit about a little bit more about the dynamics processing effect and how developers can start using this today. Off Thank to you, Brian. Ricardo. Thank you. Well, now we saw the demos and we saw uh, the, the um, sound amplifier actually working in real life. So we are going to go down and see how the sound amplifier actually works and what is the magic behind it. So. For that, I want you to introduce, to introduce to you the hearing threshold. I'm going to be in this slide for a second. I'm going to explain to you what is here. In here, we are seeing what is the average hearing threshold for the average human. The hearing threshold is actually how much energy we need to have to be able to listen to the sound. So in this plot, we can see from left to right, from low frequency to high frequencies, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and in the vertical axis, we can see the amplitude. We see how much energy we actually will need to hear the sounds. So because this is the threshold of hearing in quiet, this is very much telling that anything that is below that threshold will not be heard by people. So for example, if we go and we look into the 4,000 hertz, we see that the threshold is lower in there. That means that we need less energy. We need a lot, the sounds can be fainter, they can be softer, and we will hear them. But if we have a sound that is about the same level in around, I don't know, 100 hertz, you will not be able to hear that. So this is important because many companies use this curves, this kind of threshold, uh, hearing threshold curves to design their equipment. When you are designing, I don't know, MP3 or CD players, it, these curves are present. Or if you are tuning a headsets, speakers, microphones, all of these curves are really important to know what people will actually hear and what they are sensitive to. But this curves can shift. So we can have hearing threshold shifts due to so many circumstances. Let's say it's the noise in the environment. Uh, a minute ago, we have the AC blasting in here, and that was a threshold shift. We needed to have sounds that were way louder over that threshold to be able to listen, to hear those sounds. When the AC turned off a minute ago as well, we can speak softer, and we can we hear that. Our threshold shifted down at that moment. So a threshold shift is a region that will need more energy for you to be able to notice that. We have other shifts. We can have shifts that are not as broadband, not all over the spectrum and the previous one. We can have shifts that are more localized. This blue curve in here is showing us a shift that is around 500 hertz, really, really, really high. There is some noise or some obstruction there that is not going to allow you to hear things very well around 500 hertz. These shifts could be permanent 
all, all your life you're going to have that shift or could be temporary. As Brian mentioned, could be a temporary situational disability. That means that for that period of time, for you are not going to be able to hear things around those frequencies because either your headphones are not working well, you are in a noisy environment, your ears are not working well at that moment. Sounds that are below that threshold, that sh the shifted threshold, you are not going to be able to hear that. And that's the important takeaway from this. If it's below the threshold, you cannot hear it. So what happens when we have a sound of interest? Let's say that you are listening to music or someone is speaking or some sound that interests you. So in the, in the plot, I just put a blob, that's a green blob in there, and it's a broadband sound, has a lot of frequencies, and it has energy all over the place. But if you notice, again, around 500 hertz, a lot of the energy that is below the threshold, the shifted threshold, the blue one, is going to be lost. When you have a sound of interest that is below the threshold, the shifted threshold, eh, it's, it's going to be difficult to be heard, or the, intelli the intelligibility is really bad. You cannot understand the sound. So this is the question that everybody's asking. How can sound amplifier help us right now? So I'm glad that you asked. Sound amplifier is going to take the sounds and is going to actually boost them where you need them the most. If we look again in the, in the range from 500 hertz to 1 kilohertz, we took the sounds, and in this new process sound, we took the sounds that were really soft, that they didn't have that much energy, and we boosted them all the way over the shifted threshold. So now we can hear those. But very important, we took the sounds that were already loud, and we moved them up, but not too much up. So the loud sounds got louder, but not too loud. So if you see this, the, the process that happened, it was not uniform all over the spectrum. It was shifting things and trying to accommodate them over our shifted threshold. So it was doing a very intelligent boost in there. All of this processing is done by the new dynamics processing effect that we introduced in Android, in Android P. And I'm going to talk more. I'm going to show code in a, in a minute, I promise. So the dynamics processing effect. Uh, as Brian mentioned, is the new uh, effect, the processing effect that we have. It has four stages, the pre-EQ, multiband compressor, post-EQ, and limiter. And when we are using this effect, we have two big questions that we need to answer, especially for our sound amplifier. First is what kind of processing we actually want to hear sounds, to be able to, depending on the needs that we have, if we are in a loud environment, or we are in a bad connection, or we are in an airport, or depending, what kind of processing we need to make things above the shifted threshold that we have. And the second is how users can actually go and move and find the right parameters that they need for you. So we have two big questions to answer. The first one for the processing, what kind of processing we want, uh, we did what Google is really good at. We took a lot of data and we start crunching that data. So we took data from a hearing thresholds from regular and imp a hearing impaired users, so actually how people hear, wh how their ears respond, and we put them in there. We took threshold shifts from different environment places and different environment noises. We went to airports, restaurants, and places where we have noise obstructions, things that are going to shift our threshold of hearing. And we also put them in, in the blender. And uh, we went to uh, an try to get the audio content from the, the audio content that people actually want to hear. Uh, conversations, movies, music, uh, live concerts, uh, lectures. And we managed to put all of this together and come up with a set of uh, recipes of uh, parameters that would be good for processing the sound in many situations. When you do that, you end up with, I would say, a multidimensional space, a bunch of solutions that are pretty much parameters, very complex parameters, that you want to tell the dynamics effects processor, oh, for this situation, this will be good to shift the sound. For this situation, it will be that. But that's unmanageable. If you want to tell the users, well, start moving parameters like this, will be hundreds of parameters, and it will be very difficult for the users to make something good with this. So we took a further step and did some dim dimensionality reduction took all of those recipes, multidimensional space, and flattened them out and plotted them in two dimensions. 
in here, in the plus in the right, you can see that we see each one of those is kind of a formula or a processing a recipe that we want a, to fit the dynamics processor effect to change the sound. And with the dimensionality reduction, we found two major axes, the tone and the boost. The users, so this solves the second question that we have, how the users are going to navigate this. Well, they don't need to know the, all the parameters that we need. We just give them two sliders, the two sliders that we just saw on the demo. And by moving those sliders, they are actually doing a very intelligent mapping and going and moving a thousand parameters, well, not a thousand, hundreds of parameters that are moving for each channel in there. When the user goes and iterate using the sliders, they are actually going through a bunch of uh, recipes, a bunch of uh, processings, and they can find the one that suits them the best at that moment for that user in that location. And that's what we wanted to do. So that was kind of like a bird eye view of how the sound amplifier works. Now we are going to go deeper and start talking about code. What can you do with the dynamics effect, uh, processing effect? So you can find the dynamic uh, processing effect in, as a new library in the Android Media Audio Effects Dynamics Processing. And right now, so let's start talking about use cases. So when can you use a dynamics processing effect? The first use case we saw at length, you can do a sound amplifier. So if you go today, because this is now available in the Android uh, P developer preview, you can go tonight. I'm sure that everybody is going to skip the party and go and create your own dynamics, your own sound amplifier. So with a sound amplifier, with the dynamics process effect, we are expecting people to create their own sound amplifiers or create their own solutions to uh, be able to hear better, to listen better. Another example, another utility that can happen is a when you have a device, an Android device, and you want to tune the speakers or the headphones, many companies uh, have software that will uh, equalize or do something to the headphones to make them sound uh, flatter, better, to have more bass, something that you want. Now, with this effect, it will be easy for you and for your clients to do that. Another application that is really interesting is the TV midnight mode. If you are watching TV 2 AM, you cannot sleep. But if you start watching a movie, and sometimes you are, someone is whispering in the movie, just saying something really quiet, and immediately, bam, music comes in there. Uh, something really loud, you woke up everybody in the house. With a dynamics process event, you can actually have something that the whisper, the very soft parts of the movie can be raised up, but the very loud music or gunshots or whatever is happening in the movie, it can bring down, and everything is going to a, a more level, a better sound in there, more level sound. Another example can be for media players. You are doing your own media player, and you want to actually uh, do some loudness maximization or mastering. You want, you want to listen to classical music in your media player, and you, and you are in a train. You would like to have the control to be able to, again, squeeze the loud sounds and uh, bring up the soft sounds. So everything is working well for the dynamic range that you have in there. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about architecture, and I promise code is coming. But I want to show the architecture. We are giving you a lot of power with this effect. So we, the architecture that we showed before, uh, we were kind of lying. It's not as simple. It's a little bit more complex. The architecture, yes, we have four stages. We have a pre-EQ, multiband compressor, post-EQ, and limiter. But we can do more things in there. Inside of each one of those stages, we have a lot of parameters that you can control. We have the bands, and in the pre-EQ, multiband compression, and post-EQ, we can have as many bands as you want, and you can control each one of those bands and the parameters in those bands. The limiter is a single band limiter, but you can also control that. All of this is, it comes into a channel. So a channel, what we are defining the channel as, let's say you have a stereo signal. Stereo signal has two channels, left and right. So we are going to have channel 0 and channel 1, and you can control all of those independently. Or you can have many more channels. Let's say that you have a 5.1 uh, signal. You actually have six channels that you can control, and you can index all of those channels and say, I want to change the multiband parameter, the, the multiband controller, band number 3 in the channel 2, and I want to change this. We are giving you an API to do all of those things. One thing that I want you to notice is the limiters. The limiters are linked limiters. 
I'm going to talk more about that, but it's important when you are talking about multi-channel <coughs> to be able to uh, change all the limiters kind of at once if you need. So now, finally, code. Yes, we promise code. We have some code. So this is an instance instantiation example of the dynamics processing effect. For this, we decide, because we have so many parameters and so many things that can be configured, to have a config builder. So you create a config builder, and then we are actually going to instantiate the effect. First, with the config builder, in this example, uh, we, we can uh, have some parameters, like the variant, the number of channels. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Then we can enable or disable each one of the stages. In this example, we have all the stages enabled. Yes, we want to use pre-EQ, multiband compressor, post-EQ, and limiter, and the number of bands. We can say how many bands we want per stage type. So in, I can have all the pre-EQs can have, let's say, eight bands, the multiband compressors, 10 bands, and the post-EQ, 13 bands. The only limitation is like the stage types needs to have the same number of bands. But then you can choose any number of bands that you want. We have some extra parameters, as I mentioned, the variant and the number of channels and the set prefer frame duration uh, that you, you can set in the config builder. Then in the last line, we are actually creating a configuration. We are saying build, and we have a configuration object. Then I, I don't want to use the configuration directly. Sometimes I want to finish the architecture of my effect and go and change the default parameters. So in this example, I'm getting a channel. I'm getting a channel object in the first line from the config. And I'm saying from channel number 0, in this case, get the multiband compressor. We have the multiband compressor stage. And then I iterate through the eight uh, multiband uh, bands that I have in my multiband compressor. And I went and changed the parameters in each one of them. This is an example for I.O. I'm sure that in real world applications, you can go and do more things. But you see that we can go and set each one of the things that we want, the release, the attack, the ratio, the threshold, the way that you want for each one of the bands. And finally, we go and instantiate the, the dynamics processing effect, my dynamics processing effect. And you can instantiate it with a, a, the config file that we just created and the session ID. That way, you attach this effect to whatever the media player or the audio track that of interest for you. And then you can start just going in your program and controlling everything. I'm going to, instead of going on the API and just showing like the dry code, I'm going to go a little bit more meta, more conceptual, to show this in graphics a little bit. So in the configuration, or when we are running real time, we can have access to channels that I just showed you. And we have many channels. So the channel object, and we can index the channel by index number. So 0, 1, 2, 3, we can get the channel. Each channel object actually has some parameters, like the input gain, that you can go and change on the channel. Or you have stages. You can access the pre-EQ, multiband compressor, post-EQ, or limiter. And uh, let's say, at this moment in the EQ, you can actually grab the EQ. Both EQs look exactly the same from the API level, from the API viewpoint. And you can go and change the parameters on the EQ or change the parameters in each one of the bands there. Sorry, it's going very deeper. So we can go from, we can go from band to uh, the EQ, from channel, and then the collection of channels. So we have access to all the granularity that we want there. The same thing for the multiband compressor. We can access the multiband compressor inside of the channel and then access uh, the parameters that we have in each one of the bands. And lastly, the limiter. We don't have bands in the limiter, only parameters there. And we can access that. So now I'm going to dive a little bit more on each stage type and what are the, the accessors that we have, the setters and getters that we have there. First, the equalizer. I think that most people are familiar with the equalizer, but it, what, what an equalizer does, but if not, very quickly. With an equalizer, we are going to specify different frequency bands. We are going to have bands from 0 to 500 hertz, 500 to 3,000, 3,000 to 7,000. And we are going to change the energy, the level, or the gain that we have in each one of those bands. We, in here, we can set the bands any way that we want. So we can have many bands, and we can have cutoff frequencies, any cutoff frequency that we want. In this graph, it's kind of misleading because all of the bands are the same uh, width. That's not true. You can do any width that you want. 
And once that you set up the bands, you can go and with the accessors that we have here, we can get the gain, what is the current gain, or we can set the gain. And we can change all of this also real time. We are going to uh, then the multiband compressor. So first a disclaimer, someone was pointing out, you are only showing one band in the multiband compressor. And yes, I'm showing one band, but uh, this, is, this is easy to uh, show what the multiband compressor does. As Brian mentioned, and we have mentioned, uh, when you have a compressor, a multiband compressor, <coughs> the main goal is to take sounds that are really loud and make them softer, and sounds that are very soft and make them louder. The way that we have here represented, we have the same sentence in the before. We have a the sentence that is loud, medium, and soft in the top. And after we apply the processing of the multiband compressor, it's going to look like the after. That is, the loud sound is a little bit softer, the medium one stays medium, and the soft one goes very loud. The way that a multiband compressor works, or the parameters work, uh, bear with me for a second for this graphic, is we have the input. How, what is the level of the, of the signal in the, in the uh, horizontal axis? And the numbers are from minus 100 to 10. Uh, the lower the number, like minus 50, is way softer than uh, minus 10. For example, so minus 10 will be louder, a louder sound. And when the compressor, what it's doing is it's analyzing the input. And if the input is above the threshold, we have a threshold parameter, it's going to decide to say, you know, that's too loud, I'm going to bring you down. But if it happens to be below the threshold, it's not touched. So for example, in this graphic, if we choose minus 40, the input was minus 40 level. The output will be exactly minus 40. We are below the threshold. We are not going to modify that signal. But the threshold here is around 25, minus 25. So if I choose a value of minus 20, the actual output will be uh, around, uh, sorry, let's say, no, let's choose an input of minus 10. Sorry, that's better. Minus 10 as an input will map to a minus 20 to the output. That means that the sound became softer just because it was above the threshold. With all these parameters, with the compression ratio, the threshold, and uh, the gain, and uh, the, gain, the input gain, the output gain, and the other parameters, we are able to do what we have been promising, that we are able to take sounds and make them so uh, louder, but take loud sounds and make them softer. And that's what a multiband compressor is doing, and is doing this in different bands. We can take regions of frequency, from 0 to 1,000 hertz, and they and behave in a different way that the region from 1,000 to 5,000 will behave. We are giving you all that power to control. The multiband compressor being one of the most complex ones, you can get these setters and getters. So we can get the attack time, release time, ratio, all these parameters that you need to actually configure a, a compressor. And uh, you do this per bands. As I, well, there is one thing, and I'm sure that everybody is asking this. Why do you have a pre-gain, a post-gain, if your multiband compressor is before and after an equalization? And it's true. They are, doing, they are redundant. They are doing pretty much exactly the same. But we did that for one reason. We talked to a lot of developers and people that actually have a lot of these algorithms in real life. And some camp, some, a, a big portion of them, they really like to have an equalization and then a multiband compressor to do some tuning of their microphones or the speakers. Some of them want, like to have a multiband compressor and then an equalization stage. So the easiest way for us to make this effect very universal was to uh, build in some redundancy and do the API in such a way that they can easily port all their algorithms to this. The last stage is the limiter. The limiter is pretty much the same that the multiband compressor, but it's a single band. So we don't have multiple bands. And what this is doing is pretty much the same. It's taking a sound, and if it's way too loud, if it's above certain level in the threshold, it's just going to squash that down. It's very useful, uh, and it's usually found at the end of any audio processing chain, especially to protect the speakers. You don't want that the processing did something funky, and the sound is really loud and you don't want that loud sound to come out of the speakers. So you go, and the limiter is going to say, OK, sorry, this is too loud. I'm not going to clip, but I'm just going to squash it down so it doesn't destroy the speakers. So the limiter is really good. And I promised to mention something about the link 
the limiters are link limiters, and we have the link group. When we have multiple channels, let's say that we have two channels, and we want a, one of the channels, and they are in the same group, and one of the channels, the left channel, something really loud happened in that channel, and it's very, very loud. If we squeeze all down only the left channel, the stereo image will shift all the way to the right, because this, the right one did nothing. But if they are linked, and for some reason one of the channels got a loud sound, both will come down simultaneously, and the stereo signal, the stereo image, it will not move. It will stay in the center, stay where they needed to be. So being able to control the link groups in a stereo signal or in a multi-channel uh, environment, let's say you want to link the stereo speakers, the surround speakers in a different group, so you can keep uh, your uh, spatial image intact. And that was another feature that was asked for us to do. Well, so some more comments about the dynamics processing effect. First one, the real-time controls. All the controls and the API that I tried to summarize in here, but it's very big, I really encourage you to go and read the API and the documentation. All these controls, most of them are real-time controls. You can use them, and once that your effect is running, you can go and change pretty much any parameter that you want. You can change the levels in here. You can change the attack, the release, the ratio, anything that you want in any of the channels, in any of the bands. Uh, you can also use pretty much the same API for instantiation. Sometimes you want to create an effect and have it ready to go immediately. As soon as it starts playing, it's playing with all the parameters. So it will work like that. We also have some implementations. At this moment, we are offering two implementations, uh, two uh, variants that we call uh, favor frequency and fa favor time. Sometimes for these effects, if you have a frequency domain implementation, it's good because you can have very precise frequency splits in the bands that you may need for your algorithm. And at the same time, we are also giving like the desir desired frame size, a hint that you can give to the audio engine, to the effect engine, to say, well, you know, I like frequency, and I would like to have frames of about 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds for your processing. So although it's not a guarantee, you can tell the engine, hey, I would like to do that. Another important thing with this effect is it's built in into AOSP. So all AOSP, Android P, uh, AOSP is shipping with this effect. Uh, but it's an OEM replaceable effect. So if an OEM really wants to come with a snappier effect or a snappier implementation or something, uh, they are encouraged to do that. And if we have OEM people in the audience, please uh, talk to me afterwards. But yes, go ahead and do this. And the only thing is, like, please do very cool effects with this and very good quality effects. The other thing is this effect is available for developers as an insert effect. Uh, you can go and implement it in your application. You have a media player. You have a music application. You just go and use the Android Media Audio Effects Dynamic Processing Effect, and it will be available for you there in the implementation. So summary, today we learned a bunch of things. The first one, we, uh, we introduced the new feature, the sound amplifier. The, so it's uh, the new accessibility feature. It uses only the smartphone and a set of headphones and helps you improve your listening experience. Brian showed you a couple of very cool demos. And, um, and thank you for the sound people that they turn off the AC at that moment so we could hear things a little bit better. Um, we learn about the hearing threshold and the hearing threshold shifts and how they power the way that the sound amplifier works. And the last thing, uh, we show the dynamics processing effect the code, how the stages work, and how can you go and create your own dynamics processing effect to embed in your own applications. So with that, we want to give thanks to a lot of people that were involved in this project, uh, Brian's team, uh, the Android accessibility team, my team, the Android Media Framework team, the research team at Google, the sound understanding team, uh, the, our team in Taipei that they uh, helped implement the applications that you saw today, and uh, I want to thank you for staying so late, the last day of I.O., and uh, please contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining this session. Brand ambassadors will assist with directing you through the designated exits.
It's been a fun three days with all of you here at Shoreline Amphitheater for Google I.O. 2018. We've checked out a lot of really cool in-person experiences that you might have missed if you just tuned in for the session videos. If you want to experience all the fun again or for the first time and at your own speed, go to g.co slash io slash guide. To learn more about Google Developer Products, make sure to fill out a form at g.co slash dev slash form. I look forward to seeing you all next year on site and online for Google I.O. 2019. Until then, make good things together. I'm Timothy Jordan. From all of us here at Google, goodbye from I.O. 2018.